Audible Frontiers presents Firebirds, written by Shane Gregory, narrated by Scott Aiello. Chapter 1 It was June 9th, late afternoon, and it was hot. There were a dozen human heads at my feet. Flies swarmed them, entering nostrils and open mouths. It puzzled me why they would be there in the road. I didn't see their bodies nearby. They were baking on the asphalt of James Street on the north side of Clayfield, a residential street with only a few large, older homes with big yards. I pulled my pistol and looked around at the houses, wondering if this odd scene might be bait for an ambush. If it were a trap, then I had fallen for it when I had gotten out of my truck to investigate. These were not the only heads I had come across. I had been finding severed heads for about a week in different parts of town, but this was the most I had seen at one place at one time. For several weeks, I had accepted the idea that Clayfield belonged to me, and the zombies. I knew of no other healthy person in town. However, these heads were evidence that there was at least one more person around. I couldn't understand why they cut off the heads or why they would leave them in the street. Even though no one came out of hiding to greet or assault me, I felt like I was being watched. I returned to my truck, backed down the street, turned around in a driveway, and connected with North 7th. It wasn't just the heads... There were other things I had found. Four days before, I found a dump truck rammed through the front of the Christian bookstore. It had not been there before. Two days earlier, I'd noticed that someone had parked five yellow cars and trucks down the center line on East Broadway, a block down from the courthouse. Also, the front doors of random houses were open all over town. And I usually tried to close up houses after I'd been in them to keep the zombies and weather out. Someone was there, and they were careless, maybe a little bored, and maybe crazy. I was driving my new gray Ford F-150 4x4. I had my eye on a truck just like this before Canton B had destroyed the world. I couldn't afford it back then, but now I could have any vehicle I wanted. When I drove it off the lot a couple of weeks before, it only had 30 miles on the odometer. I was blasting the air conditioning and listening to an audiobook on the stereo, a collection of short stories by Flannery O'Connor. I had trouble concentrating on the book because I kept thinking about the heads. I drove south over Broadway and looked east as I crossed the intersection. Those yellow vehicles were still there and seemed to scream at me. When I got to South Street, I took a left, then a right onto South 6th, so I could connect with Braggisburg Road and go back to the Laster Farm, where I had been living. I opened the gate to the long driveway, then pulled inside. When I got out to shut it, I wrapped a logging chain around it and the post to hold it in place. I wasn't too concerned about zombies coming on the property anymore. They hadn't come inside since I had reinforced the fences. I wasn't really afraid of them the way I used to be. They were very dangerous, but I had grown accustomed to dealing with them. I knew what to expect from them. There were fast ones and slow ones, and I could differentiate between the two easily at a glance. Mostly, they were slow. The number of the fast, freshly turned victims was dwindling, and I hadn't seen one in weeks. I parked close to the house and unloaded the luxury items I had collected that day. A bag of really good coffee beans, two boxes of Valentine's Day chocolates, a Stephen King novel I hadn't read, and a cardboard box of Playboy magazine issues spanning from the mid-1970s to the early 1990s. I set everything on the porch, then picked up the novel and looked at the photograph of the author on the back cover. I wondered what the master of horror would think of this 24-7 horror story I lived. 
Then I looked down into the box of Playboys and saw Raquel Welch staring at me, disapprovingly, I thought, in her red bathing suit. Don't judge me, lady, I said. I grinned and looked around me as if someone had actually heard me say it. I frowned and tossed Stephen in on top of her and carried it all inside. I really had not needed to go out for supplies that day, but I needed to go out. Ordinarily, I did my supply runs in the morning, but that particular day I had gone out for a drive to enjoy some air conditioning and the stereo, after having spent several hours in the garden. I stopped at a couple of houses for the hell of it. One of the houses had a secret room containing a huge pornography stash behind a home office. I found it only because the owner had left the secret door ajar. His, her, skeletal remains were on the office floor. The bulk of the collection was movies, DVDs, VHS cassettes, and even a few 16mm film reels. There were also several thumb drives and CDs in a small plastic tote. I had no way to see what was on them, but judging by how the movies, drives, and CDs were labeled, the playboys I found in the corner were quite tame. I wasn't sure what would possess a person to devote a special room just to porn, but I'm sure Raquel judged them for it every time they went in there. Once I got my luxury items inside the house, I locked up and then ate some beefaroni right out of the can. I had some chocolate, a little bourbon, and I let Raquel judge the hell out of me. Chapter 2 A few days later, on the morning of June 13th, I got up right after sunrise. I put on my boots and strapped on my 9mm and my wristwatch. I washed my face in the basin of dirty water on the dresser and looked at myself in the mirror. My hair and beard had grown. My face was scarred and creased and tanned. I was slimmer than I had been before Canton B. I finally had those six-pack abs everyone was raving about, and I didn't even have to mail order any special exercise equipment or routines on DVD to get them. I frowned. I thought I looked old. I was dirty, too. I hadn't bathed in several days, because I didn't want to use up my limited clean water supply. I went downstairs, then outside, to take a leak off the front porch. I didn't use the indoor toilet anymore because I got tired of hauling in buckets of water from the pond to flush it. I had made a composting toilet that I kept on the back porch. It wasn't much more than a toilet seat and a five-gallon bucket, but it served its purpose. I cooked myself an egg, some coffee, and a bowl of oatmeal and looked over my to-do list while I ate. The list didn't change much from day to day, but I still reviewed it every morning. Most days, I would spend the first couple of hours weeding the garden. After that, I would pick the vegetables that needed picking. At that time, it was mostly greens, cucumbers, and squash. Then, I would go out and pick whatever wild stuff I could find. Berries, greens, etc. I had built myself a simple solar food dehydrator using construction plans from one of my magazines. I would set it up each day, drying some of the greens, berries, and squash. I found that I could dry the leaves and then crush them into a powder to be used in soup later on. It was the only way I could preserve them. The sliced squash would dry up sort of like pliable potato chips. They tasted bland, but I didn't mind. I still had plenty of real brand-name salty potato chips I could eat. The drying didn't always work. A couple of times, the squash hadn't dried properly, and it molded later on. The cucumbers dried too well. They just shriveled up to nothing, and they didn't taste very good. Of course, drying wasn't the preferred way to preserve cucumbers. I would need to make pickles. On this particular day, I had added a new task to my list. Locate all necessary items for home canning. I would need jars, lids, pots, all of it. I had never canned my own food before, but I'd watched my mom do it. I had a general understanding of the supplies I'd need to find, but I would need to find a book to teach me how.
and give me the recipes. I decided that day, after setting up the dehydrator, to go out and find the necessary supplies. Then, if I had time, I would drive into Clayfield for a while to look around. It had been an unseasonably warm and dry June at that point. My rain barrels were empty, and my cistern was getting low. I tried to collect as much bottled water as I could from scavenging, so I could use the cistern to water the garden. It had gotten over 90 degrees three times in the past week, and it was still almost two weeks away from the first day of summer. I knew I could expect temperatures that high or higher as I went into July and August. The year before, I wouldn't have minded, but the year before, I had air conditioning and a refrigerator. The nights were still comfortably cool, but soon they would be warm, too. It was going to be difficult to sleep inside, and I wasn't wild about the idea of sleeping outside, not with the zombies walking around. The upper floor of the house didn't have good airflow, so opening the windows wouldn't help much and I didn't dare leave the windows open on the ground floor. I thought about building a platform on the roof for summer sleeping, but it just seemed like too much work. There had to be a simpler solution, and I would work it out eventually. Things like that kept my mind occupied, but not enough. Sarah was always there in my head. I set out around 10 a.m., and it was already getting hot. I kind of liked driving around because, at least when I was in a vehicle, I could have air conditioning. The zombies seemed to love the heat. They were more active when it was warm. By active, I don't mean to say that they moved faster. It was just that there seemed to be more of them out. The heat wasn't kind to them, however. For those that were strong enough to find nourishment on living flesh, their bodies were bloated and soft often swarming with flies. For those that had not been fortunate enough to feed regularly, their bodies were taut and mummy-like. Regardless of their condition, they just kept hanging on. I passed a group of them that were in a dry, fenced-in pasture trying to corner a gray horse. The horse was malnourished, but it was still strong and fast enough to elude them and it had enough space to stay out of their reach. I knew if I didn't intervene, they would eventually run it to exhaustion. I would go back later to see what I could do when I was finished with my errands. I had seen canning supplies at different houses, but I was having trouble remembering which. I had been into so many homes looking for supplies the past few months. Sarah and I had collected some home canned goods from an old woman's house on Gala Road. It was the same house where I had found the field guide for edible wild plants. The woman was probably still locked up in her freezer in the basement. I decided to check her house first. I thought Founders Farm and Hardware might have some stuff, too. I knew they sold that sort of thing, but when the virus hit Clayfield, it had been in February and they might not have had that merchandise stocked that time of the year. It wouldn't hurt to check. I had been over to Founders several times looking for other things. It was almost picked clean, but perhaps I just didn't see something I hadn't been looking for. When I got to the old woman's house, I noticed the front door was standing open. I tried to remember if Sarah and I had left it open, but I couldn't recall. That had been months before. I know we were in a hurry to get out of there, so we could have. I climbed out, grabbed my 12-gauge, and stood by my pickup for a moment to listen. All I heard were the sounds of late spring, the sounds of late spring without people. I eased the truck door shut, pulled up my mask, and went up to the house. Just inside, near the open basement door, was the nearly decomposed body of a woman. I couldn't remember what the old woman had been wearing, but this woman was wearing a dress, and her hands were bound with an extension cord. The cord made me fairly certain that the body belonged to her. I don't know who had let her out of the freezer, but whoever it was had removed her head. 
I didn't see her head anywhere. I assumed it had rolled down the stairs into the basement, but I wasn't going down there to look for it. I did a quick check of the house, except the basement, and didn't find anyone else there. I found some large stock pots, empty jars, rings, and lids in a walk-in storage closet. There was also a worn copy of Ball Blue Book of Canning and Preserving. I was pretty sure that was everything I would need to start, but if there was anything I lacked, I could just read the book to tell me what. That was easy enough, I said. I propped my shotgun up against the wall and started hauling the supplies out to the truck. On my second trip back into the house, I found the old woman's head. It was down at the base of a shrub next to the front steps. I hadn't noticed it coming in the first time, and I almost missed it that time because of the tall grass. It was on its left ear, looking out toward the truck. It was still very much alive, or rather, not dead. It blinked at me. I kept walking and tried not to look at it. On a whim, I went out to the old woman's garden plot. Just like everything else, it was overgrown, but I went in anyway and looked around. It was not uncommon for plants to come back from the seeds of the previous year's produce. I recognized five okra plants. They weren't very tall, and they had not yet bloomed, but I would come back later in the year to harvest them. There was also a clump of tomato plants growing in one spot. They'd already set some fruit, which at that time were like green marbles. I didn't see anything else. I suspected I could find something similar happening in other old gardens all over the county. Chapter 3 Early on, during the first few weeks while I was waiting for Sarah and the Somervilles to return... I would go on extermination runs and spend a couple of hours driving around killing zombies. But by that day in June, I hadn't killed one in more than a week. I was tired of killing, and I feared I soon might get tired of living. I had no intention of taking my own life. Not yet. One argument I always gave myself when the thought came into my head was that I had worked too hard and fought too long to stay alive only to just give up. Still, I was lonely and fatigued. I yearned for rest and for the touch or voice of another human being. I would leave Clayfield and search for survivors elsewhere before I ever took my own life, and even then I doubted if I would have had the courage to do it. I was fairly certain that there were survivors still in Riverton, but I hadn't made the time to drive there. From the old woman's house, I drove into downtown Clayfield to have a look. There had been a time when the Somervilles, Sarah, and others were around that securing Clayfield seemed like a possible goal. But driving through the town that day, I doubted it could ever have happened. We might have been able to retake a city block or two, but not the whole town. Not and hold it. Not with our limited numbers. Alone, I didn't stand a chance. It wasn't just the undead. Nature had to be contended with, too. Then there would have been the upkeep of the buildings. One summer, a few years before, I had been fortunate enough to host a reception for an archaeologist at the museum. He was a bit younger than I and not much more than a grad student, but it was kind of a big deal to have a real archaeologist visit my small town museum. His focus had been on pre-Columbian Mexico. He had brought along some artifacts, and he gave a little talk about a dig from which he had just returned. He told us how the Mayan civilization there had once been quite large, but that something had happened. He presented a few theories, and whatever it was that had happened had greatly diminished the population. He said that over time, the forest retook the cities. The people were forced ever inward, tending smaller and smaller areas, and taking parts from older buildings to maintain their shrinking communities. There just weren't enough of them around for the upkeep. That's what I envisioned happening to Clayfield. Eventually, seeds would find their way into the cracks of the asphalt. 
acorns would sprout into oaks. Eventually, roots and vines would force concrete and bricks apart. It wouldn't happen this year, but it would happen, and there would be nothing I could do about it by myself. I would have to decide where my place would be, dig in there, and hold it. Everything else would disappear into forest. I wanted downtown Clayfield to be that place for sentimental reasons. Unfortunately, I didn't have the luxury of being sentimental. I had to be practical, and at that time, the Lassiter's farm would have to be my place. The undead were everywhere. They walked and crawled and bumped into things. They reminded me of fish in an aquarium, wide-eyed, mouths open, going one way, then the next, only getting lively and zoning in when there was food. I didn't have any particular place I wanted to go that day. I was just having a look around. I toured a few residential streets, careful to stay away from congested areas. I wound up on the south side of town near Founders Farm and Hardware. I didn't need to go there since I'd found most everything I needed at the old woman's house, but I didn't think it would hurt to see if they had any canning supplies I might have missed. Just before I got there, I passed by a few houses, then came upon a small park that had been built for the town by the local Kiwanis Club. I stopped in the street and got out. The large sign by the entrance said, Sponsored by Kiwanis of Clayfield. The grounds were overgrown, but the playground equipment, pavilion, and basketball goals were still easily visible. The reason why I stopped was that there was a row of six metal fence posts, known as T-posts, in the ground in front of the sign. Each post had two to four human heads driven down on them, like grotesque shish kebabs. It was new something done within the past two or three weeks. There was another fence post there that was empty. I got a chill and looked around to see if anyone might be watching me. I didn't know if the heads had been the heads of zombies or healthy people. I presumed they had been zombies because of their state of decay, but I hadn't been out that way in a while, so they could have decomposed in that time. Then I thought I saw one of the heads move. It was the top head on the second post. I took a step closer to investigate. It felt like the thing was looking at me with its bluish, milky eyes. Then it opened, then closed its mouth. I stepped back to my vehicle and looked around me again. I could understand exterminating them, but I couldn't understand beheading them and staking the heads. Beheading them didn't kill them, it just disconnected them from their bodies. While that incapacitated them and took away their mobility, they could still be dangerous. It was reckless, pointless, and barbaric. I was troubled by what I saw, but I was trying to be optimistic. The beheadings meant there was, at worst, a very sadistic, healthy person left in Clayfield, and at best, a bored or fed-up healthy person. I tried to focus on the healthy part. Healthy meant conversation and possible companionship. Healthy meant I might have help. I returned to my truck and drove on over to the hardware store. Founders was gone, burned to the ground. I hadn't been there in a while, but I was surprised I hadn't noticed the smoke from the fire. The ground was scorched at least a hundred feet around the building, there were dozens of charred bodies and blackened skeletons scattered around. I got out and walked up to the remains of the store. I could feel heat coming from it. There were probably still some glowing hot spots under all the ash and debris, but the fire had died days before. There were some warped metal racks and shelves still poking out, but the flames had done a thorough job on everything else. I couldn't imagine what had caused it, but since it was in such close proximity to the Kiwanis Park and the staked heads, I presumed the fire had been intentionally set. Founders sold tea posts. I had taken some of their posts to shore up my perimeter fence at the stables. 
They didn't keep them inside, but rather had them stacked outside. I hadn't taken them all, and now there were none left. Either someone torched the building and the zombies had gathered in, attracted to the fire and burned, or someone had somehow lit the creatures, and the hardware store was an unintentional casualty. I wouldn't know until I met this stranger. On my way back to the Laster place, I slowed next to the pasture of the gray horse. It had moved to the other side of the field, a few hundred feet away. The zombies were on their way over to it again. As they got near, the horse bucked a little, then ran closer to me. The undead immediately turned to follow. I rolled down my window and whistled. The horse snorted, threw its head back, and then ran off again. I didn't see a gate for the field from my position in the road. I got out, left the truck idling and the door open, and waded down into the waist-high weeds and thorny blackberry canes over to the barbed wire fence. If I leaned in a little, I could see a gate off to my right that had been obscured by a line of trees. I fought my way back through the weeds and returned to the truck. There was a dirt and gravel driveway not far down the road. It was only about the space of one car length, just enough room to park off the road so a person could open the gate and pull into the field. I had no intention of pulling into the pasture. I just wanted to open the gate to give the horse a way to escape, so it could at least have a fighting chance. I swung the wide metal gate into the pasture and propped it open with a stick. Then I went back to the stables. When I pulled out front, I found the driveway gate open and a little blue truck parked near the house. I was nervous but also excited about the prospects of another healthy person. Cautiously, I pulled my 9mm and placed it on the seat beside me. I drove up and parked close behind the blue truck. If this was a looter, I wanted to make their escape as difficult as possible. I shifted into park, grabbed my pistol, and sat there, waiting. After a few seconds, the front door opened, and a masked woman stepped out onto the porch. She was in a black leather jumpsuit like the kind motorcyclists wear, black leather boots and a black cap. She was holding a sawed-off shotgun. She could have been a comic book villainess. We stared at each other, each waiting for the other to make the first move. Finally, she pulled down her mask and took off her cap. It was Sarah. Chapter 4 Holy shit, I whispered. I don't know why I didn't run to her. I was running on the inside, if that makes any sense. But I just sat there, with my mouth open, staring at her. I had not seen her for more than two months. She lifted her hand in greeting, then walked down the length of the porch and stopped when she got in the driveway. Her eyes were glistening with tears. I opened the door and slipped out of the truck. I thought you were dead, she said. I didn't expect to find you here. I had spent all that time alone rehearsing conversations, and when the time finally came, I didn't know what to say. How have you been? she said. Where did you come from? I said. It came out in a whisper. I hadn't spoken to a real person in weeks. I drew near to her and touched her face. Her nose didn't look right. It's broken, she said, noticing my concerned expression and reaching up to touch my hand. I hit that electrical line that day when I jumped off the building. That day, I repeated. Yeah, she said. You told me not to jump. I nodded. I'm glad you did. I don't think it has completely healed, she said. It still hurts, but it looked a lot worse than this. It's going to be crooked now. I hope I'm not too... You're beautiful, I interrupted. Then I blurted out, A zombie ate my earlobe. She reached up and brushed my hair away from my ear. She made a pained expression, but didn't say anything. It was my favorite one, I said. She smiled broadly. I've missed you. 
Yeah, me too. I leaned in and kissed her. When I pulled back, she smiled again. She was thinner. She looked older. I pulled her against me. She put her face on my chest and I kissed the top of her head. Then I just broke down. I held her and wept. I'd almost given up on you, I said. So much has happened. I pushed her out at arm's length to look at her again. Are you hungry? I said. No, she said. But I saw you had coffee in there. I would love some if you can spare it. I took her hand and we walked up to the house. You've been busy, she said, nodding at the garden. Once we were inside, I got some water warming on the stove and we sat at the table. We were both quiet for a while. She stared at the floor. I stared at her and waited for her to talk. She seemed uncomfortable and timid like she had when we first met. Mr. Parks didn't make it, she said finally. She glanced up at me, then back to the floor. I know, I said. I saw him. How? Mr. Somerville and I went looking for you and... Nicholas is alive? she asked, shocked by the news. He was the last time I saw him, I said. He went on to Springfield to look for you and Judy, and I stayed here. He said he would come back. He should have been back weeks ago. She looked down at her feet. I wish Judy would have known that. I left her down near Biloxi with a group of survivors. Biloxi? What were you doing down there? She shrugged. I wanted to see the gulf again. Judy and I didn't have anybody but each other, and we just wanted to get away. What happened? We tried to cross over into Illinois following the route Mr. Parks had planned, but someone had made a bridge out of barges, and the infected people from across the river were just pouring over, thousands of them. A man told us that they'd gotten word that a big bomb had been detonated to the north, but they didn't know exactly where, or if it was a nuclear weapon or something different. I'd heard the same about some of the southern cities, I said. They said Nashville had been nuked, and Jackson, Mississippi. Sarah shook her head. I don't know about Nashville, but I drove on the outskirts of Jackson coming and going. One whole end of town looked like it had burned, but I don't know about nukes. It could have been, but it didn't look like Hiroshima or anything. Not long after we arrived in Biloxi, we saw a small aircraft. Some of the others said it was a drone. We never saw it fire off any weapons, but it could have been that the military is still around doing stuff. Hmm, I said, puzzled. What happened when you couldn't get over? I found your vehicles by the flood wall. We lost everybody, Sarah continued. Judy and I hid in a boxcar for a day until the things left. I wanted to get away from everything, or at least feel like I was getting away, she said. But it was worse down in Biloxi. I couldn't stay. There were more infected, more gangs, less food. It didn't make sense to stay. Judy wanted to be around people, and there was a really nice group down there, a big group, so she stayed with them. I tried to talk them all into coming back to Kentucky with me, but most of them didn't want to leave. She stopped talking and got up to pour the hot water through the ground coffee and filter. She caught the hot coffee in a mug. When it was full, she replaced it with another mug and handed the full one to me. When her mug was full, she turned to look at me. Has it been hard for you? she asked. Being here by yourself? It had, but I didn't say so. I just shrugged. I'm sorry I left you, she said. I didn't know what else to do. I know, I said. There was an uncomfortable silence. Her eyes went back to the floor. Nice outfit, I said, trying to lighten the mood. She looked down at herself and grinned. The leather stops zombie bites. Must have cost you a fortune, I said. Yeah, she said, turning and posing like a model on a runway. 
but I can wear it shopping or to parties. I'll get a lot of use out of it. Maybe you should get one, and then we can look like Batman and Batwoman. Batgirl, I said. No, I'm more of a denim and Kevlar man. Sometimes I need to stop bullets, too. She smiled at me, put her coffee cup on the table. Kevlar might stop bullets, but does it look as good as this Batwoman outfit? Batgirl, I said, and no. It's kind of hot, and not in the sexy way. Oh, it's plenty hot in the sexy way, I said, then felt embarrassed for saying it. I picked it up a while ago, but I've only really worn it a couple of days this past week. To be honest, I've been thinking about ditching it. She sat in her chair, and her face lost all expression, and she spoke without looking at me. When I saw you fall under that bulldozer, I thought I had lost you. I cried for you for days. I still held out some hope. For a long time, I waited for you to show up, but I didn't know what to do. You're here now, and that's what's important. She nodded and looked at the floor. Jen is dead, she said. It came out of nowhere, and I didn't understand why she was even bringing it up. Um, I... yeah, I said, trying to form a thought. We settled that, remember? Jen is gone. No, she said, leaning in. Jen is dead. She, or the zombie version of her, showed up when I was with Mr. Parks' group before we left. Did you... No, she said. I didn't want to be the one. Ron killed her. Oh, I said. I only tell you because I want it to be settled in your mind. I want you to know that you'll not be seeing her again. I nodded, taken aback by the news. She put her hand on my knee. You okay? Yeah, I said. Jen has been gone for months. I'm over that. I've been gone for months, she said. Are you over me? No, of course not. She stood and went over to the window. The garden looks good, she said. It's a lot of work, I said. I've never had one that big before. She nodded, but seemed lost in thought. I don't understand, I said. If you didn't think you'd find me here, why did you come? She shrugged, but didn't turn around. I was just feeling sentimental, I guess. You drove all the way from Biloxi because you were feeling sentimental? I told you why I left Biloxi, she said. It was bad there. I've been back in Kentucky for six days. I've been staying in a cabin on Kentucky Lake. It's secluded out there, and I've only seen one zombie since I got there. Six days? Why didn't you come here before now? I didn't think I could bring myself to live in Clayfield anymore. I thought it would be too painful, but also, I didn't come back alone. There was something about the way she said it. Oh? I met this guy down there. I came back here with him and another couple. Oh, I whispered. She turned to face me, but her eyes found the floor again. I thought you were dead, she said. Yeah, you said that already. She returned to the table and sat in her chair. I didn't know where you were, she said. Did you think you'd find supplies or something? Did you come to take the stuff? She winced at that and shook her head. I wanted to come here because I missed you. I wanted to visit where we used to be together, you know? I wanted to come alone because this was a private thing for me. I left early this morning before the others got up. It was the first chance I've had to get away. I left them a note, but they're probably worried sick about me. Then I guess you should get back, huh? I said flatly. I felt numb. She stood again and went back to the window. I wasn't expecting this, she said. I wasn't expecting to see you again. I've been expecting you for... Forever, I said. I love you, she said. I've told you that before. Please believe that. I love you. 
That never changed. Then why are you with him? She turned and looked me in the eye. Grant is a nice guy, and... Grant? I scoffed. That's his name? It was a childish thing, laughing at the man's name, especially since it was a perfectly good name, but it was all I had. Things are different now, she continued, ignoring my outburst. Couples are pairing up not so much for love, but more for safety and companionship, and just knowing that there's another healthy person close by. I guess I'm setting feminism back by saying it, but it's good to know there is a strong man around. So he was convenient, I said. He was there. He's a really nice guy, but yes, he was convenient. It's not like there are a lot of nice men left. Was I? Was I convenient? No, she said. But I always felt like I was. I always thought I was what you settled for when Jen was gone. I looked at the floor. I hadn't intended on doing that, but I could see that I had treated her that way. I'm sorry, I said. She turned back to the window. Grant and I have been together for about a month. It's not really that long, but in this new world, it's a very long time. He's been good to me. We... Stop, I said. I don't want to know about Grant or his niceties or how grateful you've been to him. All I want to know is what you're going to do. I don't know, she said. It would be a lie to tell you that I don't care about him at all. I do. I care about him a lot. He's been a good friend. He's... he's been more than a friend. If you don't want me around anymore, then I'll go back to him. And if I do want you to stay... What about this Grant guy and your other two friends? She shrugged. I don't know. I brought them up here. I convinced them that life would be better here. I guess I'll go talk to them. Maybe Grant will understand the situation. No matter how nice this guy is, he's not going to understand, I said. If you want to stay, then please stay. Don't go back. No good can come from it. They'll think something happened to me. Let them, I said. Would you rather they think you died or abandoned them? But they're still my friends, she said. Maybe they could live here too. Sarah, I can appreciate where you're coming from, and I would welcome some help around here, but this is going to be trouble. It will be okay, she said. I'll go talk with them and explain. They know about you. I told them all about you and this place. Grant will understand. He knows how I felt about you, still feel about you. He has been so sweet about it. I'm sure he has, I said. She turned away. I absentmindedly picked up my to-do list from the table and looked at it. I wasn't reading it or even thinking about it. It was just something to occupy my shaking hands. I sighed and wadded up the paper. I've got things to do, I said. When you make up your mind, you'll know where to find me. I'm not going anywhere. I'm sorry, she whispered. I love you. I never tried to hurt you. I sighed again and rubbed my eyes. Hell, I know, Sarah, but... But you're here. You came back to me just like I imagined you would. I've been so damned empty. She took a step toward me but hesitated. I waited for you to come back all this time, I continued. And then, when you do, you lay this on me. How do you expect me to react? How would you react? I don't know, she said, staring down at her feet. I pushed my chair out, went to her, and wrapped my arms around her. Her hands slipped around my waist. We just stood there and held each other for a while. I want you to stay with me, I whispered. She hugged me tighter. I want to stay with you, but I can't just abandon them. I can't leave him without talking to him first. Let's go then, I said. Go? Yeah. If you're going back to talk to him, I'm going to. I'm not going to lose you again. 
Chapter 5 By 2 p.m., Sarah was maneuvering down a narrow, winding gravel road. We were deep in the woods. I kept catching glimpses of Kentucky Lake through the trees off to the left. How did you find this place? I said. My family stayed here one weekend every summer, she said. My dad's boss owned it. We had spent some of the drive over catching up, but we kept the conversation superficial. Once we got near the state park, we both got quiet. I suppose we were both playing out scenarios in our head about what might happen when we got to the cabin. The road wound around a hill, then up. Eventually, it led out in a clearing on a bluff overlooking the lake. The cabin didn't look like I imagined it would. I pictured one of those rustic hunting cabins they have in movies. This was a small house with vinyl siding. Out front were some lawn chairs and a fire pit. There was a red van there, too. Great view of the lake from here, I said. She parked the truck away from the house. The door opened on the cabin, and a Latino man stepped out with a shotgun. Is that him? No, she said. That's Julio. Yeah, he doesn't look much like a Grant. She squeezed my hand and looked at me intently. Just sit in the truck for now, okay? I'll go in and talk to him. I nodded. She got out. I watched her walk up and say something to Julio. They stood out front and talked. Their voices were muffled and I couldn't understand what they were saying. She gestured toward me a few times and Julio kept glancing out at me. Then the two of them went inside. It had taken us a little more than an hour to drive out to the cabin, and I was tired of sitting, so when they went inside, I got out and stood by the truck. To be honest, it was kind of emasculating hanging around outside while Sarah went in to do the job, but it was her job to do, so I tried not to think about it. Then the door opened, and Sarah came out again with Julio and another young woman. The couple stopped near the entrance, and Sarah walked out to me. Grant is down by the lake fishing, she said. Christine said he was upset that I left by myself. He was going to go out looking for me, but they talked him into waiting a while to give me some time. What's the plan? I asked, eager to leave. Do you want to load up your stuff? They are both okay with coming back to Clayfield with us. They're not very happy about how this is going to change things. They told me they would break the news to Grant, but I'd rather tell him myself. I owe him that much. I looked up at the couple and waved. They frowned at me, but Christine lifted her hand. Christine had not bothered with maintaining her pre-apocalypse hairstyle. Her hair had been raven black before, and the remnants of that color still took up about four inches on the ends. The rest of her hair was blonde giving her hair a stark two-tone. She had a few small tattoos on her arms, a skull, and a Celtic cross. Christine is going to walk me down to where he is. You should probably wait here. I watched the two women walk away to my right on a path that led into the woods and toward the lake. Julio stared at me from beside the fire pit. He was shorter than me, but he was built like a tank. He was completely clean-shaven, including his head, which looked polished. I was impressed that he had managed to keep up with the cue ball look after all this time. He was wearing a black muscle shirt, which showed off not only his physique, but also a dragon tattoo on his left arm that capped his shoulder and wrapped down to his elbow. He looked like he was in his early thirties. Hey, I said from the truck. Sup, he said giving his head a little jerk backward, sort of a reverse nod. Julio, right? Julio. Good to meet you, I said. He didn't reply. After an uncomfortable silence, he said, So, you're him. I suppose, I said, nodding. You suppose? He said. He sounded disgusted. Sarah and I knew each other from before, I said. Yeah, man. She talked about you a lot. She talked like you were a Superman or something. She said that? Well, I 
You don't look like no Superman to me, man. I never claimed to be, I said. Grant's a cool dude, man, Julio said. He's my boy. He saved my life twice. This is going to mess him up. I know that, I replied. I wish it didn't have to be that way. I heard some movement in the woods off to my left and looked that direction, putting my hand on the butt of my pistol. Julio heard it too and lifted his shotgun. A young man, not much more than a kid, came over the rise of a hill and stumbled out of the woods. He had thick, wavy, dark hair that was down on his collar. He was carrying a fishing rod and tackle box, and there was a big revolver holstered on his hip. Whoa, Julio, watch the gun, bro. Julio lowered the shotgun, and the newcomer looked at me. Who's this? he said. Him, Julio replied. Sarah's boyfriend, man. Oh, he said. Him. He was tall, but not lanky. There was plenty of muscle there, too. He would have fit in on any NBA team. I was sure he could don a chitin and be mistaken for a Greek god. Yet there was something about him that gave him a boyish look and made him seem smaller than he really was. It wasn't just his face, which looked fresh and innocent, but it was also the way he carried himself. I felt like I had the upper hand with him, even though I knew he could easily kick my ass. That might have been it. I knew he could kick my ass, but he didn't know it. Perhaps it was a matter of confidence. He stood at the edge of the clearing and looked back and forth between me and Julio. Has he come for her? He said. Then he looked at me. Have you? Sarah wants to talk to you, I said. She has gone down by the lake to find you. I heard the truck come back, so I came up here as fast as I could. He put his fishing rod and tackle box on the ground, then came toward me. It startled me, and I didn't know what to expect. He put his hand out. Hesitantly, I reached out and took it. His hand swallowed mine up. His grip was firm, and he looked me in the eye. It's good to meet you, he said, politely. My name is Grant. I've heard a lot about you, and I'm happy to see you survived. I'm sure Sarah is happy about it as well. Thank you, I said, unsure what to say. I was stunned. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe this guy was so nice that he would understand. I started to extricate myself from the handshake, but he gripped me a little harder. Now, there's something you should know, he said, with a stern but friendly expression and in a tone reserved for 1950s TV dads admonishing their children. Sarah and I, we're together now. She's cried for you, and now she's moved on. I hope there won't be any hard feelings over that. Me too, I said. He didn't seem too bright, and his mild posturing lacked substance. He wasn't really a man, he was just pretending to be one. He released my hand and maintained eye contact for a moment under the brief and mistaken presumption that he had successfully pissed out his territory. Then he went back to the edge of the woods to retrieve his fishing gear. I'm going to put this away, then I'll go find the girls, he said. I looked over at Julio, and he was staring at me. I couldn't read him. It was as if he was looking right through me. Grant took his fishing supplies into the house, then came out again. Did they go down the path? he asked. Julio nodded, but didn't take his eyes off me. If they come back up the other way, tell them to wait for me. I'll try to catch up with them. At that, he took off in a jog, following the same path Sarah and Christine had taken. Sarah said you all might come back with us to Clayfield, I said. Julio shrugged. We're still working it out, you know. There are more infected in Clayfield than here, I said, but there are more supplies, more food. He nodded. We stood there, me by the truck, he by the house, for a long time without another word. I leaned on the truck a while. I walked around, pretending to look at nature for a while. 
I squatted down and dug little rocks out of the ground with a stick. Julio remained planted the whole time. Finally, Sarah appeared, returning up the path. She was crying. When she got in the clearing, she went over to Julio. She said something to him in a low voice, gave him a quick hug, then went into the house. After a couple of minutes, she came out carrying a duffel bag. We can go now, she said, tossing the bag into the back of the truck. You drive. Chapter 6 She didn't say anything for several miles. She just stared out of her window, crying softly. I held her hand, but I didn't press her for information. I didn't like seeing her like that. After a while, she said, I'm sorry. He's a sweet guy, and I really hated hurting him like that. Okay, I said, but I don't want you to feel forced into anything. Are you sure about this? Completely, she sniffed. Do you expect them to come to Clayfield eventually? She shook her head. I don't know. We didn't see any infected people near the lake. Once we'd traveled several minutes, they began to appear next to the road, or in yards and fields. Seeing them off the road was tricky because the weeds and grass had grown so tall, and because often they would be standing perfectly still. We crossed over into Grace County after 4 p.m. It was another 15 minutes before we got close to Clayfield. I could see the top of the water tower and the courthouse spire sticking up over the trees in the distance. I turned off on a side road that would take me toward the stables. I drove around downtown Clayfield this morning before coming out to the Laster place, Sarah said. It looked a lot different, overgrown, banged up. I noticed a big hole in the roof of my church. A tank shell did that, I think. I haven't been in there, but that's probably what did it. I wonder where they found tanks. I don't know, I said. There are armories around. They could have taken them from there. The National Guard might have had them out when things were getting bad and abandoned them. Wheeler's men weren't military. They might have been an organized militia, but I doubt it. I got the impression they had all come together after Canton B and not before. I still don't know where they went. Maybe they all succumbed to the virus. So you've had Clayfield to yourself for a while, she said. Yeah, I nodded. It's not as awesome as it sounds, though. I saw the yellow cars, she said. Did you do that? No, I said. Then I explained about the cars, the heads, and all the rest. Hmm, she said, getting an odd tone in her voice. That's... That's weird. Yeah, I said. When I was waiting with Julio, I was thinking about it, and I thought maybe you'd done it since you'd been back for several days. I was going to ask you about it. Wasn't me, she said. Whoever it is, I'm not sure what they are up to. I was glad to see there was another healthy person around, but I'd hoped they'd have more sense. She was quiet for a moment, then said, you look kind of banged up and overgrown yourself. Is this what happens when there aren't any women around? I glanced at myself in the rearview mirror and brushed my hair away with my hand. I could use a shave and a trim. And a bath, she added. I grinned. I've been saving my water for drinking and for the garden. I know. I stink. I think a dip in the horse pond would be an improvement. I'm sure you're going to smell lovely when you peel out of all that leather. She giggled a little. I'm sure I won't. It was nice to hear a laugh from her. After a couple of minutes of silence, I changed the subject. For a while, I tried putting down as many as I could. I went out every day. Killing the infected, she said. Yeah. We did that down in Biloxi, she said. We had teams that would go out every day. There were a lot more infected there. I don't think I made much of a dent, I said. I have a notebook at the house where I was keeping a tally. I think my last count for those runs was around 400. 
That's not counting the ones from before, or the ones I came across when I was looking for supplies. That's four hundred less to bother us, she said. How did you dispose of them? I didn't, really. At first I tried piling them up and burning them, but it was just too much work. I'm here to help you now, she said, and patted my leg. This all feels kind of bizarre. It doesn't even seem real that you're alive. I'm glad you came back, I said softly, and took her hand. She scooted across the seat and put her head on my shoulder. When we pulled into the driveway at the Laster place, I got out and shut the gate and latched it. I never locked it because the undead could never figure out how to open it. It was late afternoon, and ordinarily I would still have a few hours of chores left to do, but not that day. I decided chores could wait. I wanted to devote that afternoon and evening to celebrating Sarah's return. Since this is a special occasion, I said, how would you like a hot shower? Hot shower, she grinned. You're really moving up in the world. How are we going to do that? That RV over there. You'll just have to give me an hour or so to fill the tank and heat the water. What about the garden, she said. I thought you were saving the water for that. I've been praying for rain. Maybe God is done being mad at us. I know I need a shower, she said, but you need one more than I do. You first. By 7 p.m., we were both bathed and smelling considerably better, dressed as nicely as we could in new clothes, and seated at the table, having a celebratory dinner of spinach salad, canned tuna, fried squash, and crackers. Since the blackberries happened to be in season, we had a blackberry cobbler for dessert. I had plenty of alcohol stashed away, and Sarah had overcome her aversion to drinking, so the wine flowed freely. Oh, it feels so good to be here with you, she said, as she finished off her bowl of cobbler. That's the wine you feel, I said, or feeling clean. We had showers down in Biloxi. The group we joined had electricity, running water, even a movie every night. Why in the world would you leave? Everybody wanted what we had. We weren't only fighting the undead, we were also defending where we lived from gangs. It wasn't worth it to me. I liked it better here. It was simpler here. We've had gangs here. She shook her head. Not as bad. I nodded and tried to imagine what it might be like in other parts of the country and the world, particularly in the cities. This squash and spinach came from the garden? She asked. From the seed packets we had? Uh, yeah. Those tomato and pepper seedlings we had before you left are about waist high now. The tomatoes are blooming. The sweet potatoes are doing well, too. What about the millet? Did you plant it? No, I said. There was a lot of winter wheat growing at different farms. I collected as much of that as I could a couple of weeks ago. I didn't really know what I was doing, so I wasted a lot. Still, I got enough to fill a 55-gallon barrel. She shrugged. Maybe we can figure out how to make bread out of it. I miss bread. If we can't, I'm sure the chickens will like it, I said. Are they still around? She asked. I haven't seen them today. Yeah, I said. I keep hoping to find more on my supply runs, but I suppose that all of the chickens that have survived thus far have escaped and lived in the woods away from their former homes. I haven't seen any living chickens anywhere except for the two here. When the light began to fade, we lit candles and moved into the living room, each of us carrying a bottle of wine and a glass. I wanted to talk about Grant and the others, but she avoided the subject. She did talk about her time in Biloxi, but she shied away from any mention of Grant, even though I knew he must have been a part of some of the stories she recounted. I didn't know if she was staying away from that for her sake or mine, and I didn't want to bring it up if she felt uncomfortable. Eventually she would have to. Eventually I would press the matter, but not that night. I couldn't quit staring at her, and I did so unabashedly. In the past, I would have looked away when she noticed me, but I wanted her to know that I enjoyed looking at her. She even blushed a couple of times under my gaze. 
I remembered her standing in this very room months before, making me blush with her advances. I wanted to follow through with what she had proposed on that night, but I didn't know if this particular night would be appropriate. She was in the middle of one of her stories. I looked in the closet and found this garbage bag full of money. I was only halfway listening. I was so caught up in her being there. My outlook on living had changed since that morning. I felt so full of hope for how things could be. Was that thunder? she said. Huh? Listen. There was a faint rumble. I stood and went to the window. Off to the west, I saw the flicker of lightning. Well, I'll be damned, I said. It is. Maybe it'll rain after all. See, she said. God doesn't stay mad. I nodded, still looking out the window. Then I remembered. Hold on a sec, I said. I've got something for you. I went upstairs, opened the closet, and pulled down the gift from the shelf. The red wrapping paper had dust on it. I blew it off and carried it downstairs. Here, I said. I got you something. What's this for? she said, smiling. Just because, I said. You had a birthday while you were away. It could be for that. She ripped into the package, and her smile widened. Yertle the turtle, she said. It's an old copy, I said. Kids marked in it. I love it. Thank you. Thunder rumbled again, and I looked out the window. Have you moved my things out? she asked. I turned to face her. No, your room is as you left it. Good, she said, standing. I'm ready for bed. She wobbled a little because of the wine and put a hand out to steady herself. Need some help? I'm okay, she said. I watched her go upstairs, and I went around and made sure all of the doors were locked. Then I took the two empty wine bottles into the kitchen, grabbed a lit candle, and went up to my own room. The thunder was louder. It was getting closer. We needed more than a storm. We needed two or three days of steady rain, but I would take what I could get. A single downpour, if long enough and hard enough, would refill the cistern and rain barrels. I heard the first fat drops hitting the roof as I removed my boots. I fell back into bed and was asleep almost instantly. I woke up to the sound of crashing thunder. I opened my eyes. The room was dark. Lightning flashed bright, followed quickly by another crash. I didn't know what time it was, but the storm was right on top of us. The wind made the house groan, and the rain beat against the windows. Lightning lit up the room again, and I saw Sarah standing in the doorway. Are you awake? she said, almost in a whisper. Yeah, I said. Can I get in bed with you? Uh, yeah. I could see her only as a shadow, but I could see that shadow was undressing. I swallowed hard. A brilliant blinding flash filled the room, burning the image of her unclothed body into my brain. Then the deep boom startled me. She crawled in and scooted close to me. She was warm. I breathed her in. She smelled good, like a woman. I wanted to say something, but I couldn't think of anything. I'm glad this is finally happening, she whispered. Chapter 7 The next morning, I opened my eyes and looked around. It was later than I normally wake up. The light in my room was much brighter. There was this noise that I couldn't identify. I was alone. I wondered if it had all been a dream. I pulled the sheet away. I saw that I was naked, and I grinned. It hadn't been a dream. There was the noise again. I stood and went to the doorway. Sarah? I said. Downstairs, she called out. I put on some jeans, strapped on my pistol, put on my boots, and went down to join her. The noise was someone yelling. What's going on? I said as I walked into the living room. She was standing at the front window, 
wrapped in a blanket. It's Grant, she said. I looked out the window. The red van was parked out on the road. Grant was hanging out the driver's window, shouting toward the house, but I didn't know what he was saying. Then he got on the horn for one long, continuous blast. Shit, I said. He's going to have every zombie for miles coming in. I have no idea how long he's been out there, she said. Maybe all night. I heard him honking a few minutes ago, so I got up. He could have walked up the driveway and knocked, I said. He can be immature. Are Julio and Christine with him? I haven't seen them, she said. Well, the gate isn't locked, I said. If he wants to come up here, he can. Once the infected show up, he'll either have to leave or come in. It probably wasn't a good idea to tell them the address to this place. I'll go out and talk to him, she said. Is this going to be a thing, I said. Is this going to be a problem? No, she said. Then she stood on tiptoes and kissed me. Last night was nice. Yeah, I grinned. You go make some coffee. I'll talk to him. No, I said. Why don't you take care of the coffee and let me take care of him? Don't be like that, she said. I've had experience breaking up with boys. I don't need you to do it for me. She left me and went upstairs. I was still standing at the window, staring out at the van when she returned dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. There was a small pink pistol sticking out of the back of her pants. Cute gun, I said. Is that a toy? I've made seventeen kills with it, she said as she brushed past me to the front door. How's that for cute? She went out the front door and crossed by the front window on her way down the porch. Grant got out of the van and went up to the gate. Sarah made her way down the long driveway without a word, and Grant stood at the gate and waited. I looked out at the front of the property. The morning sun was turning the rain from the night before into steam. It was going to be an especially hot day thanks to all the humidity. The storm had knocked down a lot of leaves and small limbs. It looked like some of the cucumber vines had fallen down from the trellis I'd made for them. There were two empty plastic flower pots in the front yard that had blown off the porch. I didn't make any coffee. I wanted to watch to make sure everything went smoothly between Sarah and Grant. She stopped by the gate. The voices were loud a few times, but never loud enough so I could understand words. Grant was angry. I knew he would be. I just hoped he wasn't angry enough to harm her. I didn't want to go out there and aggravate the situation. Finally, Sarah turned her back on him and started back up the driveway. He kept standing there, calling after her. When she got as far as the porch, he climbed back into the van, cranked it, and then backed away. He disappeared from sight, and I went out on the porch with Sarah. He'll be okay, she said. Then I heard the van returning, engine roaring. He came flying in cut hard to the left and crashed through the gate. Damn it, I yelled. It wasn't even locked. His door opened, and he climbed out. It wasn't even locked, asshole. I've come to get her, he yelled. Sarah, you're coming back with me, baby. Son of a bitch. I stepped off the porch and went out to meet him. Don't you hurt him, Grant, Sarah yelled from behind me. I knew this would be a thing, I said. Sarah! Sarah, I love you, babe. What the hell, man, I yelled. You can't open a friggin' gate. I don't care about your gate, bro, he said. We were closing the distance between us fast. All I want is Sarah. You'll care plenty when every zombie in the county shows up and... I looked out toward the road. See? There's one now. How long have you been out here making a racket? He stopped so quickly that he actually skidded in the gravel. He looked over his shoulder, his mouth hanging open, and stared out at the shambling creature by the mailbox. Dumbass, I said. He turned back toward me. His eyes narrowed. He took a step forward and hit me in the forehead. It was hard enough to make me stumble backward, but nowhere near as hard as I knew he was capable. He had hesitated. 
He wasn't committed to the punch, and I figured he wasn't committed to the fight. Or maybe he just didn't know how to fight. I couldn't say I knew how, but I had clubbed enough zombies to know that when you hit them, you should really damn well hit them. Don't you hurt him, Grant! Damn it, I wish she would quit saying that. Show some faith, would you? I said mostly to Sarah, but also to myself. Grant stepped in again and drew a fist back. I ducked down and ran forward, ramming my shoulder into his midsection. He tried to keep his balance, but went down onto his back. I straddled him like a kid on a playground and pushed the side of his face into the driveway. He kept slapping my head. There was nothing manly about either of us. His eyes rolled up and widened. He said, Dude. I looked up, too, following his line of sight. There was a corpse, clothed in brown, oily rags, standing right there, drooling down on us. I started to get up, but a dark blur came over my head. Then the creature was hit in the face with a hoe. Sarah came in from behind me and took another swing. The thing fell sideways, and Sarah beat its head to mush. I got to my feet, and there were three more coming up the driveway. Don't use your guns, she said. It'll just make it worse. I ran over to the fence for the garden and grabbed a rake that was propped up there. Sarah was already on her way out to meet the others, and Grant was right beside her, unarmed. He reached over to touch her shoulder, but she jerked away. I'm really mad at you right now, Grant, I heard her say. He stopped, but she continued on. When she was close enough to the nearest zombie, she swung her hoe. Grant ran over and got into his van. I thought he was going to leave us, but instead he backed over the other two creatures. Then he pulled up farther into the driveway and got out again. Hurry, he called out to me. Let's pull the gate back before more get in. I ran over and helped him pick up the gate, while Sarah held off the closest zombie. Several more creatures were coming down the road. They would continue to trickle in for a while. The gate was bent, but we were able to prop it up across the opening, then pull the van against it to brace it. It should hold, I said. When they move on, I'll fix it properly. We all stood next to the van, breathing hard, sweating, and staring at the undead on the other side of the gate. There were twelve of them right there, but there were more coming in. Nice, I said. I haven't had problems out here for a while. Way to go, Grant. Stop it, Sarah said. You said the gate would hold. Let's just go back in the house and sort this out. What if it doesn't hold? I said. What if they break through and mess up the garden? What then? Grant. Stop it, Sarah said. No, I said. We're going to have to be quiet and out of sight for a while until they leave. How am I supposed to tend the garden? How am I supposed to do anything? It's like a thousand degrees and we have to stay cooped up in the house. Don't be such a baby, Grant said flippantly. Son of a bitch, I yelled. The creatures all answered me with howls. Enough, Sarah yelled. We'll sort it out inside. She stomped off toward the house. Despite my anger, and even though I knew she was angry too, I couldn't help think about how great she looked walking away. The grip of that pink pistol poking out of her jeans just made it even more adorable. Grant must have been thinking the same thing, because when I looked over at him... He had this silly grin on his face. Get in the house, dumbass, I said. Grant followed Sarah up to the house. I stopped in the garden to retie the cucumber vines. I wanted to eat some breakfast, but I planned to come outside right after that to pick the vegetables that needed picking. The creatures were out there, and they would continue to come in for a while, so I didn't see the harm of doing it at that time. I came in the house about fifteen minutes later. I didn't see Sarah, but Grant was slouched in my favorite chair, looking through one of my playboys. I frowned at him and went upstairs to wash up in my basin and find a shirt to wear. I walked past Sarah's bedroom and found her sitting on her bed, her arms crossed and staring at the floor. I stopped in the doorway. Do you want some breakfast? I said. I'm going to eat something. I'm sorry, she said. I shrugged. Not your fault. 
Grant left Julio and Christine at the cabin without a vehicle, she said. Why the hell would he do that? I asked. He planned to go back after he got me. Why didn't they come with him? He didn't tell them he was leaving. She didn't come out and say it, but I knew she wanted to go back for them. She wanted me to be the one to bring it up. I sighed. They'll be fine. She stood. What if they need to get away quickly? How will they do it? They're right on the lake, I said. Aren't there any boats nearby? We're probably in worse shape than they are. But we can't leave, Sarah. Our exit is blocked thanks to your boy down there. I thought we might be able to cross the pasture in the back and cut through the woods to that other farm. Maybe we could find a car over there. I shook my head. The infected have come through that way before. I have the fence fixed back there, but that doesn't mean they aren't in the woods right now trying to find a way across. I'm sorry, but Julio and Christine will have to fend for themselves, at least for a day or two. Christine should get her period tomorrow, or the next day for sure. I looked down at the floor, then back at Sarah. I'll probably get mine about the same time, she said. Shit. We need to go now while we can, she said. Or I need to go. Julio and Christine don't have enough supplies for a long stay inside that cabin. We stored a lot of our supplies in the van, and Grant didn't unload it before he left. There haven't been any infected out there that we've seen, but they might start showing up when Christine gets her period. If I stay here, it'll get bad here. You know that. We're not in any danger here, I said. Not now. I've fortified the property. I have plenty of supplies spread all over in every building. We're okay here for a couple of weeks at least, so long as we don't run out of water. What about Christine and Julio? They know about the menstrual thing, right? They'll know to go someplace safe for a while. They'll probably get out on the lake, a houseboat or something. Grant said he was willing to go with me. Grant's an idiot, I said. That's not jealousy talking. He really is an idiot. I don't see how he's made it this long. I don't want you going anywhere with him. You don't know him well enough to call him that, she said. He made some bad decisions this morning, but that's because he was emotional. Cut him some slack. I remember you making some bad moves when you got too emotional over Jen. She had me there. I smirked and shook my head. Well, I can see how you might make a man do crazy things. You've had almost every man in Clayfield stirred up for months. We have to go, she said solemnly. We have to go get them and bring them back here. Fine, I said reluctantly. I have bug-out bags packed. There's one in every room. Grab one and let's go. She came over and hugged me. Do you regret that I came back? Not yet. Chapter 8 Grant carried an axe and the bug-out bag, which was a large backpack containing food, water, first aid, and other survival supplies. Sarah carried a shotgun, her little pink job, and a hunting rifle with a scope slung on her back. I carried a splitting maul and smaller backpack with a gallon of water and extra shotgun shells. We all had holstered sidearms as well. We went out the back door, and when we crossed the fence into the back horse pasture, I turned to face them. We are going due north. I've been in those woods a couple of times looking for wild food and... Like squirrels? Grant said. No, I said. Not like squirrels. We'll travel a few hundred feet, and there will be a creek. It's about ten feet deep and about twenty across. Then a few hundred feet more, and we'll be in an old soybean field. The weeds are probably pretty tall by now, but just keep your eyes on the silo. That will lead you to the barns and house. If we get separated... We won't, Sarah interrupted. If we do... We'll meet up at the silo and go from there. Let's try to stay together. Grant and I will do as much of the killing as we can with the maul and axe. 
Let's not shoot unless we have to. Are you ready? They both nodded. I'll look out for you, babe, Grant said, putting his hand on her shoulder. Sarah jerked away. Fast as we can, I said. Okay? They nodded again. I took in a deep breath, let it out, and set off in a jog across the pasture. I still had one horse left out there, but I never paid any attention to it. It had taken care of itself all this time. Alone, it had not been able to keep the pasture eaten down, and the grass was about waist-high. I heard it nicker from somewhere out of sight. You have a horse out here? Grant said, huffing behind me. Somewhere, I said. You can't let him eat all these fescue heads, bro. He'll founder. I have no idea what you just said, but I can't monitor what he eats. Dude, this is bad for him. Have you noticed his feet splitting? Is there any bloating? I just told you, I don't notice anything with the damn horse, I said. Now stay focused. We're about to cross into the woods. Most of the fence row was swallowed up in honeysuckle and cluttered with young poplar and mulberry saplings. But the spot where we had crossed was relatively clear of vegetation. We each climbed the fence in turn, then stood there a moment staring into the woods. I let my eyes adjust to the reduced light. There were spots here and there ahead of us where an opening in the canopy allowed bright pools of light to touch the ground, but it was mostly shaded. The majority of the trees were deciduous and large, thirty to seventy-five years old. There weren't any old-growth forests around in this part of the state anymore. The last of those trees had been cut in the 1950s. It would be a stretch to even find a tree more than 100 years old, and if it were found, it would likely be sold to a lumber mill. Relatively speaking, however, this was an old woods. Most of the newer growth was around the perimeter, but sometimes a sapling could be found struggling to find light under the umbrella of its grandfather's. I'd always loved spending time in the woods, but since Canton B., being there scared the shit out of me. The things were in there. I knew they were. I just couldn't see them yet. Okay, I whispered. Let's go. I headed straight for the creek. I was so glad for the rain the night before that had moistened and quieted the dry leaves underfoot. Even so, I still thought we were loud. I saw the first creature before we got to the creek. It was off to our right, about fifty feet away. It had been a man once. The brown, naked body was swollen in the torso, but shriveled to the bone in the extremities. Its penis was missing, but the testicles still hung and swung. Its mouth dropped open when it saw us, and it bounded toward us with the lithe movements of a baby deer. Grant met it with the axe and caught it right under the chin, the head flipped into the air. The body ran two more steps before the knees folded up and dropped it. When it hit the ground, the belly of the thing split open like an overripe melon, and a gooey mass spilled out that didn't even come close to resembling entrails. None of us spoke. Sarah and I didn't even break stride. Then the woods began to move around us, they had blended so well with their surroundings. Their mottled skin seemed to act as camouflage. Protruding bones resembled the branches of trees. Splotchy, hanging flesh was like leaves and shaggy bark. I heard Sarah whimper. Just keep moving, I said. The creek isn't far. I picked up my pace. The gallon jug of water kept bouncing against my back. Sweat was pouring from all three of us. The humidity was awful. Grant intercepted a second creature with the downward swing of his axe. How do we get across the creek? Sarah said. It's steep, but we'll have to go down into it, then climb up the other side, I said. What about the rain? What about the water? I hadn't thought about that. The last time I went into the creek it had been almost dry. There were only puddles. I had no idea what to expect. Grant swung his axe again, and another zombie lost its head. 
I still didn't like him, but I was glad he was with us on that run. When we reached the creek, it was worse than I expected. The water was about chest deep, muddy, and the undead were down in it like crocodiles in the Nile. I'm not going down in there, Sarah said. I looked both directions, hoping to see a fallen tree bridge, but there wasn't. We had the axe and maul. I considered cutting a tree down, but really it wouldn't have been practical or fast. The grapevines, Grant said, and ran over to a tree near the bank of the creek. Cut them close to the ground, and we'll swing across. The wild grapevines were old, too. Some were so large I had mistaken them for the trunks of trees. Their branches stretched and climbed and crisscrossed all the way to the treetops. Grant picked up one of the smaller ones and hit it twice with his axe. The stiff, gnarled vine was about two inches in diameter, and it swayed like a pendulum once it was severed. Grant grabbed it and gave it a yank to test its strength. Come on, babe, he said. You go first. The creatures were closing in on us. I hit one in the face with the blunt end of my maul. It fell on its butt, and I drove the cutting edge down on the top of its skull. Across the creek, more were limping in. I glanced over to Sarah and Grant. Grant was holding Sarah's shotgun, and she was running toward the edge with Vine in both hands. Watch them on the other side, I yelled. Sarah sailed out over the creek, but the vine reached its limit before she was over the other bank. She held on, and the vine brought her back. It's too short, she said. Do it again, Grant said. Do it again and let go when you're high. You'll make it. No, I said. We'll cut another one. I turned to cut one near me. That's it, babe, Grant yelled. I turned around, and Sarah was out over the creek again. When her swing reached its apex, she let go. Her legs kicked in the air as if she were trying to run. She dropped several feet and hit the ground flat on her back on the edge of the other creek bank. She still had that rifle strapped to her back, and she landed on that. I knew it had to be painful, and I expected her to cry out, but she didn't. She didn't do anything. Sarah! She didn't answer. She didn't move. The creatures on the other side of the creek were gathering in. The ones on our side were, too. The vine didn't come all the way back. Instead, it settled in right over the middle. Hurry, I said. Cut another one. We have to get across. Stay away from her, Grant yelled to the things on the other side. Then he brought the shotgun up and fired across. There was a zombie female on all fours reaching out for Sarah's foot when its head exploded. Grant pumped the shotgun and fired again. A second creature lost its left arm. I turned back to the grapevine nearest me and swung the splitting maul. I notched the vine. I swung again. I heard the shotgun go off a third time. When I turned around, Grant was running, empty-handed, toward the creek. He got to the edge and leapt out, grabbing the vine. He swung, and the vine gave some under his weight with a jerk. Down he dropped, but he tucked and rolled, coming to his feet next to Sarah. Immediately he pulled his sidearm and spattered zombie brains on the nearby trees. He was a regular action star. Bastard, I said. I looked off to my right and saw that he had left the axe and shotgun propped against the tree on this side of the creek. Idiot, I said, pulling my own pistol. I fired at the monsters closest to me, reholstered my weapon, then swung my maul at the vine again. It finally came free. I tugged on it, and it seemed strong enough. It would have to do. I didn't have time to cut another. Chapter 9 I went to the edge of the creek and threw my maul over to the other side. Then I went back and grabbed my vine. It was rough and almost too thick. It wasn't like rope at all. Nothing like the things I used to see Tarzan swinging on in the old movies. It was more like holding onto a stick. I ran and jumped. Below me, the things in the creek closed in to reach for me, churning up the muddy water. My scrotum tightened and I held my breath. Then the other side was below me. 
I was too high, but I let go anyway. Just like Sarah, I landed on my back. It knocked the wind out of me for a second. The jug of water in my backpack was crushed and leaking. I rolled over, gasping. I could see the shuffling feet of zombies coming in from all sides. I jumped up, pulling my 9mm. I was surrounded. I looked over toward Grant for help, but he had Sarah hefted up on his shoulder like a sack of grain and was on his way out of the woods. He'd left Sarah's rifle and our bug-out bag behind. Asshole, I said. I shot an opening for myself, then ran to catch up with Grant, leaving my backpack and splitting maul. The backpack had the extra shells for the shotgun, but since the bonehead had left the shotgun, I saw no need to bring it along. I had an extra magazine for my 9mm in my back pocket. I caught Grant before he entered the old bean field. What's up with leaving me back there? I said. And why didn't you bring the bag? Had to get her to safety, bro. You're a big boy, aren't you? Is she okay? I don't know yet, he said. She's out. She fell on that rifle so hard she broke the stock out of it. When I get to some shelter, I'll take a look at her. I'll take a look, I said. He stopped and turned to face me. In that moment, he was every bit bigger than me. Have you had any medical training? What? No. He turned his back on me. Well, I was about to enter chiropractic college, so I think I'm a tad more qualified than you to inspect her injuries. Huh? When Sarah needs some museum and history stuff, I'll call you. We stepped out into the bright sunlight of the bean field. The weeds were high, some were even taller than our heads. They weren't mature grasses like in the pasture. These were plants like pokeweed, cockleburr, wild amaranth, blackberry, thistle, and lamb's quarters, plants with stalks and sometimes thorns. There were also a few soybean plants low to the ground that had come up from the previous year's leavings. Thankfully, the silo was easily visible. Sarah has made up her mind, I said. She came back to me. You need to deal with that. He stopped again. I was impressed that he had been able to carry Sarah on his shoulder all that time, and he didn't even seem strained at all. I doubted I could have done it. She's confused, he said. She'll change her mind. She was with me last night, I said. You know what I'm saying? She's not confused. He shut his eyes and pursed his lips. Bro, I swear I will hit you in the mouth if you talk about her like that. That's a warning. I could hear the creatures from the woods tromping in behind us. Off to our left, there was one picking its way toward us through the weeds. We need to keep moving, I said. We pushed through the plants and kept our eyes on the silo. Sarah stirred and moaned. It's okay, Grant said. I've got you, babe. Just a little farther to go. What happened? She mumbled. Ahead of us, the stalks were falling over, seemingly all by themselves. A path was being knocked down by something we couldn't see, probably another crawler, and it was coming our direction. Watch out, I said. I see it, Grant replied. I moved in front of him to face whatever was coming. I kicked out with my foot on each step to stomp the stalks down ahead of me. The thing was getting closer. Then it just stopped. I continued to advance with my 9mm ready. Finally, I kicked out. The stalks bent down and the paths joined. I was surprised to find a goat standing there chewing on a leaf. It was black, with two parallel white stripes that ran up its face. It blinked at me with those odd eyes with the horizontal pupils, bleated, and shook its head, making its ears flap. Whoa, Grant said as he stepped in behind me. Too bad we don't have time to catch it. I agreed. I hadn't seen a goat in months. I thought they all would have been caught and devoured by the undead. It was particularly surprised this one had made it so long because it just stood there unafraid and unimpressed. Male or female? Grant said. It has horns, I said. That doesn't matter. They both grow horns. Does it have a ball sack? 
They have really big ball sacks. Like me. Then he lightly smacked Sarah on the backside. Ain't that right, babe? It can't stay here, I said, distracted. They're coming in behind us, and they'll kill it. I continued forward and grabbed one of the goat's horns and tried to pull it with me. It walked with me a few steps, then jerked its head and bucked, wrenching out of my grasp. It's a boy, Grant said as he walked past me. Check out that ball sack. I looked back at the undead that were walking down the weeds behind us. Come on, I said to the goat and grabbed its horn again. It jerked away. I couldn't stay, so I left it. Just as we were passing out of the bean field into a gravel lot full of farm machinery, the goat ran past us and headed toward a barn. We'll go to the house, I said. The outbuildings are too open. The door to the brick ranch-style house was unlocked. It was a mess inside, either from looters or from the undead. I righted the couch, and Grant kneeled to lay Sarah down on it. She was lucid, but a little dazed. How are you doing, babe? He said, in the most sickly sweet voice, holding her hand in both of his. I leaned over her shoulder so she could see and hopefully remember me. She smiled wanly. My back hurts, she said. Let's get your shirt off so I can take a look, he said. No, I said. It's okay, Sarah said. He's had some pre-med. He's the closest thing to a doctor that we have right now since you shot Dr. Barr. Bro, did you shoot the only doctor? What were you thinking? I... What? I... But I... Don't worry, he said. I've seen her without a shirt before. Then he looked at me intently and said, Lots of times. He helped her sit up, then Sarah gingerly pulled her shirt over her head, then off. I don't know why, but I averted my eyes. Turn around and let me see, he said. I looked again, and there were large red marks on her back that were beginning to turn purple. Grant touched her spine, and she pulled away. That hurts, she said. Well, you might have cracked a vertebra, he said. That's it? I said, I could have done that. Sarah put her legs over the side of the couch. Do you think you can stand? He said. I think I can, she said. Obviously you aren't paralyzed, Grant said. Obviously, I said, glancing at Sarah's breasts. You took her shirt off for that? Stop making a major case out of it, Grant said. She'll need to rest a few days so those vertebrae heal up. Yeah, thanks for your medical expertise. Sarah, put your shirt on. Then I went over to the window and looked out. There were around ten creatures wandering around in the yard. There's a car parked out front, I said. I'm going to check it out. Grant, you look in here for keys. He stood and peered around at the trashed living room. We won't find keys in here. The place has been tossed already. The car is probably shit, or they would have taken it. Maybe, I said, or maybe the looters drove it here and traded it for something better. Check the place anyway. We don't have any supplies since you left the backpack in the woods. I tried to inject as much disgust as I could into that last sentence. I opened the front door of the house, looked around for any close zombies, and ran out to the car, a white, late 1980s Ford Tempo. Grant was right. It was shit. There was so much dried gore in the back seat that it looked like a big scab. There was a body back there that had almost completely decomposed. It smelled plenty bad. Ordinarily, I would have looked for other options, but this was perfect. The keys were in it. I climbed in and started it. It had a half tank of gas. I revved the engine, and Grant stepped out on the porch. I waved for them to come. When they both exited the house, I rolled down my window. I'm driving, and Sarah will need to sit up front with me. He hurriedly escorted her to the passenger door and helped her in. After he shut her door, she laid her head on her window and closed her eyes. She didn't act like she was bothered by the smell. Then Grant opened the rear door and balked. Dude, what the fuck?
he said. Just shove it over to the other side, bro, I said, grinning. Come on, we need to go. I am not riding in there, he said. Then shut the door, I said. Sarah and I are going to the lake with or without you. You can go back through the woods and wait at the stables until we get back. You need to make up your mind, because they're getting close. This is not cool, he said, and he pushed on the skull of the corpse. It was stuck to the seat. Finally, the head popped loose and fell to the floorboard. A clump of hair came off in his hands. He gave the scapula one hard shove with both hands, and the other bones collapsed against each other, somewhat like an accordion. There was still enough sinew to keep most of the bones connected together, so he had to sort of fold it in half. Not cool, bro. Chapter 10 I didn't make him sit back there the whole trip. We exchanged the scabby tempo for a new minivan fifteen minutes in. The van was slow to start and sputtered a little at first. I was having that experience more often with vehicles. I figured the gasoline was starting to go bad, but I didn't know for sure. Maybe all these cars didn't like sitting idle for so long. They needed someone to crank them and blow the soot out, as they say. There was an MP3 player plugged into the van stereo. We thought we'd get to listen to some music for the rest of the trip, but the player was loaded with lectures from motivational speakers and a couple of sermons by that preacher from that super church. Even though it wasn't music, I played them anyway, because it made me feel a little like I was normal again. Anything was possible if we believed. The universe was matching our vibrations and sending us what we wanted. We could make a fortune every month if we followed our dreams. God just wanted to make us smile. These were the things we heard. I wanted to believe every word. I wanted it all to be true. But outside the air-conditioned interior of that van, there weren't many smiles or good vibrations. I looked in the mirror at Grant. He didn't notice me. He was frowning out his window, and I thought I saw a tear running down his cheek. It might have been because of Sarah, or it might have been over the disconnect between the words he heard and the reality he knew. It might have been sweat. I turned up the air conditioning. Sarah slept the whole time, and I let her. We arrived at the cabin around noon. No one came out to greet us. Grant and I left Sarah in the van and went inside. I saw a duffel bag and a backpack sitting in front of a futon. On the futon were three long guns and several boxes of ammunition. Julio, Grant said, walking through the small house. I stayed in the front room. When he returned, he shrugged. They must be down by the lake. Is this normal? I said, pointing to the guns and bags. Normal? Do you always keep this stuff in here? I said in an impatient tone. No, he said, with a puzzled look on his face. Maybe they were getting ready to leave. Yeah, I said. Is there any reason why they would go down to the lake? Did you have a boat down there? We've seen boats tied up to docks, but not close by. Maybe they walked down the road to another cabin. Where's the closest one? That way, he said, pointing. But why would they do that? They would need a vehicle. Oh, he said. He thought for a moment, then added, There aren't any cars at that house. I sighed. Help me out here, man. Where would they go for a vehicle? There's a bait shop about two miles farther. There was a truck there. Let's grab this stuff and we'll go find them. Shouldn't we go check the lake first? Go ahead, I said. I'll load this stuff. You're going to leave me, aren't you, bro? I'm not an asshole, I said. Go have a look. I'll wait for you. I carried out the backpack and one of the guns, a 12-gauge shotgun, to the back of the van. When I opened the back, Sarah looked back at me. How are you feeling? I said. Not great, but I'll live. 
where are the others? Grant has gone down by the lake to look for them, but I'm guessing they walked to the bait shop. They had stuff packed and ready to leave. They were probably coming back for it. We could just wait for them, she said. It's quicker this way. I'm going back in for the rest of the stuff. Do you need help? I need you to rest. There were three more guns on the futon. All three were hunting rifles. I carried them out, then went back in for the duffel bag. I did a quick look in the kitchen for any supplies, but there were none. When I got the bag out to the van, I opened it, hoping to find some water. There were some clothes, granola bars, a first aid kit, and a couple of books. The backpack had two bottles of a generic red sports drink. I twisted the top on one and had a drink. It was warm and too sweet, but I was thirsty. I shut the back of the van and took the rest of the bottle up to Sarah. Here, I said. I couldn't find any water. There's a rain barrel around the back of the cabin, she said. There should be a jug of bleach sitting next to it. Is there anything to put the water in, I said. I didn't see anything in the house. She nodded as she took a drink. She swallowed and said, We keep empty containers with it. I walked around to the rear of the cabin. There was a blue barrel next to the house under the downspout. It was full from the previous night's storm. A white gallon jug with a blue lid sat on the ground next to it. There was no label, but I recognized it to be a bleach container. I opened it and sniffed it to make sure. There was a pile of empty plastic bottles and jugs on the ground there, too. Most of them had originally been juice bottles. I grabbed one and dunked it down into the barrel and held it there until the bubbles stopped. I filled another the same way, then poured a little out of each to make room for the bleach. I put a small amount into each bottle, screwed on the lids, and shook them up. Then I held one up to the sunlight. It wasn't exactly pure. The rain had washed a lot of dirt out of the air and off the roof. I heard footsteps and looked into the woods. Grant was coming up the trail from the lake. He saw me and came over. They're not there he said. He took one of the bottles from me and was about to drink, but I stopped him. Give the bleach a little time to kill anything that might be in there, I said. How much did you put in? It only takes a few drops for a bottle this size. About a capful, I said. That's too much, bro. I have a chart you can look at. I have my own chart, I lied. The bleach will dissipate. Yeah, well, that's not what I read, he said. This probably isn't safe now. It's probably safer to drink straight from the barrel. Go for it, bro. When you get the shits, don't come crying to me. Give me one of those empty bottles, and I'll mix my own water. Sarah has a bottle in the... There was a deep howl nearby in the woods. Grant turned and stared into the trees. I stepped beside him, listening. For a while, all I could hear was his heavy breathing and the occasional bird. Then there was another howl. Is it getting closer? He whispered. I can't tell, I whispered back. It howled again. I think it's alone, I said. No others are answering it. Come on. I grabbed the two bottles of water and went back to the van. Sarah was standing beside the vehicle with the door open looking in the direction of the sounds. It's only one, I said to her as I approached. We don't have anything to worry about. How's your back, babe? Grant said. The same, she said, continuing to stare into the woods. It's okay, I said, touching her arm. It's just the one. She nodded. I don't like it. There haven't been any here for days. Any. It doesn't mean anything, I said. Let's go find your friends. We all climbed in the van, and I pulled down the long driveway toward the gravel road. Take a left on this road and then a right when we get to the paved road, Sarah said. The bait shop isn't far. I turned off the stereo and air conditioning, then rolled down my window. I drove slowly, listening for more howls or other noises coming from the woods. Mostly what I heard was the sound of the gravel under the tires. 
Grant leaned in between Sarah and I from the front seat behind us and pointed ahead. Up there, he said. There was a person running down the middle of the road toward us. Behind them, a farther distance away, was a group of twenty or more. When the single figure got closer, I could see it was Christine. She was carrying a satchel in one hand and what appeared to be a length of two-by-four in the other. Chapter 11 Get up there, bro. She needs us, Grant yelled, gripping my shoulder. I mashed the accelerator, and Grant opened the side door of the van. When I pulled alongside her, she climbed in. She was crying. I got a closer look at her than I had before. I could see spots on her brow, lip, and nose where she'd had piercings. The jewelry was gone, however. I imagined she'd had the goth thing going on before the end of the world, and decided for whatever reason not to maintain her look. It might have been too much trouble. "'Where's Julio?' Grant said. "'You asshole!' Christine screamed and slapped Grant. "'You left us!' "'I was coming back,' Grant said, cowering. "'Julio is dead!' she wailed. "'He's fucking dead, and you did it!' "'I was coming back. I... I came back.' "'Are you sure he's dead? Where is he?' I said. "'Maybe we can help him.' "'Up there,' she cried. "'In the woods.' The creatures that were chasing her were closing in. "'You didn't make it to the bait shop?' I said. "'We made it there,' she said. "'But we had to come back because there weren't any keys to start the truck, "'and the area was full of goons.' I plowed into the approaching zombies and rammed my way through to the other side. Tell me when I'm close, I said. Up there, she said. Up there, by that sign. There was a deer crossing sign ahead. I checked my mirror to see how many pursued us. There were a few, but they were struggling. I skidded to a stop next to the sign. Everybody stay put, I said. I'm going to check it out. Grant, you take the wheel. Bro, I... Shut up, I said. Just do it. I hopped out and pulled my sidearm. I entered the woods by the sign. I didn't see anything. I wasn't sure how deeply into the woods I needed to go before I found him. I heard a moan. Ahead and to my left was a zombie with its back to me. It was facing a tree. I approached it as quietly as I could. We have to leave, Grant yelled from the van. The zombie perked up a little as if trying to listen, but it didn't move from that spot. I took another step, and Grant honked the horn. Dude, they're close. Dumbass, I said under my breath. Then I yelled, Damn it, just drive down the road and come back. The creature turned and stared at me. Yo, man, said a faint voice. Julio, I said. I'm in the tree, he said. I looked up over the zombie's head, and behind a clump of leaves, I could just make out one of Julio's legs hanging down. Are you hurt? I asked as I holstered my weapon and looked around for a big enough stick to club the creature. They got me good, he said. I picked up a fallen tree limb. It was about twelve feet long, forked, and still had the finger-like branches and dried leaves on the end. I held it up to keep the zombie from getting closer. Can you climb down? I said. He didn't answer me. The zombie walked into the limb, breaking off many of the smaller branches and wedging into the fork. We have a van out on the road, I said. You need to climb down if you can. Then I heard rustling in the leaves in the tree, then small branches snapping, and then Julio spilled out. He hit the ground with a loud thump. He had fallen at least ten feet. Julio, I said. Julio, are you okay? He didn't move. I steered the zombie around and pushed it against a large tree. Then I jammed the end of the limb into the ground, pinning it there. 
It leaned against the limb trying to reach me, but it was stuck there for the time being. I ran over and got on my knees next to Julio. I rolled him over. He was unconscious. His yellow t-shirt was torn and blood-soaked at the bottom, and he had bites all over his face, arms, and stomach. The corners of his mouth were foamy. I checked his pulse, and it felt weak. I heard the van returning. Grant was on the horn again. Come on, Julio, I said. Wake up. I tried to lift him, but I just wasn't strong enough. I was about to go get the others to help me when Grant came running into the woods. Over here, I yelled, waving my arm. Grant rushed over. Please tell me he's not dead. He's not, I said, but he's really chewed up. Help me pick him up. Maybe I can lift him, Grant said. I was a volunteer firefighter. We trained for stuff like that. I don't think you can, I said. He's heavy and... Move over, he said. To my surprise, Grant hefted Julio up on his shoulders. He's definitely heavy, he said with a grunt. I led the way back to the road, which wasn't far. The minivan wasn't there. I saw it farther down the road. Shoot your pistol, Grant said. I told Christine to drive back when she heard the gun. I pulled my pistol, and not wanting to waste a bullet, I stepped just inside the tree line and fired it off at the zombie pinned to the tree. I missed. The van pulled onto a side road, turned around, and headed back. When it pulled up to us, Grant set Julio in through the side door, then we climbed in. Then we lifted him up into the second row seat, and Grant crawled over to get one of the bags from the back. Is he still alive? Christine said from the driver's seat. Barely, I said. She shifted the van into park and was about to come back to us. Go, I said. We're going back to the stables. I want to see him, she cried. Get us to the main highway first. After we reached the main road and away from the group of undead, I took over as the driver. There was a first aid kit in one of the bags. Grant and Christine did the best they could with the limited medical supplies. He's not waking up, Christine said, stroking his cheek. Do you have any antibiotics? I asked. Dr. Barr said the bites get infected and they have to be treated with antibiotics. Grant held up a tube of medicated ointment. Neosporin, bro. That's it. It's just topical, but it's all we have. I don't think that's good enough, I said, shaking my head. I'm more concerned about the sea bees, Christine said. The sea bees? The last and only person I'd heard use that term was Burn, the young woman from Alabama. It was a shortened version of Canton B. Burn had said C for Canton, B for B, the sea bees. Another familiar term had come from Christine. Goons. The last time I'd heard that word was from Wheeler and his men. Get him awake and get him drunk, I said. I was bitten and I didn't catch it. I've known others that were bitten and didn't get it. There's no booze in here, bro. We took the vodka with us to the bait shop, Christine said. Julio must have dropped his bag. I didn't see his bag in the woods, I said. Why didn't you have more alcohol than that? We did, Christine said coldly. It was all in the van. Grant didn't leave us any. Grant didn't respond to that. We could stop at houses on the way, Sarah said. How would he drink it anyway, Christine said. I can't get him to wake up. I have plenty at the Laster place, I said. It'll be close to an hour before we get there, but I've never seen anyone turn that quickly. If he dies, it's all your fault, Christine said to Grant. Christine, don't, Sarah said. I'm sorry, Grant said. I would never hurt either of you. You're a selfish child, Christine shot back. Enough, I said, giving Christine a sharp look in my mirror. Grant isn't any more to blame than Sarah or I. Those things that tried to eat Julio used to be people too. Should they be blamed? Or should we blame the people who gave them the disease? Shit happens. 
It happens every damn day, and the last thing we need is to be eaten up with guilt because of it. If he hadn't taken us with him, or not gone at all, then... Then you might be okay. Or you might not be, Sarah said. We don't know. Let's try to focus on waking Julio. Talk to him. I was quiet after that for several minutes, while Christine and Grant did their best to coax Julio back into consciousness. I was surprised with myself that I had taken up for Grant like that. I think it might have been less about him, however, and more about me. There had been numerous times when I had been responsible, directly or indirectly, for the death of another person. In the beginning, I had let the guilt of that affect me, but I didn't anymore. That was not to say that I was cold or indifferent to others. I just knew that for me to survive in this new world, I couldn't allow room for guilt. There were too many opportunities for it. For instance, when I thought back on losing Jen, I could easily see the mistakes I had made that led to it. Perhaps if I had not insisted that we help Brenda and Hunter get off the roof of the drugstore, Jen would never have been shot and would have been better able to defend herself. I could have played it from many angles and found others to which I could have pointed to for blame. The fact was, however, that I did not hurt her. Even though Brian had been the one that committed the act that took her life, I could not place the blame on him either. Canton B was the cause of all bad things in the world. Canton B was to blame. I think he's coming out of it, Grant said. Julio, Christine said. Julio, open up your eyes for me. I heard him moaning. It's okay, Christine said. You're safe. We're going someplace safe. They got me good, Julio said hoarsely. No big deal, bro. We're taking care of you. We just need to get some booze into you. Did you drag me out of there? Julio said. Man, that's three I owe you. There was a thick silence for a moment. Then, softly, Grant said, You don't owe me anything. Chapter 12 As we approached the entrance to the stables, we found that the group that had gathered there that morning had mostly dispersed. There were still five standing out in the road by the gate. Since we planned to stay put for several days, until the end of Christine's and Sarah's menstruation, I saw no need to be quiet. I put the van into park, and then Grant and I got out and shot the five creatures. Then we lifted the gate away so Christine could pull the van inside. She drove up to the house, while Grant and I tried to make sure the gate was secure and able to withstand the press of a crowd. "'Will your fences hold?' he asked, looking around at the property. "'The zombies have gotten in before,' I said, "'but I've reinforced them since then. "'They won't keep the living out, but they should hold up against the undead.' In case they don't, we should make sure we have extra supplies on the upper floors of the house and both barns. I hope Julio's bites don't get infected, Grant said. I could tell he was still bothered by Christine's accusation. I have some antibiotics left in the house, I said. I know antibiotics expire, so I don't know if they're still good. I only have enough left for one person for about a week. He nodded. Let's drive your van on up to the house, I said. We can leave your supplies in it. We climbed into the red van he had used to crash through my gate, and I had him park it just inside the barn with the office. Then we went to help Julio into the house. We'll put him in the downstairs bedroom for now, I said. There's an open bottle of whiskey in the kitchen. Get him started on that, and I'll go upstairs and get the main medical supplies. When I came down with Dr. Barr's old bag, Julio was sitting up in the bed in his boxers drinking from the bottle. He had bites all over his body, and many of them were bleeding through their bandages. Grant was kneeling next to the bed, examining the soft spot just below Julio's rib cage on his right side. When I got closer, I could see the wound. It was much worse than the others. There was a piece of flesh missing, about the size and shape of a chicken egg. 
Bro, this one is a bad one, Grant said. Even if we had sutures, I don't know if I could pull it together. There's just nothing there. They got me good, Julio said in a pained voice and took another drink. Has he lost much blood? I said. Not close enough to lose consciousness or go into shock, Grant said. I don't see how. Did you see the seat in the van? It was soaked, Christine said. She was picking up Julio's clothes from the floor. Grant, I said, do you want to take a look in here and see if there is anything you can use? Grant stood and reached for the bag with bloody hands. We'll need antibiotics, more bandages. Do you have any IV bags in there? I nodded, pulling the bag out of his reach. Yeah, and tubing, but your hands. Syringes? Yeah, some, I said. Wash your hands first, then take a look. There's a jug of water in the kitchen. Babe, Grant said, go heat some water on the stove. Get it good and hot. Sarah nodded and left the room. I was angry that she would just obey like that without correcting him for calling her babe, but that moment wasn't a tactful time to express my thoughts on the matter. Pull the stuff out so I can see it at least, Grant said to me. I pulled the items out and put them on the desk by the door. Do you know what you're doing? I asked him. Have you had experience with this? He shrugged. I've patched up some people, but nothing like this. I'm not a doctor, bro, but no one else in the house is either. Julio spoke up. Just do the best you can, and God will do the rest, man. Grant looked over his shoulder at Julio. Dude, you're a poet. Julio raised a fist, did his best to grin, and winked. Yeah, but I don't have any of the premixed fluid for the IV. Do you know how to mix it? Isn't it dangerous to mix it wrong? I've got some of my old textbooks in the van, he said. I don't know that I'll need the IVs. If Julio stays conscious, I can get fluids in him. It wouldn't be as effective, but... He shrugged. It was dubious. I'll go see if Sarah needs help, I said. I found Sarah sitting in one of the kitchen chairs holding a can of Budweiser and staring at a blue enamel stock pot that was on the stovetop. The flames from the gas range danced beneath the pot. It'll never boil if you keep watching it, I said. She gave me a patronizing smile that faded quickly. How do you feel? I asked, putting my hand on her shoulder. Can I get you some of the pain pills? I felt better, she said, putting her hand on mine. But I felt worse. We can save the painkillers for Julio. He's almost polished off that bottle, I replied. I don't think he feels a thing. Besides, I have first aid kits in every room in the house. I put some ibuprofen in all of them. There's plenty. She nodded. Sure, get me some. I opened the cabinet under the sink, then dug around in the first aid bag. I handed her two of the caplets, and she downed them with a swallow of warm beer. So, you're a beer drinker now, I said. Yeah, she said dryly. I'm a regular lush. I went over to the window and looked out toward the road. There was a lone zombie female stumbling around near the mailbox. Thanks for going, she said. I'm sorry for all the trouble with Grant. He's really nice, but sometimes he's impulsive and... We'll work things out, I said. I'll talk with him about the whole boyfriend-girlfriend thing, she said. It's just habit with him. It's more than habit, I said. I'll talk to him. I nodded and turned back to the window. Well... I expect the crowd to start showing up tonight or tomorrow, I said. We'll be under siege for several days. We'll all have plenty of time to talk until they leave. There'll be plenty of things to keep us busy, too. Maybe now that I have some extra hands, I can finally keep that garden clean. I'm amazed you've done as much as you have. Christine walked in with Julio's clothes. She stopped and looked back and forth between me and Sarah. Do you have somewhere I can pitch these? 
she said, holding out the clothes to me, but looking at Sarah. I have a burn barrel behind one of the barns, I said. Just throw them out the back door for now. Okay, she said. Sarah, Grant needs that water. Sarah nodded as if she was being awakened from a trance, stood, took another swallow of beer, and removed the pot from the stove with oven mitts. Turn the stove off for me, she said over her shoulder as the two of them went to the bedroom. I turned the knob to kill the gas. The big propane tank next to the house was getting low. I had been checking the gauge every week, and it had gotten down to ten percent the last time I'd looked. It wouldn't last much longer. All of the things that made life easy were slowly going away. I walked up to the doorway of the bedroom. Do you need anything? I asked. Do you need help, or would I be in the way? Probably in the way, Grant said as he wiped off his hands. Sarah can help me. You and Christine can wait outside. Why Sarah? Christine said. She doesn't know any more about first aid than I do. I'm staying in here with Julio. Grant sighed. Whatever. Sarah and I went outside. It was hot in the house, and I wanted to check the cistern and the perimeter fences. She was quiet and distant. You okay? I said, as we went out the back door. She nodded and picked up Julio's bloody clothes that were in a pile next to the back steps. No big deal. Want to talk about it? She shrugged. I'm going to put these in the burn barrel. I stopped at the cistern between the barns. I wanted to show her what I had set up. She and I had procured the tank from Founder's Farm and Hardware Store a few months before, and we'd had many discussions about different ways we could set it up. I lingered there until she came back from behind the barn. Is this the same tank? She said. Yeah, I grinned proudly. What do you think? I rigged up these gutters so that all the rain from the barn's roofs would empty into it. Nice. Yeah. I thought you were going to bury it, she said. How will you keep the water from freezing in the winter? Too much work for just me, I said. I tried to berm it on the north side, but I don't know if that will make any difference. Maybe now that all of you are here, we can bury one. Maybe an above-ground bury, pile dirt on it. We'll still have to use gravity to get the water out. I thought you were almost empty, she said. There's still a lot of water in here. It's almost full. That's from the rain last night, I said. These roofs will catch something like half a gallon per square foot for every inch of rain that falls. Together, the two roofs are over 3,000 square feet, so around 1,500 gallons per inch of rain. I had no idea, she said, obviously impressed. Yeah, I said. Neither did I at first. I read about it. I just pour a jug or two of bleach into it every couple of weeks or so. But just to be safe, I boil the stuff I'm going to drink. Grant has a chart for how much bleach to add to the water for drinking, she said. So he says, I said. We were both quiet for a moment. Do you think Julio is in good hands? I said. She shrugged. As good as we have... Grant had some med school for his degree. Did he finish? I asked. No, she said. He was still in school. He was there on a basketball scholarship and was only going to do the chiropractor thing as a backup. I didn't reply to that because everything I could think to say would have sounded bad. Come on, I said finally. Let's go check the fences. We walked the perimeter of the property to make sure the fences were secure. When we returned to the house half an hour later, Julio was dead. Chapter 13 The four of us stood around the bed, looking down at Julio's lifeless body. Christine sobbed softly, both hands over her mouth. There was a heavy tension in the room. No one spoke. It felt like if a single word were spoken, it would be the spark that would ignite an explosion of emotion. I finally broke the silence with a whisper. 
We need to get him out of the house. Sarah and Grant looked at me, then at Christine. I expected her to erupt, but she was surprisingly calm. We'll bury him, she said. He was Catholic. He would want a Christian burial. He'll turn, I said. You know that. She glowered at me. He's stronger than that. He's stronger than you. Sarah went over to her and put her arm around her. He'll turn, I said, pulling my nine millimeter. We need to get him out of the house and make sure the brain is destroyed. Christine pulled a snub-nosed revolver and pointed it at me. Fuck you, she said. We're burying him. Sarah gently pushed Christine's arm down so that the gun was pointed at the floor. We don't have time for a funeral, I replied. He'll turn soon. We need to get him on the other side of the fence before that happens. He drank all that whiskey, Christine said. I don't know if that even matters once a person is gone, I replied. We need to take precautions. I'll do it, Grant said softly. I'll bury him. He stepped forward and wrapped the bed's quilt over Julio's body. Grab the quilt by his feet, he said to me. Help me carry him out. The two of us lifted the wrapped corpse off the bed as if we were carrying a rolled carpet. Christine stayed in the bedroom, but Sarah walked ahead of us and held the back door open. Tell Christine we'll let her know when we're ready, Grant said to Sarah. Once we were outside, Sarah went back to be with Christine. What happened? I said. I don't know, Grant replied. One minute he was talking to me, and then it was like he went to sleep. I couldn't get him to come out of it. Christine hates me. She's upset, I said. It wasn't your fault. You did what you could. He didn't say anything to that. He just swallowed hard, trying to hold back tears. Let's put him down, I said. I need to rest. We set the body down in the driveway between the house and barns. Do you have a shovel? He asked, wiping the sweat from his forehead. There are several in the front stall and the barn on the left, I said. He walked away. I turned and looked out toward the road. There were four zombies out by the gate. They were arriving. There were probably others gathering at different spots around the perimeter fence. We weren't going to be able to dig a hole on the outside of the fence without getting bothered. When Grant returned with two spades, I pointed to the road. We can't bury him on the property, I said, and it isn't safe to be on the other side of the fence right now. Why can't we bury him here? What if he turns, I said. He'll be buried. Yeah, but, dude, he's not going to dig himself out. You don't know that, I said. We need to shoot him or burn him before. Grant shook his head. Christine would freak. It's my fault he died, and I'm not going to desecrate his body. We can't make exceptions for our friends. He drank enough liquor to kill the virus. I sighed. Give me a shovel. Let's go dig a hole. Even with the rain from the night before, the heavy clay soil was still very hard once we dug down farther than a foot. We dug in silence near the back pasture, but still in the yard. Grant was afraid the horse would step in the disturbed soil and break a leg, so we stayed out of the pasture. It took every bit of an hour to dig a hole that was waist-deep and big enough to accommodate the body. We were both dripping wet from sweat and streaked with dirt and mud. I sat on the edge of the grave to rest. It's not deep enough, I said, but to get deeper, we'd need a backhoe. Do you have any lime, he said, that will help with the smell. I have a bag of lime in the barn, but I want to save it for the garden, I said. The whole world smells like a dead body anyway. I just want to be sure he's deep enough that he can't get out. The horse that was left on the property wandered in and came within a hundred feet from us. It stopped grazing and stared at us, ears perked. Grant whistled for it, but the horse kept its distance. This is deep enough, 
Grant said, turning his attention back to the grave. Let's go ahead and lower him into the hole so Christine doesn't have to see. Even though I'd seen the deaths of hundreds of people the past few months, some of them friends, Julio's funeral was the first I had attended since before Canton B. I didn't know Julio, but I listened to the kind words spoken by Sarah, Grant, and Christine over his grave, and got to know him a little through their descriptions. Of course, the things they had to say were skewed by grief. Even bad men, when eulogized by their friends, are portrayed as saints. The especially bad ones might be described as less than perfect, but that's about as close as they are willing to come to the truth. Any possible exaggerations and omissions concerning Julio's life didn't matter to me. Honestly, I didn't care at all. I was apathetic. I'd experienced the deaths of too many people I had loved for me to give a damn about the life of someone I didn't know. Christine spoke last. She described Julio's acts of heroism during the past few weeks. She talked about how he was tough with a tender side. She said she had loved him, and maybe she had. When she was finished talking, she knelt, scooped up a handful of dirt, and tossed it into the shallow grave onto the blood-stained quilt. Then she and Sarah walked back to the house. I sighed, knowing my tired body would regret the thing I was about to offer, but feeling like it was the right thing to do. You can go on with them, I said to Grant. I'll fill in the grave. I know he was your friend, so... Thanks, bro, but I need to do this. I nodded and picked up my spade. I had so many reasons to dislike Grant, some of them justified and some of them invented and nurtured by me. I had always had some contempt for the jock-slash-frat-boy-slash-dude-bro types, but this jackass was so damned likable. If he had not had a physical relationship with Sarah, I might have made an exception in these desperate times and been his friend. As it was, my jealousy just wouldn't allow it. I was already starting to tolerate him way too much, and I just wasn't comfortable with that. We all took turns in the little RV shower that afternoon. Christine didn't feel like eating or even being around anyone, so she carried a bottle upstairs to Sarah's bedroom and stayed. Sarah, Grant, and I had a quiet and tense dinner of salad and fried spam and squash in the kitchen, while an army of snarling zombies gathered around the property outside. The noise of their lowing could be easily heard in the house. Sarah picked at her food and was visibly startled when a particularly loud or shrill howl would rise above the other noise. Finally, she put her fork next to her plate, downed her glass of wine, and stood. I'm going to go check on Christine, she said. You two can have my food. I'm not hungry. You okay, babe? Grant said. She paused. I thought she would say something, but instead, she just left the room. Grant stared at his plate. I think she's going to get away from us, he said. Yeah, I said, taking a big gulp of wine. There are things to talk about, but it isn't a good time. I can't believe Julio is gone. I really thought he would make it. He looked like a strong guy, I said. Like a bull, he said. He rubbed his eyes and took a drink. I've lost a lot of friends. I've seen a lot of them turn to goons. It almost doesn't hurt anymore. Is that wrong? Is something wrong with me? I shook my head. I don't know. If there is, then there's something wrong with me, too. I mean, Julio was my friend, but I haven't known him for very long. I know he's gone, and I kind of feel sad about that, but I don't know. I don't think I feel sad enough. If we felt sad about everybody, we wouldn't be able to function. It's all too much. He nodded. What do you think will happen to us when the goons all die off? Do you think it'll all come crashing in on us, all that sadness? I hope not. We were both quiet for a while. Do you want her food? He said. I shook my head. Nah, you can have it. 
He raked Sarah's plate into his and picked up a piece of sliced spam. The greasy rectangle fell limply across his knuckles. Isn't there any wild game left here? He said. I shrugged. Like what? Like anything. Deer, squirrels, rabbits. Kentucky has wild turkeys, doesn't it? I guess they're out there, I said. I see squirrels sometimes. Why don't you hunt some? Save this canned stuff as a last resort. I shrugged again. I don't like to hunt. I went with my dad when I was a kid, but I don't like killing. We're killing all the time, he said. You're not a vegetarian, right? No, but I don't like killing animals. I would probably be a vegetarian if I ran out of spam. Yeah, but animals have to die for you to eat meat. Somebody has to kill them. I don't want to be the one to do it. He grinned and took a bite. Don't sweat it, bro. I know how you feel. You might be a vegetarian anyway. I'm not convinced this stuff is really meat. Do you think I'm a hypocrite? I said. You're a modern man, same as me. We get our meat from the store, all neat and clean and shrink-wrapped. He sighed. We used to, anyway. Do you hunt? Not before, but I started since the sea bees and goons came and all the packaged meat went bad. I have to keep my strength up if I'm going to survive this. I try to get as much as I can from fishing. I'm an animal lover for the most part. I was going to be a chiropractor, you know. We're supposed to be into all that holistic and hippie stuff. Sarah told me the chiropractor thing was just a backup in case the MBA didn't want you. He laughed out loud. It had been a long time since I had heard laughter like that. She said that? More or less, I replied, as I picked up the wine bottle and topped off his glass. If we could find some more chickens, we could forget meat altogether and just eat eggs. I might be willing to go along with that, but I haven't seen any chickens in weeks, and if I had, I would have eaten them. Just being real. It's been a long time since I had fried chicken, and that was my favorite. I have a couple of chickens, I said. They give me an egg or two a day, so leave them alone. He raised his hand. No prob, but listen, I've been thinking about that goat we saw this morning, and... No. Why not? It's a billy. I could slaughter it, and you wouldn't even have to... No, I don't care. If I find a female, I'm going to need him to make more goats. After that, once I have a herd, you can kill one. If you're still around, that is. I'm with Sarah. If she stays in Kentucky, then I stay in Kentucky. I'd follow her anywhere. I shook my head and poured myself some more wine. I started to say something, but decided to let it go. I wasn't going to be the one to convince him that his relationship with Sarah was over. The convincing had to come from her. Grant and I could argue and fight about it, but that wasn't going to change anything. I think Grant knew that too, but he couldn't resist the occasional jab or assertion. Despite his posturing, or because of it, I still thought he was a man-boy. Chapter 14 By dusk, the Laster farm was surrounded. Even though I had expected it, and even though the creatures were always around, it had been many weeks since I had been cut off like that, and I didn't like it. We weren't confined to the house, we had several acres, but knowing we didn't have an escape route made me feel a little claustrophobic. This happened to us a few times down in Biloxi, Grant said, as the two of us stood out on the porch. It's no big deal, as long as they can't get in and the supplies last. It might be a good idea if you left, I said. You could come back and lure them away in a few days. Why me? I can't do it. I said, I have to take care of things around here. Nice try, bro, but it isn't necessary. They'll leave. They always did for us. You didn't have to lure them away? We did the first time, but after that, we found that if we just stayed inside for a couple of days and didn't make too much noise, they would go away on their own, once the woman went off her period. If you think about it, this would be a great opportunity. For what? They're here anyway. He said, If you've got the ammo, honey, I've got the time. 
What? Dude, Willie Nelson. I know the song, I said. What are you talking about? They're coming in anyway, so let's shoot as many as we can for the next few days. It's not like we have to worry about noise right now. What would we do with the bodies? He scratched the stubble on his jaw and shrugged. Do you know some place we can find a dozer? How would we get to it? Oh, he said, his face taking on a ponderous expression that actually made him look more simian than intellectual. I'll go out in a few days and get one after this is all over. We'll doze them in a pile and torch them. We might have to stay somewhere else a few days to wait for the smoke and smell to dissipate. Shoot all of them you want, I said, but not the ones in the road. Let them clear out on their own. I'm going to want to drive out of here in a few days, and I don't want the road clogged with dead bodies. Do you have a generator? We could use one for a couple of days. No, I said. I was going to bring one out here, but I never got around to it. So you go to bed when it gets dark? Yeah. Well, I guess it's almost bedtime then. Sarah will probably stay with Christine tonight. Am I going to bunk with you? Hell no, I said. Dude, the bedroom downstairs is where Julio died. You wouldn't make me stay in there, would you? Besides, the mattress is all bloody. You can sleep on the couch, or we can bring the mattress in from the RV. I forgot about the RV, he said. I'll just sleep in there. Do me a favor and tell Sarah where she can find me if she needs me. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. She'll ask, bro, he said over his shoulder as he walked down the porch toward the RV. She'll be mad if you don't tell her. I'm just trying to save you some grief. He was getting comfortable around me and was taking liberties. It was all jokes and playful needling on his part, but I knew he was feeling me out. He was testing me to see if I was the man Sarah had said I was. I felt flattered that Sarah thought so highly of me, but I doubted I was half that man. Grant's escalating confidence troubled me a little, but it also gave me a grin. He was a young buck rattling his antlers. Even though I knew there could be trouble, I could tell that behind the insecurities and occasional bravado, he was a good guy. He and I might exchange harsh words and maybe even blows, but at the end of the day, we'd be able to put that conflict aside for a while and have a drink together. It was the dude bro way. When I woke up the next morning, my bed sheets were damp. The warm, humid air from my open bedroom window made me feel clammy. I was alone in bed. Sarah had not joined me during the night. I fretted for a moment that she had gone out to the RV to be with Grant, but then I forced myself to reject the thought. I got up, put on my boots, and strapped on my pistol. I always slept in my jeans and kept my boots and gun on the floor beside my bed. Boots, gun, and jeans, in that order, were the most important things to have for a quick getaway from zombies. They weren't the most important things for general survival, but they were imperative for an effective escape, at least in the short term. Boots are the most important, with the guns and jeans coming in a distant second. I had to protect my feet. If I hurt my feet, I couldn't run. If I can't run, I die. I felt somewhat safe in the Laster house, so I allowed myself the pleasure of sleeping without them on. But when I spend the night in less secure places, I don't dare take them off. The sun was just coming up. I put on a shirt and stepped out into the hallway. I walked down to the other bedroom and gently pushed the door open. There was one person in the bed, but there wasn't enough light to see who it was. I pulled the door shut and went downstairs. I found Christine sitting on the couch, her feet pulled up beneath her staring out the front window. The crowd outside on the road was huge. She knew I had entered the room, but she didn't acknowledge my presence. I wasn't sure what I should say to her. I knew she was grieving over Julio, and I knew she probably blamed me a little for his death. I thought I should say something, because not speaking would have been perceived as cold rather than respectful. I sat on the opposite end of the couch, her eyes left the window and found the floor, but still she ignored me. 
Can I get you anything? I said softly. Would you like some coffee or tea? She shook her head. I could make you some breakfast. Not hungry, she whispered. Were you able to sleep? I just want to be left alone. I stood and went toward the kitchen. I got scared and left him, she said as I walked away. I stopped and turned around. Finally, she looked up at me. She sniffed and wiped her nose with a tissue. Her eyes and nose were red. Her two-toned hair was a mess. You didn't do anything wrong, I offered. You weren't there, she said. I saw them all over him, but I didn't help him. I just ran. They were after you too, I said. I saw that. There was nothing you could do. If you would have stopped, then you might have died too. I could have tried to... No, I said. You couldn't have done anything. You weren't there. I returned to the couch and sat next to her. I stared out the front window at the horde of moaning, slobbering zombies. I didn't look at Christine, but I could feel her eyes on me. Did Sarah tell you about the other people we were with? I asked. She told me about her teacher and the man from the city council. And Bruce, of course. Bruce? I looked over at her. Who's that? Do you mean Brian? Oh, Christine shrugged. Maybe I'm thinking about something else. Did she tell you about Jen? Yeah. Did she tell you how we lost her? She nodded. I cared about Jen a lot, I said, looking out the window again. I blamed myself when she died. I could think of so many mistakes I made that had a part in leading up to her death. I could think of so many things I could have done to help her. I beat myself up over it. I kept replaying that shit in my head. In a way, it made me feel better because I felt like I needed to be punished. Eventually, though, I realized that none of that would bring her back. I didn't kill her. I wasn't responsible for what happened to her. Canton B killed her. Canton B killed Julio. I know you are angry at all of us and yourself. You have to have good memories about him and let go of the anger and the guilt. I looked over at her, and she was staring at me with a doubtful expression. What? I said. I don't understand why Sarah would leave Grant and go back to you. Oh, I said, and stood up, suddenly not interested in talking anymore. No offense, she said. It's just that you are obviously hung up on this gen chick. Grant has his problems, but at least he's all about Sarah. I'm over Jen, I said. I was just giving you an example and trying to help you get past this. I love Sarah. You had better, she said coldly. Otherwise, Julio died for nothing. You do whatever you need to do, I said. But I refuse to feel guilty for his death. I refuse to allow you to lay that blame on Sarah either. Or Grant. I left the room before she could say anything more. I hated starting my day in a bad mood. I went in the kitchen and got a pot of water started warming on the stove, and I went outside to take a leak. I propped the back door open with a brick with the hope that it would cool the house down. I noticed Grant was coming out of one of the barns. "'What's up?' I yelled to him. "'Sup with you!' he called back, giving me a big wave. "'No,' I said. What do you need? We walked to meet each other. Just looking around, he replied. I thought I might split some wood, earn my keep, and give me a workout at the same time. Can't. We left the axe and maul in the woods yesterday, remember? You don't have spares? You have like ten more shovels in there. I collected extra shovels, I said dismissively. Need any holes, Doug? No, I said but feel free to grab a hoe and work on the garden. Will do, he grinned. What are you so happy about? I said with suspicion. No, bro, the question should be, why are you not happy? Did you have to sleep alone last night? Shut up, I said.
I have to take a piss. There's a hoe leaning on the fence by the garden. Since I had company, and since I was surrounded by hundreds, possibly thousands of zombies, I went into a stall in one of the barns to relieve myself. I had always had a shy bladder. I can't go if I know someone is watching me. It doesn't matter whether those eyes are living or undead. When I came back outside, I did a quick check of the cistern, then looked around to see that the perimeter fences looked okay. I didn't take the time to walk them and check every section, but I would do that after breakfast. Thinking about breakfast made me remember my water on the stove, and I decided to go back into the house. Then I stopped. There was a dirty quilt in the backyard. I went over by the fence for the back pasture and looked at Julio's grave. The ground was sunken in, and there were narrow ruts on the edge of one side. They were like claw marks. There was a bare human footprint in the disturbed soil. Chapter 15 I ran to the quilt and picked it up. Grant! He came around the house, carrying a hoe, and saw me holding the quilt. His mouth opened, then closed again. He dropped the hoe, looked over his shoulder, and then spun around. Do you see him? He said, pulling his pistol. Where is he? This is exactly what I was talking about, I said. It's shit like this that's going to get us killed. We can't make exceptions for anybody. He'll be around the house, Grant said, ignoring me. Or down by the road with the goons. I pulled my pistol. Or in the house. The door is propped open. I'll check inside. You go around front. I ran in through the back door and stopped. There were prints made by bare, dirty feet on the vinyl floor. Sarah! I yelled. I heard movement upstairs, so I went toward the staircase. Sarah! What? I heard Sarah say from behind me. Where are you? She came out of the kitchen. You left the stove on, she said. Did you see him? I asked. Grant? No. Julio. Her eyes widened, and she looked up at the ceiling. Is Christine upstairs? I said. She nodded. She's changing her clothes. Search the rest of the house, I said. I'm going up. Grant is out front. Yell if you need us. Christine screamed before I made it to the stairs. Sarah followed me, and I heard Grant come in through the front door. I got to the landing where the stairs made a right turn, and there was a gunshot. Sarah! Grant yelled. Christine screamed again. When I got to the top of the stairs... I saw Julio at the end of the hallway standing in the open door of the upstairs bedroom. He was covered in dirt and mud. When I looked down between his legs, I could just make out Christine on the bathroom floor. She had wedged herself between the toilet and the tub. Her gun went off again, and a squirt of yellowish goop came out of the top of Julio's head and speckled the ceiling. He stumbled backward and turned as if disoriented, there was a chunk of his chin missing where Christine's bullet had entered. Then his milky eyes fixed on me. He snarled and charged. I barely had time to bring my pistol up. I fired once and hit him in the gut. That knocked him off balance and he started falling. He turned sideways and hit the wall, knocking a hole in the drywall with his shoulder. His momentum kept him moving, however, and he plowed right into me. I landed on my back, and he fell on my legs just below my knees. I got this strong whiff of freshly dug dirt. Sarah stepped into view. For a moment, all I could see was her standing over me, straddling my head. Her pink gun went off. I tried to look down at Julio. Then Sarah went down into a squat, keeping her eyes ahead and on Julio. She fired again. Watch him, babe, Grant yelled. He's still moving. Christine screamed again. I tried to scoot back, but Julio was too heavy. Grant came into view over Sarah. Sarah went farther forward on my chest, and I couldn't see anything but the back pocket of her jeans. No, Sarah yelled. Stop him! There was a dull pinch in my right calf. Get off! Sarah yelled. Get off! Grab his hair, Grant said. Julio! 
Another gunshot rang out, and Julio's weight lifted off. Christine screamed from the bathroom. Sarah stood, stumbled a little, and leaned against the wall. She and Grant looked down at me, but neither spoke. I propped myself up on my elbows. Julio was down by my feet. His eyes and mouth were open. It looked like he was staring at my knee and surprised by what he saw. His brains were sprayed on the wall. I looked up again. Grant was putting his arm around Sarah's shoulders, and Sarah was letting him. Down the hallway, Christine, dressed only in black panties, was braced in the doorway. There was mud smeared on her cheek, right breast, and stomach. She had another tattoo of a woven design around her navel. Shit, I whispered, still stunned by what had just happened. He bit you, Sarah said, seeming to come to her senses. She pulled away from Grant and knelt beside me. He bit your leg. I looked at my leg and shook my head. I felt it, but I don't think it broke the skin. The bathroom door slammed, and Grant walked down to the end of the hallway. Christine, he said, are you okay? Sarah rolled up my pant leg. My leg is fine, I nodded. You go help her. My leg did hurt, and it would likely bruise, but it didn't slow me down. I was able to help Grant carry Julio's now lifeless corpse out to the grave. We had to dig it out again, but it was easier since the dirt was already loose. There was no ceremony the second time. We just lowered him into the hole and filled it in. When we were finished, I returned the shovels to the barn. It was still morning, but I was done. I just wanted to eat, have a drink, and go back to bed. I was able to help Grant carry Julio's now lifeless corpse out to the grave. We had to dig it out again, but it was easier since the dirt was already loose. There was no ceremony the second time. We just lowered him into the hole and filled it in. When we were finished, I returned the shovels to the barn. It was still morning, but I was done. I just wanted to eat, have a drink, and go back to bed. Unfortunately, there were things that needed to be done. During the next three days, I spent a lot of time in the garden. Being forced to stay on the property and trying to avoid Grant and Christine kept me out there and allowed me time to finally get on top of all of the weeding. Grant helped me some, but he was more interested in shooting zombies. I would have complained about him slacking, but I was glad to have him otherwise occupied and out of my hair. Christine kept to herself in the upstairs bedroom the whole day that Julio died, but came down the next couple of days and went out to vent her frustrations on the horde at the fence with a twelve-gauge. Even though she and Grant were doing the same thing, they did it away from each other, on opposite sides of the farm. Sarah helped me with the produce. The cucumbers and zucchini were coming in plenty by that time, and I brought in enough for her to can sixteen quarts of pickles. She'd had experience canning with her grandmother, and even though she kept saying it had been years since she'd done it, and even though she kept referring to the book, I thought she looked like a pro. Only two jars out of sixteen didn't seal. I counted that as a success. I can't guarantee they'll taste very good, she said, when I came in to see how she was doing. We didn't have some of the spices they called for. They smelled like pickles when you were cooking them, I said. I'm sure they'll be fine. The sound of gunfire from outside was steady, with brief interruptions when Christine or Grant had to reload. It had been like that for two days. We had the vinegar and dill, but the recipe called for dill heads, and all we had were the leaves. Also, I used wild garlic instead of real garlic, and we didn't have— They'll be preserved, won't they? I said. It'll be food to eat this winter. That's what I care about right now. If we can do it right so they taste good, even better, but if it comes down to starving or eating pickles that don't taste as good as store-bought, I don't think that's a hard decision to make. Besides, there will still be plenty of store-bought pickles for us to eat. These are just a backup. If you don't get it right this time, we'll just chalk it up to training for next year's harvest when getting it right will be more important. 
I was reading in the book that some food has to be processed in a pressure canner, she said. You have to do it right or it might get botulism. What if I do this wrong and we die from food poisoning? Did the pickles need that? No, but some other things do. What about berries? I asked. I was thinking you could make some jam or preserves next. No, she said. Fruit is okay. Tomatoes, pickles, anything that has a lot of acid in it we can process the way I did here. Anything else and you're going to have to find us a pressure canner. What does it look like? My mom had a pressure cooker, she said. I guess it would look like that, only bigger. The lid of the pot can be clamped or screwed down and there is a hole in the lid and a little thing you put on top of it. I don't know. It's been a while. When we're able to go out again, we'll look for one. I turned to go back outside. Christine is having a rough time, she said. I'm worried about her. We've all had a rough time, I said. She'll get over it. I don't mean to sound callous, but it's a fact. You know that. Yes, she said softly. I know. Was she really that close to Julio? Did they know each other from before? They've been a couple for about as long as Grant and I have. I mean, as long as Grant and I have known each other. I heard that, but I didn't say anything. Is he still trying to persuade you? I asked. I saw him come in earlier. I talked to him. I set him straight. All of this is a big adjustment for everyone. I sighed and rubbed my eyes, but I didn't know where to go with the conversation from there. Sarah was being vague, and I didn't want to have to pump her for information. I just didn't feel like going through the trouble right then. The gunfire from outside seemed louder in that moment. I looked around the kitchen. It was messier than I usually keep it, but it was being used more. We need to do something about the trash, I said, nodding to two full garbage bags in the corner. What have you been doing with it? I was putting it in that old silver car that's parked around back and hauling it to the dump every week, but the car is full right now. We can set it out the back door, she said. Animals will get to it. I'll find a place to put it in the meantime. I guess we're going to have a lot more trash now that your friends are living here. It won't be that bad, she said. We'll pick up after ourselves. I've got some extra squash seeds, I said, turning to leave again. I think I'll plant a few more. I'm worried about Christine, she said again. What do you want me to do, I said, frustrated. She doesn't like me. She probably blames me a little. Do you think she's going to hurt herself? Do you think she's going to hurt us? I don't know. She won't talk to me. People grieve in different ways, I said. Right now, she's out there shooting fish in a barrel. Maybe that's her way. Maybe she just needs to be alone and loud for a while. I don't know what she was like before. She hasn't been happy since I met her. Sarah shrugged. I don't think I've seen her really happy either. It's just that she's different now. I don't know what that means. I don't know how to help. Never mind, she said. If you tell me where the berries are, I'll go pick them. How's your back? Stiff. Sore. I'm taking the painkillers, so I'm good. You've been on your feet in front of the stove all day, I said. Why don't you go rest a while? I told you. I'm okay, she said. Then she got a strange look on her face, took a step toward me, and hunched so she could look out of the kitchen window that faced the road. I turned just in time to see an airplane come in low over the field and the road, and then disappear over the house. We both ran for the back door and made it to the yard as the shadow of the thing slid over the back pasture. Chapter 16 Wow, Sarah said. What do you think it is? Is it a drone? I didn't answer. I watched it bank to the left and go behind a line of trees. I could see Christine in the distance looking at the sky. The plane's shadow had gone right over her. Grant, however, was still shooting and hadn't heard it come over. Do you think it's the government? 
Do you think it's the military? No, I said. It was small and red. I don't think the government uses red planes. Maybe they use what they can get, she said. They can get anything. Christine was running toward us carrying the shotgun. Oh my God, she was yelling. Did you see it? Grant paused his shooting to reload, and I heard the airplane returning. Should we signal it? Christine said as she joined us. Why? I said. They already know we're here. If we signal them, they might think we need help, and we don't. But it's more people, she said. They know we're here, I repeated. If they want to introduce themselves, they know where to find us. The plane came in from the west and flew directly over Grant just above treetop level. He couldn't miss it that time. Did you see those things under the wings? I said. I think it was a crop duster. It didn't spray anything, Christine said. Grant ran across the pasture toward us. The plane made another pass from the east, higher this time. Then the sound of it waned until we could no longer hear it. Grant climbed the fence, ran past Julio's grave, and joined us in the backyard by the well house. What do you think? Grant asked me, breathing hard from the run. Could be bad. I agreed and nodded. Don't be so negative, Christine said. If there is someone around here that is a pilot, and then maybe they can fly us someplace where there aren't any goons. That thing could hold two people, Grant said. Four at most, including the pilot. I know, dumbass, Christine replied. In a different fucking plane. Stop, I said. Yes, that is a possibility, but I'm with Grant on this. I think we should be cautious. How did they even know to fly over here? Grant said. I mean, there are miles and miles, but they flew right over us. You and Christine have been shooting for two days. I'm sure someone heard it and flew around trying to find the source. The crowd around the property probably made it easy to spot from the air. So that means they're close, Christine said. Not necessarily, I replied. Now that there aren't any extra noises like cars and stuff, I would imagine the sound of your guns could have been heard two or three miles away. Maybe farther. Maybe even in the Clayfield city limits. How far is that? She asked. I shrugged. About six miles, I think. I've heard the city fireworks out this far. Those big fireworks are really loud, though, she said. Where's the airport? I pointed toward the north. The county airport is about four miles that way. Well, that will be the first place to check, she said. I wonder if it has anything to do with the heads or the yellow cars, I said. What? Grant asked. I told them about my findings the past several days. Whoa, babe, you love yellow cars. Bingo, right? What are you talking about, I said. Sarah has this game she plays where she says bingo when she sees a yellow car, Grant replied. I didn't know that, I said. It's a thing I used to do when I was a kid, she said. It's no big deal. I thought it was a big deal. It seemed like an odd coincidence. Plus, Grant knew something about her that I didn't know. He probably knew a lot more about her that I didn't know, and that bothered me. Sounds like there's a nut in town that likes to chop off goons' heads and knows how to fly a plane, Christine said. I can't wait to meet them. Tell me about the yellow cars, I said to Sarah. I told you it's nothing. It's just a little thing I used to do for fun, she said. Grant and I would do it when we'd go out with our group sometimes. You don't think it's strange? Could it be someone else from your group, I asked. It was just the four of us that came here, Grant said. The rest wouldn't leave Mississippi. That's what Sarah said, but... It's no big deal, okay? Sarah said. I'm going inside. Are any of you hungry? I could eat, Grant nodded. I'm thinking a pepperoni and mushroom hand-tossed. Good luck with that, Sarah said. I'll open a couple of cans of soup, and we can all share. If you want a salad, you'll need to pick it yourself.
We all went inside and washed up. Over the meal, Grant and Christine talked about the plane and the possibility of traveling by air to some place far away. Sarah sipped her soup quietly. I find it odd that the plane and the heads and the yellow cars all happened so close to your arrival in Kentucky, I said. There has been much of anything going on here for a long time. Well, we didn't do it, Christine said. Is that what you're saying? Are you accusing us? No, I said. It isn't an accusation, just an observation. Anyway... What's so wrong with beheading goons or collecting yellow cars? Grant said. Nothing, I replied. I looked at Sarah, but she didn't look up from her bowl. I have some more seeds left, I said, changing the subject. I've been saving them so I can do a second planting. I was thinking about starting on that today or tomorrow. I'd be happy to show you how if you've never planted a garden before. What's there to know? Christine said. You stick the seeds in the ground and they grow. Yeah, bro. Basic stuff. I think it's Bruce, Sarah said. Everyone stopped what they were doing and looked at her. Who's Bruce? Grant and I said in unison. A guy I met in Tennessee a few weeks ago. He had a sword and I've seen him cut off heads. I glanced over at Grant and his face mirrored my own confusion. Like a ninja sword, Sarah added, as if that explained everything. I looked at her again, then at Christine. Christine had returned to her meal. She knew exactly what Sarah was talking about, but was feigning ignorance. Bruce, Grant said again. Tell them his whole name, Sarah, Christine said. It's Bruce Lee. Christine snickered, but quickly stifled it. Are you shitting me? Grant said. Babe, I... He stopped in mid-sentence and his brow furrowed. Then he looked at me. Dude, Bruce Lee? I don't understand, I said. Sarah rolled her eyes and exhaled loudly like a teenage girl trying to explain something to her parents. Judy and I were driving down to the Gulf. We met this guy north of Memphis. He was really sweet at first. He was kind of geeky and boring. He shared some food with us. He told us he was with a group of men that were headed west, but I never saw them. He drove down with us, even though he had been going the other way. It took us three or four days because a lot of the roads were jammed with cars, and we had to switch cars and backtrack. We got separated from him in Hattiesburg when we went into a Walmart there. I thought he might have been killed or maybe rejoined his original group. But his name, babe, Grant said. Come on. I mean, for real? That's his name, Sarah said. I saw his driver's license. He was all into martial arts, but I don't know if he was really trained or just pretending. I don't know if his parents gave him that name or if he changed it to that because he liked martial arts and comic books, so... Why would he be here? I said, getting impatient. I didn't give a damn about his name. I told him I was from Clayfield. He was clingy. He was just this geeky guy. He got me that leather suit. He wanted me to wear it for him. He said I would look like Batwoman. It was a creepy fantasy or something. Wait, what? I said. But you wore the suit. I saw you in it. We all saw you in it. You told me that suit... He sounds like a total douchebag stalker, Grant interrupted and reached across the table, taking Sarah's hand. Babe, did you do it with him? I won't be mad. I just want the truth. Sarah pushed his hand away. Stop it, Grant. This is serious. Suddenly, I wanted to know the answer to that question, too. Probably more than Grant. For all he knew, you were going to Biloxi. Why would he come here? What about the others he was with? Remember Corndog? Remember he was with some bad men and they weren't too far away? I don't know, she said. But the yellow cars and the heads. I think he might be trying to let me know he's around. 
We were all quiet for a few seconds. The only sound was Christine slurping her soup. Then Grant spoke up. So what? So there's a guy in town that has a thing for Sarah, who doesn't have a thing for her, right? I say we forget him. I would agree, I said, but he's been careless. He's been leaving the doors open on houses. Those houses are our main source of supplies until they run out. I think he burned down the hardware store, too. He can't be doing that. What if he brings others here that are worse than him? I can't allow it. This is where I live. As soon as the goons leave, we'll find him and you can kick his ass, Grant said. Leave him alone, Sarah said. He's unstable, I think. Grant stared at her blankly. You did it with him, didn't you? Stop it, Grant, Sarah said. Grant grinned as if it had suddenly turned into a game. You did. You totally did it with him. Then he looked at me. Bro, she did it. She shut up, I said. It was before she met you, so why should you care? True, he said. But you should care. I said, shut up. Sarah got up and left the table. I watched her leave the room, but didn't get up to chase her. Christine got up and wiped her mouth on a napkin. I've got some goons to kill, boys, she said. Good luck sorting out Sarah's trail of broken hearts. She walked over to the counter and grabbed a can of warm beer. Don't be concerned about any of my ex-boyfriends showing up. All the good ones are dead. I'm pretty sure the rest are goons. Fuckers. We'll all be goons eventually. She left the room, and I heard the back door open, then slam shut. Bro, Sarah did the dirty with Bruce Lee. Shut up, I said. Sarah spent the rest of the day outside picking berries and wild greens. The only interaction I had with her was to show her where to find the plants. She didn't want to talk. She seemed angry or embarrassed. I stayed in the garden, but I was distracted by my thoughts, so I didn't get a lot of work done. The constant gunfire didn't help either. I had decided that I would put a stop to the shooting after that day. I wanted some quiet and I knew both women would be winding down their cycles soon. Hopefully, the zombies would lose interest in a few days and leave. Chapter 17 The next morning, after breakfast, I was sitting alone at the kitchen table looking over my to-do list for the day. I hadn't slept well the night before. It bothered me that in the space of a couple of months, Sarah had already been with two other men. I wondered if there were others that I would find out about later. If it had been Jen, it might have come as less of a surprise, but this was Sarah. I didn't expect her to be like that. I kept trying to convince myself that it didn't matter. She had thought I was dead. She had been upset, and she was young. I shouldn't judge her too harshly. Christine and Sarah came in the back door carrying buckets and heading toward the stairs. What's going on? I said. Just flushing the toilet upstairs, Sarah said. Is that water? Yeah, Christine said. We have to have water to flush, so? Where'd you get it? I asked. You didn't get it from the cistern, did you? Sarah set her bucket on the floor. Yeah, why? Well... I'd prefer you leave the cistern water for drinking and washing. I always use the pond water for flushing. But the pond is way out in the field, Christine said. We'd have to climb the fence and everything. I know, I said. That's why I made the composting toilet. I even moved it out to the barn so you could have privacy. You can't seriously expect us to use that thing, Christine said. Then Grant came in carrying another bucket. Some water sloshed out when he stopped next to Sarah. What's going on? he said. Do you need me to carry your bucket for you? No, Christine said. He doesn't want us to use the cistern water for the toilets. Grant turned and looked at me. But they need to be flushed. Use the pond water for the house toilets or use the composting toilet in the barn, I said flatly. 
We're going to need the clean water for other things. This water isn't really that clean, Christine said. The pond is too far, and I'm not shitting in a bucket. I had endured Christine's surliness for days because I knew she was hurting over Julio, but I was ready for it to end. I stood abruptly, my chair scraping the floor. I had their attention. We're not voting here, I said in an even tone. You are guests. I'll let you eat my food, use my ammunition, and drink my booze. You don't pick up after yourselves, there's trash everywhere, and you're making noise all day. Going out to the pond for water isn't asking too much. Guests, Sarah said. Really? You almost sound like my dad. Are you going to give us the as long as you're under my roof speech? I think he just did, Christine said. I wonder who he was calling trash. You know, this is why I don't like living with old people. I chuckled. <laughs> I'm hardly old. You kind of are, bro. I looked at Sarah for support, but the anger in her eyes was obvious. She had no right to be angry with me. She was the one in the wrong. I suppose I would look old to a bunch of immature kids barely out of high school. Then I looked Sarah in the eyes. I'll stop sounding like your dad as soon as you start acting like a grown-up. The moment the words came out, I knew they were a mistake, but I couldn't apologize or I would have looked weak. Sarah was stunned. Christine looked over at Sarah. What an asshole, right? Then she turned to me. Fuck you. I'm tired of living like this. I'm going up to flush the toilet. I use the RV toilet all the time, Grant said. You two can use it if you want. The waste tank on the RV will fill up, I said. It's no different than using the toilet in the barn. I'm trying to keep us alive. What if we run out of water? Yeah, Sarah said, coolly. We get it. We might be kids, but we aren't idiots. I sighed and shook my head. Please don't act this way. We only have so much clean water. I don't want... Shh, Grant said. Listen, I think the plane is back. We all got quiet and looked up at the ceiling. I heard it. Christine put her bucket on the floor and pushed past Grant to go out the back door. Grant followed her, Sarah after Grant, and I went out last. It came in right over the treetops like it had the day before, except it came from the north this time. When it got over the back pasture, something small, white, and squarish tumbled from it to the ground. Did you see that? Grant said. He dropped something. The aircraft flew over us and the house with a roar, and then continued south. Somebody go pick it up, Sarah said. Christine laughed. I don't think so. It's probably a bomb or a body part in a box. He's not like that. Sarah said. So you think it is this Bruce guy? I asked. Sarah shrugged. Who else could it be? He's coming back. It roared over again, over the pasture, over the woods, and was gone. We waited to see if it would return, but it did not. I started walking toward the fence. What are you doing? Grant said. I'm going to see what he dropped. Don't you want to wait for it to do something? I stopped and gave him a quizzical look. Like what? I don't know. Like detonate or something? Don't you have a toilet to flush? I asked. Then I turned my back on the three of them, grinned, and started walking again. It wasn't as easy to find as I thought it would be. I walked around in circles in the high grass several times before I finally saw it. It was a white box, a little larger than a brick. There was no writing on the outside, just a UPS shipping label and a big barcode. I picked it up. The address on the label was to a Rebecca Tanner of Clayfield from Amazon.com. What did you order, Rebecca? I said, and shook the box. I looked over to the others. They were probably waiting to see if I would be blown up. 
They were still standing in the backyard, next to the well house, watching me. The well. I should have had a generator on the property so we could have pumped the cistern full of clean well water during this time. We could have also had working toilets. Then we would not have had that argument earlier. Maybe we could have watched some movies, too. That would have improved everyone's mood. I was feeling bad about what I had said to Sarah, but I didn't know how to fix it. I suppose I was old. When I thought back to when I had been in my early twenties, a guy my age would have seemed old. A guy my age would have had kids. Possibly kids not much younger than they. Damn it, I said. I pulled out my pocket knife and used it to cut the tape on the box. There was a part of me that fully expected to find a severed finger or penis inside on a bed of cotton. Instead, I found a hotel room Gideon Bible and a two-way radio wrapped in months-old newspapers with a note. The note said, Stop shooting. You can't kill them all. The noise will keep the sick people around. Be quiet and I will draw them away with another noise. Might take some time. Just be quiet and go inside. You can talk to me on Channel 1 if I'm in range. I will let you know when. Don't waste the battery. Listen to your radio in your car or house. 94.1 FM. Dan. Who the hell is Dan? I said to myself. I looked back at the others and they continued to stare at me. I grinned again. Then I screamed like I was dying and danced around. The three of them screamed with me, and Sarah ran toward the fence. I fell to the ground, laughing. Sarah ran upon me and stopped when she found me unharmed. Jerk, she yelled. Come down here, I said. She scowled down at me, then took a step forward and stopped. Oh, come on, I said. Stop being mad at me. She shook her head and looked at the sky. I could tell she was fighting a smile. Come on, I said. I have a message from our special red airplane. What does it say? Is it Bruce? Sorry, I said, but I'm going to need a kiss for that information. She dropped to her knees, bent over me, and kissed me deeply. I felt like I went someplace else. I felt like forever happened. Nice, I whispered when she pulled away. What does the message say? I love you, I said. It does not. No, I said, with eyes closed, still trying to return to myself. I love you. I'm sorry for what I said. You are not a child. You are more woman than any woman I've ever known. She leaned in close to me and said, And you are more of a man than I've ever known. All the rest are just boys. Now tell me what it says. I took another deep breath and sat up. Somehow, the world seemed brighter. I looked over at her. What does the message say? She said again. I offered her the box and she took it. She took out the Bible and the handheld radio. Then she read the note. 94.1 FM? That's 94 smooth. Who's Dan? Chapter 18 The four of us went to the RV. Grant, Christine, and I got as comfortable as we could on the tiny pull-out furniture in the living room. Sarah cranked the vehicle, turned on the air conditioning, and tuned the radio. Don't you remember? The announcer would say, Groovin' with 94 Smooth, she said, deepening her voice. I listened to the oldies station, I said, 8.50 a.m., A.M., Grant said, making a voice. Dude. The station gave the museum free ad spots, so I promised them I'd leave it on at work, I said with a shrug. I liked it. Then a voice came through the radio and silenced us. It was not the voice of a professional announcer. It was nasally, with a heavy western Kentucky accent, and the cadence was annoying. Five o'clock in the afternoon. This is a recording. I'm one of a group of survivors living in Clayfield, Kentucky. We make 
Live broadcasts on this station most days at five o'clock in the afternoon. This is a recording. I'm one of a group of survivors. Sarah turned the radio off and looked back at us. What time is it now? Christine asked. Just after eight, I said. The ninety-four smooth station isn't far from the Grace County Airport, Sarah said. Let's turn on the walkie-talkie and talk to him. Christine said. No, I said, putting my hand on the radio that was clipped to my belt. We'll listen to the broadcast this afternoon first. Maybe he'll tell us the right time. I wouldn't want to drain the batteries for nothing. He must think we're morons to send that note to us, Grant said. Everything he said in there was stuff people had to learn the first week. He's the moron for not realizing how obvious he was being, Christine said. Yeah. I said, I'm glad there are more survivors, and I'm glad they have a pilot. But it's not like we need to be rescued. They probably need us more than we need them. I've been hoping to secure a block or two in Clayfield. Maybe now that all of you are here, and if this group will help, we can do that. So it's we now, Christine said. Are you afraid you're going to lose Sarah to the Red Baron or something? More like redneck baron, Grant said with a snort. I'm sorry, I said. I shouldn't have said what I said earlier, but you need to understand that we aren't living in a compound with electricity and running water and movie night. We have to ration and we have to conserve. I understand completely, Christine shot back. I think I'd rather take my chances with Danny Boy, or be alone than stay here with you. I'm sorry you feel that way. I said, "Sarah, you've been a good friend." Christine continued, "But coming here was a bonehead move. I should have never listened to you." "I'm sorry," Sarah said. "It is better here. You just..." "Julio is dead," Christine spat. "He turned into a goon, a goon, Sarah, and I had to fucking see you put him down." She stormed out of the RV, slamming the door so hard that it bounced away without closing. Grant, Sarah, and I sat quietly for a moment, staring at the floor. This is my fault, Grant said. I got Julio killed. No, I said. Christine will get past this in time. We all go through this blame game. She'll leave, Sarah said. I know her well enough to know that. She'll leave and move in with this other group. Either that, or she'll head back to Biloxi. What about you? I asked Sarah. Grant looked at me with a surprised expression, then looked at Sarah. I'm with you, she replied, keeping her eyes on me and ignoring Grant's stare. I've told you that a thousand times. I looked over at Grant. I didn't verbalize the question again, but I was asking it, and he saw that. I'm with Sarah, bro. I've told you that a thousand times. There are other women out there," Sarah said, standing up. <laughs> "Like who? Like Christine? Christine doesn't like me. She likes you more than she likes me." I said. "There aren't other women, babe," Grant said. "There's you and Christine. There's Tilly down in Biloxi, but she's old enough to be my mom. Yolanda was older too. What am I supposed to do? Walk the earth looking for a suitable woman? Not happening." Sarah stepped to the door. I'm going to talk to her. After she was gone, I also got up to leave. Well, if you're going to stick around, at least try to get Christine to stay too. She needs friends around her right now. Bullshit, Grant said with a grin. I was almost out the door when he said it. What? I said. Bullshit, bro. I'm not mad about it, but I'm calling you on your bullshit. You don't care whether Christine has friends around her. You just want another woman in the house to run interference between me and Sarah. You're hoping I'll take a liking to her. Everything he said was true, but I wasn't going to admit it. I'll get her to stay, he said. You're pretty crafty for an old dude. I'm not old, I said, and left the RV. Grant and Christine didn't do any shooting that day. 
We all just avoided each other and kept ourselves busy with little chores while we waited for the broadcast. I was clearing out the small greenhouse around four o'clock that afternoon when Sarah brought a bottle of water to me. It's almost time, she said. I looked at my watch and nodded. Okay. Grant and Christine are going to listen to the radio in Julio's van. They don't want us around, huh? They don't want you around, she said. She gave me a quick, sympathetic smile. No need in that, I said in a dismissive tone. They can sit in the RV if they want to. I'll sit in my truck. I'll let them know, she said, and leaned against the doorway. What do you think you'll do? Will you join up with this new group? I doubt it, I said with a shrug. I won't be unfriendly, but I have a nice setup here. We have a nice setup. Why would I want to leave after all this hard work? Besides, we haven't had much luck merging with other groups, have we? She didn't reply. I tried to read her and figure out what she wasn't saying. Why would I want to go in and work for someone else now? I said, feeling the need to explain myself. As I see it now, I'm a free man. I make my own rules. I answer to no one. She looked down at her feet and stayed quiet. I stared at her a moment. What's on your mind? I said finally. If no one is willing to cooperate, there'll be no hope for the world. None at all. I can cooperate with decent men, I said. What I won't do is wind up under the thumb of men like Nathan Camp and Willie Roop and Wheeler. If this Dan guy in the airplane is like them, then I'm not interested. I wiped the sweat from my face with the bottom of my T-shirt and looked out the front windows of the building. I wish Somerville would come back. The councilman wasn't like those other men. He had scruples, at least. He loved Clayfield, at least, and wanted to rebuild. Clayfield isn't ever going to be Clayfield again, she said. If you got away from here for a week or two, you'd realize that. Nothing is what it was, and nothing is ever going to be that again. Not in our lifetime. I know that, I said. But we can hold on to some of it, for the sake of those that come after. They shouldn't have to start over completely. We could try to... try to keep it safe for them. Our kids, she said, with an expression of expectation... I stared at her blankly and tried to find the words I was comfortable using in that moment. The next generation, I said. She frowned and nodded. I knew I had offended her, but I didn't want to give her any false hope that I would personally want to bring children into this world. Not right then. Would it hurt your feelings if I listened to the broadcast with Grant and Christine? She asked hesitantly. It did bother me, but I didn't let on. No. Why? It's just that I don't want Christine to think I'm turning my back on her. I want her to stay with us. I'm worried about her. Sure, I said. Whatever. I mean, it's just a radio broadcast, she said. Yeah, whatever. Okay, she said. I thought I'd make dinner now. We could eat it while we listened. After, I said on impulse. Then I thought about it and decided it would be best. After, for sure, we can discuss what Dan has to say over dinner. Okay, she said. After. I'll go ahead and cook it, though. We have two boxes of pasta left in the van. Rigatoni, I think. How does that sound? There's a big can of peaches, too. Sounds good, I said, with the best smile I could fake. Chapter 19 At five o'clock, I was sitting in my pickup alone, drinking a beer and listening to that nasally voice tell me over and over that this is a recording. Sarah, Grant, and Christine were in the RV. I kept looking over at it, wondering what they were talking about. My truck was parked facing the road. The undead out there were still making some noise, but they had calmed down since the shooting had stopped. They stared at me. Many of them had vacant expressions, but there were just as many that had expressions that I can only describe as a mixture of curiosity and hunger. Sort of 
the way a dog will look at you when you're eating. Then the radio went silent for a moment. There were a couple of clicks, and the nasally voice spoke again. Hello to the living. Andrew here again. I apologize for not being on the air yesterday. I hope I didn't disappoint anybody, but I guess you understand. He chuckled nervously and paused. I could hear some bumping around, and he cleared his throat. Um, well, for the longest time, I didn't know if anybody was listening out there. I hoped, I hoped there were thousands, but I just wasn't sure. Today, I think I can be sure there are some new listeners out there, and I want to just talk directly to them. If there are others out there that's been listening to me for a while, I hope you'll excuse our detour away from our regular Bible study today, and I hope you'll bear with me while I do a little recapping. He cleared his throat again. I'm one of a group of survivors. Right now there are six in our group. My name is Andrew. As we get to know each other, I would be honored if you would call me Pastor Andrew. Before Canton B, I lived here in Clayfield. I'm retired, and I was a member there at the First Baptist Church. Dan and his little sister Cheryl are two other people in our group. Dan's the one you saw flying the airplane. Tim and Laney are a fine married couple. I perform the ceremony myself. Last but not least is Gail. She used to work for the radio station at the university, so she's the one that's responsible for getting us on the air. There was a thump on the microphone and a scratching sound. I could hear muffled voices. Then Andrew came back on. Uh, this is to the ones at the farm, the ones we dropped the package to. Stop shooting. We were able to find you because you've been shooting for days. I guess that's good because we know you're out there, but they're attracted to noise, too. You ought to know that by now, but I'm telling you just in case you don't know. We haven't heard you for a few hours, so I guess you got our note. I'm guessing that if you made it this long, you already know what there is to know. If you're exposed, you can drink alcohol, and that'll kill the virus. It won't kill it forever. You'll have to drink every time. We've noticed that they are drawn to women that are, that are, you know, going through their time in the month. This might be what is happening to you right now. If you will quit shooting and be quiet, we'll be able to help you with that in a couple of days. There was the sound of shuffling papers. Okay, um, I can tell you what we know. The disease spread worldwide, according to the news. We don't know of any place that was spared. We have monitored standard radio and also ham radio. Dan and Cheryl flew north and west to see what they could see. Due to the difficulties of landing his plane and refueling, he was only able to travel so far. But he never saw any sign of safety. He says he thinks a weapon possibly nuclear, and possibly more than one, was set off in Illinois. We don't know what that might mean for us in terms of fallout or exposure to radiation, but there's not a lot we can do about it. Also, Dan said that some weeks ago before he and I met, he witnessed massive fires burning in Illinois and Indiana. Thousands of acres have burned, no doubt taking whole towns with them. Hopefully, for the sake of any survivors there, those fires have burned themselves out by now. He sighed and cleared his throat. Our group is small. We are good people. We love the Lord and have Bible study every day. We don't want trouble and don't want to cause trouble. It's live and let live with us. We want to work together with other survivors to form a community. We would like to invite you to join with us, or at least work with us, to establish a safe haven in Clayfield. I'd like to see the First Baptist Church in operation again. 
We haven't had any takers yet. Maybe because nobody listens to the radio anymore. Maybe because nobody trusts nobody anymore. But listen, no one needs to fall to the virus ever again. We plan to eliminate the threat effectively and humanely in this area, but we can't do it alone. The job is too great. It is our belief that as we grow and as our light shines in this sinful world, others will seek us out. We believe that there must be people like us all over. We'd like to meet you. We'd like to meet any group out there so long as you want what we want. To the group at the farm, if your package didn't break when we dropped it, we can talk tomorrow. One or more of us will drive out near your location. Uh, we can plan around noon. If we do not talk, continue to listen to the station every day at five. If you want to meet, we ask that you do not come to the station. We do not live there, but we do guard it. We have defensive measures set up to deter trespass. We will be at the old plaza shopping center in the parking lot between the movie theater and the shoe store on Tuesday around 10 in the morning. We'll wait there as long as we can. That's all for now. I'm going to end today's broadcast with some Neil Diamond. My wife always loved Neil Diamond's music. It makes me think of her. I hope you will like it. There was silence. Then music started, and Neil sang Red Red Wine. I listened to the song and stared at the side door of the RV, waiting for Sarah to exit. Would she come right out, or would she stay in there and talk a while? Maybe she would stay in there and listen to the song. The door opened on the RV, so I turned off the radio. I chugged the rest of my beer, crushed the can, and dropped it to the floorboard. Sarah stepped out of the RV, but stood in the open door, still talking to Grant and Christine. She looked over her shoulder at me, said a few more words to the others, and shut the door. I got out when she approached my truck and met her halfway. "'What did you think?' she said. "'They sounded nice enough.' I said. Christine is disappointed, she said. She wanted to go in with them, but she thinks they'll turn out to be religious nuts because of the Bible study thing. You were into church and Jesus, and she's friends with you, I said. Church is over, Sarah said. I'm sad about that, but it is. I never really talked about it with her. She'll not find anything better with them than she has here anyway, I said. I'd rather she stay here, but I can't stop her if she decides to go. I thought they sounded good. They have electricity somehow. They're making broadcasts somehow. Yeah, well, I shook my head and looked at the ground. I know, she said. You've worked hard here. I don't want to pressure you to leave. What, are you thinking about going? She shrugged, but didn't answer. As much trouble as we've had before, we need to be careful here, I said. That group out at the high school looked pretty good in the beginning, too. I know. What did Grant say? He didn't really say anything. What does Bruce Lee have to do with this, I said. She pushed her hair away from her face with both hands and frowned. I don't know, she said. Nothing at all, I guess. They didn't mention him, so... At some point, we need to sit down and you need to tell me everything, I said. I did tell you everything, she said, defensively. I understand why you wanted to keep stuff from me, but... I told you everything. Is this guy dangerous? I don't know. He could be. Did you see anything that led you to believe he might... Let it go, she yelled. I told you, he was a geeky guy. He might be unstable. He has a sword. What do you want from me? What was your relationship like? Really? She said, stepping in closer. Is that all you really want to know? If we hooked up? Yeah, we did. I felt sorry for the guy. Happy now? Turns out I'm just as big a slut as Jen. But I guess that's what you like. Sarah, what the hell? Why would you say that? 
Bruce was a total weirdo. He was nice at first. He was really nice. He wasn't corn dog or anything. She turned to walk away. Sarah. She stopped and looked at me, waiting for me to say something. I didn't know what to say. I just didn't want her to walk away. I love you, she said, but I'm not your property. If that's what you think, then, well, don't think that. I thought you were dead. I never cheated on you. I was trying to get over losing you. Sarah, I said again. My mouth moved, but there was nothing more. I finally shut it and just stared at her. She broke eye contact first and went back to the house. Dinner is ready, she called out. Come in and eat. I looked over at the RV. The door was open. Grant and Christine had been standing in the doorway listening to our conversation. What are you looking at? I said. Chapter 20 The rigatoni was the closest thing I'd had to real comfort food in weeks. We didn't have any garlic bread or Italian sausage to go with it, and the sauce came out of a jar, but it was wonderful. We had a lot of it, too. It wasn't one of those sparse meals I was used to eating. I went back for seconds and thirds. There was salad, and Sarah even found a box of croutons in the supplies in the red van. I opened two bottles of red wine, and we drained them both. The mood should have been celebratory. We were all a little drunk, but it wasn't. Christine was sullen as usual. Sarah was quiet. Let's look at the pros and cons. On the pro side, they have electricity, and the dude can fly a plane. He's not going to take you anywhere, I said. There's nowhere to go. They're still following religious fairy tales, Christine said. Big fucking con. Bible study doesn't mean anything, Grant said. It's not like they can make you love Jesus. I don't have a problem with Jesus, Christine said. I have a problem with church people. This asshole could be planning to start a little caliphate. He'd eventually have me stoned or burned at the stake. That's just stupid, Grant said. Is it? Christine said. You have no idea how many times church people treated me bad because I didn't look like them. I was called everything from a whore to a witch to a Satan worshiper. Now that there isn't any law around, they can act on their hate. Did you? Grant said with a mischievous grin. Did you worship Satan? Kiss my ass, Grant, she said. Frat boys like you were the same way. Fucking knuckle-draggers. All that aside, they do have a plan, Sarah said. Eventually, it can be as good in Clayfield as in Biloxi, but without the gangs. It might be better than pulling weeds and shitting in a bucket, Christine said. But I don't think I want to live with them. I don't want to live here either. There's nothing good anywhere. I haven't seen you pull a single weed, I said. The only problem here is that you haven't even tried. You... Stop... Sarah said. I glared at Christine a moment, then turned my attention to Sarah. We've had bad experiences with other groups, I added in an even tone. I'm sure you were the common denominator in those bad experiences, Christine said. I never said we weren't going to help these people. We just shouldn't move in with them. At least here you know you're safe. I've done a lot of work here. Here we have fresh food to eat, and if we work it right, we can have a relatively comfortable life, considering. Well, consider me gone, Christine said. It just isn't worth it. Julio was all I had left that made all this bearable. Sweetie, I know you're hurting, but it'll get better, Sarah said. I don't want it to, Christine said. I could tell by the way she was speaking that the wine was hitting her a little harder than the rest of us. We were quiet for a minute, then Christine spoke again. Know what? she said. We've got guns and ammo out the ass. We need their electricity, but we don't have to take their shit. If we went in there and let them know that we're running the show, then... Then we'd be no different than the other gangs, I said. Should we be sheep? 
she said. Should we join his little flock? What if they wouldn't go for it? Grant said. What would you do? We would do what we have to do, Christine said. Pastor Andrew might have to go. Absolutely not, I said. You haven't even met the guy yet. He said we could meet on Tuesday. That's the day after tomorrow. I don't need to meet him, she said. I know his type. I'm not into religion either, I said. Especially not these days, but you're acting no differently from the religious people that judged you. Christine stood up. You don't understand, and you never will. People like me get a lot of shit from people like them. Maybe people like you bring it on yourselves, I said. You've brought a lot on yourself, asshole, she said, leaning in, hands on the table. I hope you can handle the shitstorm. She had a look in her eyes that made me squirm a little. Grant laughed. What does that even mean, Christine? Fuck you, she said to Grant, her speech slurred. Why don't you go to bed, Sarah said. I think you've had too much wine. I think you've had too much dick, Christine laughed. She stood straight again and looked around at everyone. She's laid every healthy man between here and Mississippi. Go to bed, Christine, Sarah said. I'll go to bed when I want, Christine said. Then she looked at Grant with a smirk. Want to join me, jackass? Grant seemed startled by her gaze. What? Me? No. She stepped over to him, sat in his lap, and kissed him. Sarah stood. Stop it. Grant said, pushing Christine away. What's wrong with you? Christine got off and slapped him. Then she took a step backward and pulled her 9 millimeter from its holster and pointed it at Grant. Immediately, we were all on our feet, guns drawn. What the hell? I said. Put it away. Drop the gun, Sarah yelled. You got Julio killed, Sarah, Christine said softly. You all had something to do with it. I should take a man from you. Unlike you, I didn't have a backup. Julio was my only one. He was special. You could lose one and not even miss him. Grant, come upstairs with me and screw my brains out, or I could just blow yours out here and now. Christine, don't talk like that. You're drunk and... She quickly turned and pointed the gun at me. What about you? Want to come upstairs and give it to me? Let me see why Sarah had to put us all in danger to come back to you. Don't make me shoot you, Christine, Sarah said. Christine stood there a moment longer. Then she took a breath and put her pistol on the table next to her plate. I'm trying to give out free poon, but I'm surrounded by faggots. Julio was a real man. The three of us had not relaxed at all. We were still pointing our weapons at her. Go to bed, Christine, Sarah said. I know you don't mean any of this. I'm still your friend. Fucking shitstorm, Christine said, then turned and went upstairs. Slowly, we all holstered our weapons. It'll be best to leave her alone, Sarah said. No shit, Grant said. She can't be here, I said. I know what I said earlier, but she'll have to go. Sarah took her plate to the sink. You should have just left her alone. You kept picking on her. I won't have her living in my house, not after that. It's not your house, Sarah said coldly. I'm going to save these dishes until tomorrow. I don't feel like washing them. I'll wash them, babe, Grant said. Whatever, she said, and left us. I heard the front door open and saw her walk past the window on her way off the porch. Grant and I stood next to the table in an uncomfortable silence. Crazy week, Grant said. Yeah, I said with a frown. Crazy year. Chicks in their periods, huh, bro? Christine kept herself closed up in the other upstairs bedroom, and no one bothered her. 
Grant slept in the RV again, and Sarah slept on the couch. I didn't speak to anyone after the ordeal at dinner. We all just avoided each other. I tried to read for a while before bed, but I couldn't concentrate. I finally gave up and just went to bed. Around midnight, I woke up to a warm body crawling in with me. It was almost completely dark in the room, and all I could see was a silhouette. Sarah? I said. She straddled me. My hands found soft, warm thighs, then moved up unclothed skin to her waist. Her crotch pressed against mine. I could feel her heat even through my jeans, and my body responded. When she leaned in, I realized it wasn't Sarah. Christine? Get off me! Get out of here! Shut up, she said, and ground herself against me. Then I heard Sarah scream downstairs. Sarah? I yelled. I reached back over my head and fumbled under the pillow for my flashlight. The beam hit Christine in the face, and she turned her eyes away from the light. She pushed her crotch against me again, harder, and leaned back so that she was sitting upright. That's when I noticed the knife. Shit. She knocked the flashlight out of my hand. It hit the floor and spun around. I tried to push her off me before she could stick the knife into my chest. You ruined everything, she spat out through clenched teeth. Then she screamed and slumped over me. I gave a final push and rolled her onto the floor. She was on her feet right away and fell back against the wall by the door. Sarah, I yelled. My feet went into my boots, but I didn't lace them. I grabbed my pistol, picked up my flashlight, and pointed both of them at Christine. She was naked, and her arms hung at her side. Her hands were wet and red. Blood dripped from the fingertips to the floor. She squinted into my flashlight beam, then gave me a little grin. You are so fucked, she said. Sarah screamed again, and I heard glass break downstairs. What's happening, I said. Christine turned her wrists up so I could see. Blood dribbled and spurted out of deep, open gashes. The bloody knife was on the floor. There was a gunshot downstairs. I looked at the dark doorway, then back at the bleeding woman in front of me. What have you done, Christine? She slid down the wall and sat on the floor, with her knees around her ears, then grinned up at me. I ran out the door. Sarah! They're in! She yelled. I need light! I can't see! Chapter 21 I ran into the first creature at the top of the stairs. I did a quick shine of the flashlight, saw the ghoulish face, and put my pistol against its forehead. I fired, and it fell back down to the landing and sprawled there. I got a better look at it then. The bottom of its face below the nose and ears was raw bone. Its eyes were gray and milky. A few strands of black hair remained. The body was clad only in the dirty elastic collar of a t-shirt and the elastic waistband of some Hanes tidy whities Between its open legs was something, but it didn't look like genitalia. I went down as far as the dead zombie, then I saw Sarah coming up. I shined my light behind her. The front door was standing open, and there were several in the house. I could see the shadowy figures of more on the porch. Farther out, the headlight beams of the RV shone on scores more in the driveway and in the yard. I took Sarah's hand and held her over the dead thing on the landing. How did they get in? she said, as we both ran back up the stairs. Christine, I said. She must have opened the gate. Then she left the door open so they could come in the house. No, she wouldn't. We ran into my bedroom. I shut and locked the door. Christine was still on the floor between the door and the dresser. She was sitting in a dark puddle of her own blood and urine. She was hanging on, but her eyelids were drooping. Christine, Sarah said in a pleading voice. Tell me you didn't do this. Christine only stared. Christine, please, 
Oh, God, your wrists. Oh, sweetie. Sarah grabbed my shirt from the floor and tried to wrap it around Christine's wrists to stop the bleeding. I shined the flashlight below the window on the other side of the room to make sure my bug-out bag was still there. Light! Sarah yelled. I can't see what I'm doing. I put the flashlight on the floor and shined it in her direction. Then I went around the bed for the bug-out bag. There would be another flashlight in there. Why? Sarah said to Christine. There was a thump against the door. The undead were on the second floor. I felt around in the backpack until I found the light, an LED headlamp. I put the strap around my head and turned the switch, illuminating everything in front of me in bright bluish light. There's a first aid kit in here, I offered, as I dug through the bag, taking a quick inventory. No, Sarah said softly. It's too late. She's already gone. I turned and looked at the two women. Christine slouched there like a marionette with cut strings. Her legs were obscenely bent and spread. Her head rested against the wall, and her mouth hung open. There was scratching on the bedroom door. Sarah didn't move. She sat cross-legged on the floor, facing Christine. She was so angry, Sarah said. Even before all this, even before she lost Julio, she had so much anger... The thumps continued against the door, and more started against the wall. Then Sarah looked up at me and shielded her eyes from the light. Oh my God! Grant! There's nothing we can do right now, I said. Hopefully he stayed in the RV. He knows they're inside because he had the RV headlights on. She stood and pulled the blanket from my bed. Then she put it over Christine's body. She might turn soon, I said. We don't want a repeat of Julio. I know, she whispered. I'll take care of her, I said. You go out the window and climb up the ladder to the roof. There's a shotgun and a thirty aught thirty in the closet. Have you ever fired a lever action? She didn't answer. She bent over and picked up her little pink gun, checked it to see if it was ready, then quickly aimed at the blanket and put two rounds into Christine's skull. The sound of the gun in that enclosed space made my ears ring. The smoke moving through the blue light of my lamp looked ghostly. Do you have food? Sarah asked calmly, as she shoved her still-smoking weapon into the back of her jeans. Yeah, I said. Some. Do you think they'll get in? We could stay in here until morning at least. I don't know, I replied. I don't like them being so close. I don't like her being so close. Sarah looked down at Christine's body again. We could... we could dump her out the window if you're worried about her, she said. We could push the dresser against the door. It's not like we'll be able to get off the roof anyway. Okay, I said. I'm going to go ahead and move some of this stuff up there, though, just in case we have to go out. I want more than just the bug-out bag. It'll take more than one trip to get all of it. She picked up the flashlight and went to the closet to remove the long guns. I opened the window, then went over to the dresser. I opened the top drawer and pulled out another headlamp, a forty-five revolver, and a box of ammunition. I put on a shirt, tied my boots, strapped on my hip holster with the nine millimeter, and I got into my shoulder holster with the forty-five. I strapped a knife to my leg by the boot and went to the corner for my baseball bat. Sarah stood by the window and watched me. Here, I said, and tossed her the extra headlamp. She caught it and put it on, but didn't turn it on. Are you sorry I came back? She said. The knocks and scratches against the door were louder. Nope, I said. It's been trouble, she said. And more to come, I expect, I said. But you're worth it. She looked at the floor. Grant and Bruce were the only ones... That thing Christine said earlier, it wasn't true. I don't care about that, I said. It doesn't matter. It especially doesn't matter right now. I just want to know about potential threats. I don't like being in the dark. I don't like you keeping secrets. She looked back to Christine's body, then back to me. You cared before, she said. It took me by surprise, I replied. I hate surprises.
Right now we have a more pressing matter. She sat down on the bed and ran her fingers through her hair. I tried to kill Bruce, she said, and I thought I did. That's why he's here, I think. What? You... I hit him in the head with a piece of wood and locked him in a room with the infected down in Hattiesburg, and I left him to die. A loud moan outside made her glance at the door. I just stared at her, unsure what to say. Did I ever really know you, was what eventually came out of my mouth. He was a cruel man, she said. I had to do it. Okay, but Christ, Sarah. I'm not sorry I did it, she said. Why are you telling me this now? Jesus Christ, look around, I yelled and waved a hand over to Christine and the pool of blood. I don't want to think about this right now, I said putting the stuff on the bed next to Sarah. Christine just slit her wrists while she was sitting on top of me. She could have stabbed me. She could have done anything. There are zombies in the house, and... I stopped next to Sarah and looked down at her. My headlamp shined in her face. What the hell is going on with you? She turned her head out of the glare and started to speak. Don't answer that, I said. Come on, let's get her out of the room. I'm sorry. We have more important things going on right now. Grab her legs. I lifted Christine up from under her armpits, and Sarah grabbed her ankles. The blanket fell off her when we went around the bed, and I was uncomfortably aware that my hand was touching her bare, lifeless breast. When we got her to the window, Sarah helped me lift her up so her torso was hanging out. Then we lifted her legs and let gravity pull her out the window to the backyard. She hit the ground below with a thud. I took a moment to breathe and get over the sight of her bloody legs and dirty feet disappearing out the window. Sarah stared at me expectantly. I'm taking some of these things up to the roof, I said. Can you move the dresser by yourself? I'll be fine, she said. I put on the backpack and grabbed the thirty aught thirty. Then I climbed out the window onto the ladder that I had built months before. It was dark outside, but below me I could see movement. I was hopeful that we wouldn't be overrun the way we had been before. I knew there were a lot on the property, just from the brief view I'd gotten of the RV's headlight beams. But they were only coming in through the gate at the driveway, unlike the last time when they came in from everywhere. If we could get the gate shut, I was confident we had enough ammo to clear them out. I climbed up onto the roof and walked up the incline on the asphalt shingles to the peak. I put the rifle down across the top of the chimney and took off the backpack. Then I looked out to the front of the property. The RV's engine was idling and the high beams were on. Most of the zombies from the road were either already inside or coming in. The lights barely illuminated the road, but from what I could see, there weren't any coming in to replace the ones that had come onto the property. I didn't see Grant, so I presumed he was sitting behind the wheel. I didn't know what he had planned, but I hoped he was waiting for an opportunity to drive down to the end of the driveway and shut the gate. Then there was a gunshot inside the house. It was unexpected, and it startled me. I turned around too quickly and lost my footing. I fell on my ass and skidded down the shingles. Thankfully, the heel of my boot caught the gutter and stopped my fall. There was another shot in the house. Sarah, are you okay? Another shot went off. I edged over to the ladder, climbed down as far as the open window, and pulled my pistol. The room was empty, and the door was open. The gun went off again. My headlight beam fell on a dead creature in the doorway. Chapter 22 I climbed in the window. There was another gunshot. Sarah, what are you doing? Get back here! I yelled as I ran for the door. Shut the door! She yelled. I'm fixing this! Damn it, Sarah, get up here! I stepped over the thing in the doorway, then over two more in the hallway and found a live one on the stairs. I put it down with one shot, then stumbled over bodies until I got to the bottom of the stairs. 
she was just about to go out the front door. She had the shotgun to her shoulder and fired out onto the porch. There were zombies in the house that she'd avoided or ignored. Between Sarah and I were three of them, just standing there as if trying to decide which of us they wanted. Sarah pumped her shotgun and exited the house. I had taken the plug out of that shotgun, so I knew it held more than three, but I couldn't remember how many times she'd fired. Sarah, come back! You're almost out of shells! There were guns in every room of the house, but I kept an AR-15 in the downstairs bedroom where Julio had died. Rather than go out after Sarah, I cut to my left to get the gun. Another gunshot went off outside. Then I heard Grant yelling. Sarah answered him. There were four shots in quick succession. God damn it, Sarah, I said. The back hallway was clear, and I threw open the door to the bedroom closet. I grabbed the AR-15 and ran out of the room, past the bathroom, and out the back door. A naked female with no arms ran at me out of the darkness from the direction of the well house. The thing still had a full head of long, tangled hair. I brought the rifle up, pulled the trigger twice, and its brains sprayed out. I looked to my left. There were several creatures gathering around Christine's corpse. One of them was already on hands and knees and chewing on the body. Two shots rang out from the front of the house. Then the horn from the RV sounded. I ran to the right and rounded the corner of the house and into the driveway. Sarah was climbing into the side door of the RV. Sarah! Once she'd shut the door, the RV started rolling. Then, in the red glow of the taillights, I saw a line come up from the ground and straighten. It took me a second to realize what it was. No, I said. Then I yelled, No! Stop! The hose is still connected! The hose tightened and bounced a little, then I heard the tires spinning in the gravel. Damn it! Stop! There was a loud noise behind me from the cistern, and the hose came free. The RV sped up with the hose snaking along behind it. Grant plowed through the zombies in the driveway and pulled out into the road. Then he slammed on the brakes. The interior light came on, then went off. Creatures from the road started gathering around it and slapping the side. The vehicle lurched forward, stopped again, and then he sped away without closing the gate. Son of a bitch, I said. Right before the tail lights disappeared from sight, the horn went off in a long blast that continued for a mile or more. But I didn't stick around to listen to the horn. I could see the shadows closing in around me and some of the things were coming into my light. I considered trying to make it to the car by the barn, but I didn't want to take the risk. Instead, I ran back into the house. I locked the back door, then moved into the kitchen. A child was in there, ripping into a bag of garbage. When my light fell on it, it turned and stared. I had no idea whether it had been a boy or a girl. It was hunched there on all fours. It growled at me then moved toward me slowly on hands and feet like an ape. I hated shooting kids. When I got close enough, I kicked it in the head. It fell back, and its leg jerked in a spasm. I went past it to the entrance of the living room. There were five adults in there. They turned when they saw my light and stared curiously. I looked at the front door. If I moved quickly, I could get the door shut before I had to fire my weapon. To my right was the fireplace and mantelpiece. Some of Mrs. Lassiter's figurines were still on there. I grabbed the closest one, a small blue and white porcelain statue of a boy holding a pail. I threw it hard against the wall by the stairs. It shattered, and all the creatures turned to see the source of the noise. When they were turned, I ran and shut the door. After that, I had no qualms about firing my weapon. Five sets of milky eyes settled on me again. A mouth or two dropped open. One took a dragging step toward me. <sighs> Another of them said. I put the AR-15 to my shoulder and kept squeezing the trigger until they were all down and no longer moving. Then I went around and shot each one in the head two more times to be sure. I found another one in the upstairs bathroom. After it was dead, 
and went back downstairs to remove the child. It didn't weigh very much, but I didn't pick it up. I didn't want to cuddle it. I dragged it down to the back door by its foot, opened the door quickly, and slung it out like a rag doll before anything else could come in. I turned my back to the door and rested on it for a second with my eyes closed and just breathed. Then I stepped over to the cabinet under the sink, pulled out a bottle, sat at the table, and had a drink. At 7 a.m., I stood on the roof and leaned against the chimney with my bottle and my rifles and watched a crowd of dead people trample my garden. By the time the sun had risen and I had noticed they were in there, it was too late to do anything about it. They'd been in there all night. The cucumbers, tomatoes, squash. It had all been walked down and crushed. I took a drink. You missed a spot, I yelled down to them. Over there, assholes. I see a pepper plant still standing. Pepper, right there, you sons of bitches. There were a total of 132 zombies on the property at that time, not counting any that might be hiding in the barns. There were a few more on the road and some stragglers around the perimeter. Most of them were naked, and this had become the norm. There were still a few of the undead out there that were fully clothed, but they weren't as common as they had been. In some cases, the body had shrunk and the clothes just fell off. In other cases, the clothes rotted off. I'd still see some elastic waistbands and plastic raincoats and some jewelry on the naked ones, but that was usually all that remained. In the light of day, I could see the damage done to the cistern. The spigot had been pulled out, and the cistern tank itself had been shifted from its original position, which resulted in the pipe from the barns having been broken loose. Also, it was empty. All the water had leaked out through the hole left by the missing spigot. There'd be no way I could live in the house again. There would be too much to clean up. All of my hard work was ruined. I took another drink. She sure brought the shitstorm, didn't she? I yelled. The creatures howled and moaned in reply. I took another drink. Oh, I said, as I held up my bottle to show them. And I'm probably an alcoholic now. Ain't that awesome? I slid off the chimney, then looked down inside it. Just awesome sauce. I dropped the bottle down the hole and grabbed the two rifles. I was going to walk along the ridge to the other end of the house, but the liquor wouldn't let me. I changed my mind and just sat. I lifted the hunting rifle to my shoulder and tried to put the crosshairs of the scope on one of the things in the garden. I couldn't hold it steady, so I put it down. I needed to sober up so I could shoot and think straight. I opened the bug-out bag and pulled out a bottle of water. After drinking half of it, I stretched out with my head on the ridge of the roof. What did Sarah mean when she said she was fixing this? She'd left the gate and front door open, so she hadn't fixed either of those things. Did she plan to find Bruce Lee and finish the thing she'd left unfinished in Hattiesburg? Was she trying to fix something by getting out of my life? I'd seen her execute bad men, and even though I thought it was unnecessary, I understood her decision. After all, I had done the same. Also, I was a little jealous about her additional boyfriends, but I understood that too. However, there was something about her that seemed different to me. She seemed cold. I didn't understand how she could so easily have sex with this stranger she'd met in Memphis, then, with a lack of emotion, attempt to take his life. What had he done that had shifted him from lover to unredeemable? I didn't know what her criteria were that made a man worthy of death. I didn't know her definitions of good and bad. I thought I did in the beginning. I had thought we were on the same page, but every time one of these new things popped up, 
it unsettled me a little more. I was sure I had disappointed her and angered her in the past. At what point would I shift over into her bad column and be intentionally trapped with the infected and left to die? I put my arm across my eyes to block out the sunshine. It was going to be another hot day. Well, at least I won't have to weed the garden today. Chapter 23 I awoke from a bad dream that I couldn't remember and sat up, startled. The sun hit me in the face, and I skidded down the roof. I bent my legs and put my feet flat against the shingles to stop myself, then put my hands over my face to block out the sun again. Ugh. Shit. I had a horrible headache. I rolled over to my elbow and took a look at my watch. It was almost 10.30. My arm was red. Then I noticed my lips hurt. I had slept on the roof for more than three hours. Sunburn! What a perfect addition to my day! Then I remembered Pastor Andrew. He was supposed to be nearby around noon to talk to us on that little radio. I crawled back up to the peak, got a drink of water from the bottle in the backpack, and then crawled down the other side to the ladder. I looked over the edge of the roof before I started down. Christine had been eaten from the bottom rib cage down. Her breasts were gone, too. Her open eyes stared up at me. Without warning, the contents of my stomach spewed out of my mouth and splattered on and around her. I lay back on the roof and wiped my mouth. Tears blurred my eyes. When I had pulled myself together, I went back to the edge and climbed down the ladder without looking down. I couldn't find the little radio. I searched through the drawers of my dresser. I looked in the pockets of a dirty pair of jeans. I went downstairs and searched the living room and kitchen. Finally, I gave up on it, thinking that I must have left it in my pickup. I dug around in the cupboard and pulled out a bag of corn chips. Then went back into the living room and looked out the front window. They were on the front lawn, in the garden, and in the driveway. More surrounded the house to the side and rear. Killing them all would take a while, but it wouldn't be too difficult. I could just shoot as many as I could from the first floor windows, then move up to the second floor and roof for the rest. I collected all of the guns I had stored downstairs and brought them into the living room. I put the four handguns on the coffee table and propped the two shotguns and the rifle by the window. If my aim was good enough, I should be able to put them all down without using too much ammunition. I killed the ones close to the house without a problem, but there were others that were in the front pasture or near the road that I couldn't quite hit with a kill shot. I was confident I could take care of them with one of the upstairs guns. I didn't have a scope on the downstairs rifle, but the AR-15 had one. Once I felt I had done all I could do on the first floor, I moved upstairs. The upstairs windows faced only the backyard. There weren't any guns left in my room, so I decided to do my shooting from Sarah's bedroom window. Christine's things were still in there. I turned her duffel bag upside down and emptied the contents on the bed. There wasn't anything too interesting in there. It was just clothes, a couple of magazines, a candy bar, and a small bottle of perfume. There was also a little digital camera in there, and I was surprised that it powered up when I turned it on. There were several pictures of Julio and Christine together, taken with the camera held at arm's length. There was a picture of Grant and Sarah sitting next to each other on the hood of a car. Behind them were eight lanes of gridlock that went on for miles. There was an out-of-focus picture of a penis. There was a picture of Sarah smiling and looking out of the corner of her eye at someone or something out of the frame. She was standing with a rifle, and there were three dead zombies hanging upside down from a tree, as if they were her trophies. Another picture showed a pile of dead bodies in an urban environment. Sarah was posing next to them with a rifle, a bottle of wine, and a big smile. Next, 
Julio and an older man posed next to a tank on a city street. Next. Christine, Sarah, and an older woman straddled the cannon of the same tank. Next. Grant and Sarah kissing. Next. A pile of dead bodies on fire. I turned the camera off and put it in my pocket. I went over to the closet and pulled out the guns I had stored there. Then I went to the bathroom at the end of the hall to get the shotgun I kept next to the toilet. That's when I found Pastor Andrew's two-way radio. It was down in the bowl, sticking out of a glob of wet, dirty toilet paper. There was an inch or more of dark yellow urine in there, too. Crazy bitch! I didn't touch the radio. I went back to the bedroom, and after eating Christine's candy bar, I opened the window and shot as many as I could from there. Then I moved back up to the roof. It took me another half hour to put down most of the rest with a thirty ought thirty. Picking them off from the safety of the house was cathartic. The sound of the gun and the sight of their heads jerking back when I made the kill let off steam in a way that alcohol could not. Alcohol suppressed the feelings by making me feel good. But watching the thirty ought thirty punch holes into skulls and working that lever between rounds made me feel better. Christine and Grant had the right idea about parking themselves next to the fence and shooting zombies all day. It was good therapy. There were only six remaining, and they were down by the road. I traded the thirty ought thirty for the AR-15. This is so much better than a video game, I thought, as I put the crosshairs of that scope on the head of a woman by the mailbox. I felt a twinge of guilt for it. I actually hesitated a moment to analyze it. Does this make me as bad as Bruce Lee or Corndog? I was allowing myself to enjoy the kill. Bruce Lee and Corndog enjoyed playing with the undead, which might be considered torture. I let the gun barrel drop a couple of inches and stared out into space while I thought it over. Nah, I'm better than them. I put my sights on the woman again and squeezed the trigger. I did that five more times and tried not to gloat for the sake of my conscience. I still had to go down and shut the gate and then do a thorough search of the property and barns, but before all that, I planned to go out and look for Grant and Sarah. It was fifteen minutes after twelve o'clock by that time. Pastor Andrew and or Dan were probably parked nearby, talking to the piss in the upstairs toilet. They'd likely heard the gunfire. I wondered if they'd do another flyover. I took the bug-out bag and guns down the ladder one at a time, put them in through the bedroom window, then I climbed in and took them downstairs. I kept forty-eight hours' worth of supplies in my truck, so I didn't see any need in bringing the bag to go search for Sarah. I did bring the Kevlar helmet and vest on the off chance that I ran into Bruce Lee. In addition to my two sidearms, I brought a twelve-gauge and the AR-15. There was also another nine millimeter in the glove compartment of the truck. There was a crawler behind the truck. Its legs looked fine to me, but it was dragging itself around on its belly. My guess was that it was weak. It didn't look like it had fed in a while. I propped the guns against the truck, knelt down, and stuck my hand out. What's the matter? I said to the creature. Aren't you hungry? Or are you just lazy? <sighs> was the sound that came out of its throat. Is that all you can say, after what you did to my place? It dug its bony fingers into the gravel of the driveway and pulled itself closer to me. I pulled my hand back a little to stay just out of reach. I just ate some Fritos. Want some Fritos? I reached over and poked the top of its head. The skin felt oily and loose. Hey, asshole, do you want some Fritos or not? It stretched out, and the tips of its fingers brushed my knee. Fritos, Fritos, I said, poking it again. <coughs> I stood and put my boot on its head and pushed the side of its face into the rocks. I'm talking to you, you son of a bitch. 
I pressed down harder and twisted my foot as if I was trying to stomp out a cigarette. You want some fucking Fritos? The thing grabbed my ankle with both hands. I twisted harder. Then it let out a noise that startled me. It sounded so close to a whimper that I jerked free and stumbled back. It did it again, and I would have sworn that it was crying. Or pleading? Shit. I picked up the guns and loaded them into the truck. I looked over at the creature, and it lay in the same position like a submissive dog. Damn it. Stop! I yelled at it. I took off my helmet and put it on the seat of the truck. I looked over again and caught the thing looking at me. It might have been my imagination, but I thought I saw it notice me looking, and it ducked its head, cowering. Hell no, I said. You're not going to do this. You're not a person. You're not even an animal. You're nothing. You're a monster. It just lay there. Act like a monster, damn it. It didn't move. Fucking act like it. I pulled my nine millimeter and shot it. And then I shot it four more times. I stared at it a moment, then climbed in my truck. When I pulled out onto the road, I got out and shut the gate. There were a few out on the road, but I had enough time to do what I needed to do before they shambled up to me. When I got back into the truck, I turned on the air conditioning, then opened the center console. I dug around in the CDs until I saw something that interested me in that moment. Leon Russell looked good right then. I slid the CD into the slot and tapped the buttons for the track I wanted. Hummingbird started. I cranked up the volume and stomped the gas. The tires squealed and smoked. Chapter 24 As I approached the bypass on Braggasburg Road and entered the Clayfield city limits, Leon Russell was a stranger in a strange land, just like Robert Heinlein's Mr. Smith, just like me. No. Correction. I was not a stranger. I was a citizen of a strange land. I stopped in the middle of the intersection and let the song finish. I was still unsettled by the not-quite-mindless display I'd seen from the crawler. A few zombies were in view nearby. They watched me enjoy the song. I felt a little sad that they'd never enjoy music again. I suppose, after a while, I wouldn't be able to play these songs anymore either. Eventually, the bulk of human artistic achievement would disappear. I rolled the windows down and turned up the volume. Can you grok it, y'all? I yelled. I watched the things for any sign of reaction to the music. They did get excited, but only because there was a chance to feed. I felt somewhat relieved. The crawler's actions were either a fluke or just my imagination. I needed to count on these things to act normal, even if their normal was disgusting and horrifying. I frowned, then I turned off the stereo. They didn't appreciate the music. The only thing worse than the disappearance of centuries of art and music was there would be no one around that cared. Braggasburg Road was flanked on either side by high grass. There were five of the creatures in the street, but more emerged from the overgrown lawns as I passed by. Only one actually came near the truck and tried to pursue me. The rest stopped in the street and watched me. Again, my mind played tricks. Their posture and overall physical appearance gave them an air of malevolence that chilled me. I felt as if I were lost in a bad neighborhood. It was silly, because all of that would imply intelligence on their part, and I knew that wasn't possible. Maybe my conscience was trying to rein me in. I turned onto South 6th Street and headed north toward the court square. I wanted to take a closer look at those yellow cars and trucks on East Broadway. If Sarah had gone out to look for Bruce Lee, I suspected she would have visited that spot first. I was correct. When I pulled up in front of the line of yellow vehicles, I saw a piece of paper tucked under the windshield wiper of the first car. Also, one of the vehicles was gone, 
leaving only four. I looked around to make sure it was safe to get out, then I cautiously went to retrieve the paper. It was a note. My big Bruce Bear, I am so happy you are alive, and I am happy to see that you are in Clayfield. Thank you for the yellow cars. I know they are a special message just for me. I am sorry for leaving you, but I thought you were dead. It was all an accident and misunderstanding. I want to make it up to you. I think about you all the time. I have looked for you since I found the cars, but I haven't been able to find you. If you want me as bad as I want you, meet me at the movie theater on Burger Road on Tuesday at ten in the morning. I'll be in one of your yellow cars. Love, Sarah. What the hell was she doing? She was obviously lying to somebody. Why would she want him to meet her at the same time and place as the scheduled meeting with Pastor Andrew? I heard the sound of an engine. It was close and getting closer. I put the note in my pocket and my hand on the grip of my pistol and waited. A bright yellow car roared through the intersection on the cross street. It was a blur as it disappeared behind City Hall. Then tires screeched when the driver slammed on the brakes. There was a very brief moment of silence. The engine rumbled. The tires squealed. Then the car backed into the intersection and came to a stop. It was an old muscle car from the late 1960s, a Pontiac Firebird. At one time it had been a showpiece, but it wasn't anymore. It had been modified. There were hooks or bolts welded to the top and front. On the hooks hung chains on which were strung human heads, zombie heads, much like the way a fisherman might string a day's catch. The chain entered the neck cavity and exited the mouth, then entered the neck of the next head, and so on. Welded to the very top of the car was a metal spike about three feet long, on which were driven more human heads. Some of the heads on the chains still lived. One of the chains that hung from the roof swung like a pendulum due to the inertia of the quick stop and left an arced smear of putrid juices on the passenger window. I could hear the car's stereo rattling the speakers. The driver opened his door. Heart-shaped box by Nirvana blasted out of the car, then it was quickly silenced. The driver got out. He was tall, well over six feet, and he had a large head. His dark hair was slicked straight back, and he wore dark sunglasses. He didn't wear a mask over his nose and mouth to protect him against the virus. He was clean-shaven, and freshly so. He had razor burn on his throat. He stared at me, stone-faced. It was all very dramatic. We finally meet he said. His voice was deep and gravelly and sounded fake, like a movie tough guy. Hey, I replied. I've been watching you, he said, still stone-faced. What, you mean now? For a while, he said. Days, dramatic pause, maybe weeks. Yeah, well... He bent down into the car. When he came out again, he put a leather strap over his head and down over his shoulder. It was the strap to a scabbard he was slinging onto his back. The handle of a sword stuck up over his right shoulder. Well, what? he said, adjusting the strap. Nothing, I said. Get your hand off your weapon, my brother, he said. I'm a friend. Okay, I said. He walked around the car toward me, which allowed me to get a good look at him. He had a gut that made him look like he was seven months pregnant. He was wearing a Punisher t-shirt tucked into black cargo pants, which were tucked into black combat boots. He had two pistols holstered on his belt, and both were positioned in such a way that he would have to cross his arms to draw them. I wondered how he would be able to do that without his belly getting in the way. He swaggered toward me and never broke character. He even bobbed his head from side to side like he was popping his neck. 
body language he'd probably learned from watching pro wrestling or bad action movies. Sarah actually had sex with this dork? Is that a ninja sword? I said, trying to keep from laughing at his display of tough guyness. Katana, he said. It's the real deal. I smashed a display case in a museum down in Atlanta. The card said it was more than 500 years old. Nice, I said. Did you move my car? He asked, hooking his thumbs into his belt. What? No. I had five cars parked here, and now there are only four. No, I said. It was... It must have been someone else. Someone else, he repeated. His expression didn't betray his thoughts, but I could tell by the tone of his voice that he was dubious. He sniffed and offered his hand. As I said, I've seen you around town. I've been watching you. I wanted to make sure I could trust you. I shook his hand and nodded. The name is Bruce Lee, he said, then waited for me to react to that. When I didn't, he continued. I'm looking for a young woman. Aren't we all, I said. I saw the faintest of grins cross his lips, then disappear. A specific young woman, he said. She was from here in Clayfield. I looked around then over my shoulder. The undead were slowly coming in. Do you mind if we go in some place and talk so the infected won't bother us? Fine with me, he said. I nodded across the street to Clayfield Water and Electric. How about there? We crossed the street. It was stuffy inside, and there were the skeletal remains of a person seated behind the counter. So you think there is a young woman in Clayfield, I said, once we were inside. Yeah, he said. Her name was Sarah. Have you seen her? All I do all day every day is look for women, I said and pulled my mask down off my nose and mouth. I haven't seen any women anywhere. For all I know, they've all turned. He nodded solemnly. Where did you see her last? I asked. Tennessee, he said. Tennessee? Hell, man, she could be anywhere. What makes you think she's here? He leaned on the counter. I followed her and watched her for a long time. She stayed in Biloxi a while. Then... A couple of weeks ago, she and her friends headed north. I followed them until I was sure they were coming here. Then I came on ahead of them. The last time I saw them, they were in a little town in Tennessee. I've been hoping to get her alone so I could talk with her. She didn't know you were following her, I said. He took his sunglasses off dramatically. Let's just say I know certain stealth techniques. And you have a sword. You're a ninja. He stared at me blankly. You wouldn't be fucking with me, would you? Wouldn't dream of it. He continued to stare as if trying to read me. I shrugged. Maybe she went someplace else. Trust me, if I had found a woman, you'd know it because I'd have a silly grin on my face. He snorted, but never cracked a smile. You're a funny guy, he said. I like you. Chapter 25 Now that I had met Bruce, I was curious where I ranked with Sarah's line of boyfriends. Sarah's pre-apocalypse boyfriend had played basketball in high school and was away at college at the time Canton B struck. I'd never met him or even seen a picture, but I could make reasonable suppositions about him. Grant had some growing up to do, but he'd be a solid catch for most women. Bruce Lee was more like a caricature than a real person. I suppose the only thing all the others had in common was that they were tall. I was average everything. I was normal by my judgment. In some ways, I would put Grant higher on the scale than me. He would have had a good future ahead of him if not for Canton B., he was handsome, strong, whatever. Maybe the old boyfriend was like Grant. Bruce, on the other hand, Bruce was a joke. As far as I was concerned, I didn't even think he belonged. 
I would have felt more comfortable in the company of Dr. Travis Barr than Bruce Lee. Travis had been an evil son of a bitch in the end, but at least he fit in every other way with Grant and the old boyfriend. If she had come completely clean with me, then I was her true choice. That was what really mattered. It felt good that she would choose me over Grant, but I couldn't get it out of my head that she'd shared a bed with Bruce. The only comfort I had was that she'd left him for dead, and that was only to smooth my ego. Dork or not, what did he do to make her decide to kill him? Bruce asked me to join him for dinner, and I agreed. I wanted to get to know him. I wanted to find out more about his relationship with Sarah, and I wanted to know where he lived. I followed him to the north end of town, to a little house just past the Clayfield Mobile Home Court. Because of all the damage done to that end of town by Wheeler's men, we had to take a few secondary streets to avoid the impassable main road. The whole way there, one of the heads on his car blinked at me. Bruce pulled up into the short driveway in front of the house, then motioned me to pull around him and park behind the house in front of the detached garage. When I got out, he was walking up to me. Want to see something cool? he said. Sure. You might not appreciate it the way I do. When I found this house, I knew I had to stay. He walked over to the garage and opened the side door. Come on in. I followed him inside and had to stifle a gasp of awe. It was a science fiction collector's wet dream. There were toys and comic books and... Holy shit, I said. Look at that Romulan warbird. He grinned for the first time. Hell yeah, I knew I liked you. The model was around two feet wide and was displayed inside of a plexiglass cube in the center of the room. I went close to examine it. Is this a prop? I said, getting excited. Is this an original prop? Yeah, he said. I found the paperwork on it. There was an auction at Christie's a few years ago, and they sold off all the old Trek models. This one went for more than 25000 Holy shit, I said again. Can I touch it? Be my guest, he said. Just be careful. Don't break it or get too many fingerprints on it. It's one of my favorite things by far. When you're done, I have a phaser to show you. A real phaser? I smiled. From the show? From Deep Space Nine. The most underappreciated trek, in my opinion. No argument there, I said. We had a moment there. Nothing was said, but there was some bonding, or semblance of bonding, going on. He was loosening up, and he was starting to lose his tough guy voice. Bruce pointed past me to the far wall. On the shelf by the window there is a mint-conditioned blue snaggletooth. They're not really as rare as people used to think, but I've never seen one that pristine. I had one of those when I was a kid, I said. I played the hell out of it. I looked around, not sure what to go to next. It's so cool that this stuff is here in Clayfield. How did I not know about this? Some people are private like that, he said. They want to be alone with their things. Do you like comic books? Yeah, I said. I used to read them. Are you a DC or Marvel man? Marvel. He made a face. Nobody's perfect, I guess. Star Wars or Star Trek? Trek, of course. He grinned again. Kirk? or Picard. Picard. He frowned. I thought Kate Mulgrew did a respectable job as Captain Janeway, too, I added. You disgust me, he said, then laughed for the first time. <laughs> but kudos for knowing her name. Come on, let's go eat. Ten minutes later, Bruce and I were in the house having MREs and mixed drinks. He had a variety of alcoholic beverages and other ingredients along with measuring cups and spoons. A bartender's guidebook was open on the dining room table, and he followed the recipes exactly. The house was modest and had been decorated by someone with bad taste. 
There were a lot of frilly and flowery pillows and curtains and lots of pink and yellow. I didn't see any evidence of collectibles in the house, so I presumed the house was a woman's domain. This food isn't too bad, I said. I haven't had much experience with the MREs. I found a whole tractor trailer full of them, he said. I moved it and hid it so nobody would find it. I plan to go back for it later. There's enough food in there to last me a few years at least. It can't compete with home cooking, though. Did you have somebody? I asked with hesitation. I mean, somebody to make you home-cooked meals? You know, before? He downed the rest of his drink and started mixing another. Grams. She was the best cook. She stayed with me. I took care of her. In Atlanta? I asked. I'm from Central Florida. I'm from here, in Clayfield, I said. I know, he said. You were the museum director. How'd you know? I went in there, he said. Your picture is in that framed newspaper story hanging on the wall in your office. You look a little different now, but I could pick you out in a lineup. He finished mixing his drink and had a sip. How are you handling the alcohol? I said. What do you mean? We have to drink it so often, I replied. He shrugged. I don't mind it. There's enough variety to make it interesting. Are you concerned about addiction or health problems? He grinned. No, I'm not a wuss. Why? Are you? I shrugged. His grin turned smug. My pride almost pushed me into saying something about my ability to handle my liquor, but I let it slide. I thought it might be wise for me to let him think I was weak. Are you traveling alone? I asked. He paused and glared at me for an uncomfortable moment, then took my empty glass and started mixing me another drink. I'm traveling with a loose group. We're all lone wolves. We like to do our own thing, but we meet up from time to time and swap stories and women. We're heading west, but we're not in any hurry. You're not interested in settling down somewhere? Hell no, he said. We're nomadic. He pushed my drink across the table to me. Before the Seabees, he said, I had this poster in my room. It was a picture of all this badass gear like machine guns and big knives, and it said, The hardest part about the zombie apocalypse will be pretending I'm not excited. I remember seeing those, I said. Yeah. He sighed. Then it really happened. It wasn't what I thought it would be. Yeah, I said. It was better, he finished with a broad, goofy smile. Really? Hell yeah. It's like I woke up in a lucid dream, only it was really real. I can do anything I want. Yeah, I suppose, but... The world is ours, my brother, he said holding up his glass for a toast. Here's to being and staying excited. I picked up my newly mixed drink and clinked my glass against his. This has been some fun shit, hasn't it? He said. I mean, this whole sea beast thing. There have been moments, I replied. I want to show you something, he said. He left me and went into one of the bedrooms and returned with a gray plastic tote box. It was the kind that the lid opened like two doors on hinges and interlocked in the middle. He put the box on the table and opened it. This is some military shit I found in a crashed helicopter last week, he said, and pulled out two small rectangular packages in black plastic. On the outside of the packages, in yellow letters, it said, Charge Demolition M112. C4, I think, he said. I've never used the stuff, but I'm hanging on to it, in case one of my buds knows about it. There are only a couple of bricks in here. Then, there are these things. He put the C4 back into the box and pulled out two small black devices devoid of markings. I have a bunch of small ones like these, and a couple that are a little bigger. Are they cell phones? I asked. I think so. Look here, he said pointing to small reflective rectangles in the top. They have little solar panels in them. 
They'll power up and the screen will light up, but I can't get the display to give me numbers so I can call out. Who would you call? I said. I don't know, he said. Whoever gave out the phones, I guess. There are LEDs on them too, but I can't get them to light up. You can have one of them if you want it. He offered one of the small ones to me. Go ahead. I found twenty-two of them in the box. I took it. I didn't see the point in having it, but I didn't want to offend him. If nothing else, maybe I could pop out the little power source and use it for something else. Where was the helicopter? I said. I found one some time back over by the school in Farmtown. Yeah, he said. That's the one. There was a big crate in the back. It had all this great stuff in it. I wasn't able to get into it. Your loss. Check this out, he said, reaching into the tote again. He pulled out a squat cylinder about the size of a Christmas cookie tin. He grinned. That, my brother, is a magazine for an AA-12. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. He winked at me and said, I'll be right back. He left the room and came back with an odd-looking gun. Then he took the canister and shoved it into place on the underside of the weapon. It made it look sort of like a bulky Tommy gun. Fully automatic assault shotgun, he said. Never in a million years would I think I'd get to shoot one of these. Now, thanks to the end of the world, I have one of my very own. Wow, I said. Nice. You should see it go to work on the goons. It's like a meat grinder. Tomorrow I'll take you out and let you run a box of shells through it. It's going to give you a hard-on. Sounds like fun. He sat again and returned to his meal. I've come across all kinds of military shit, he said. I've played with some of it, and I've hid a lot of it. You never know when you'll need it. I've got several caches of shit between here and Atlanta. I think it's hilarious any time I come up on trucks or tanks or goon soldiers. Those fucktard jugheads and G.I. Joes didn't have what it took to survive. I outlasted all of them. Now their toys belong to me. And their women. Survival seems kind of random, I said. Men, women, old, young, big, small. Well, all of that will get sorted out eventually. It's not over by a long shot. You've got to be fit, and you've got to know how to handle yourself. Being young doesn't hurt either, but it isn't important. When he said fit, my eyes fell to his oversized gut. How old do you think I am? He asked, leaning back in his chair. Then he pointed at his face with both hands. I don't know, I said. Thirty-two? Twenty-nine? I am forty-one years old. No way. I'm a baby face, he said, returning to his meal. Graham's always said that. One time, I went to the store to buy cigarettes for a friend of mine, and they thought I had a fake ID. He pointed at his face again. Baby face. Maybe it was because of your name, I said. What's wrong with my name? Nothing, I said. It just sounds made up like John Smith or McLovin. My name is Bruce Lee. That's my name. I believe you, I said. Why didn't your friend buy their own cigarettes? He couldn't. He was only fifteen. It's a guy I play D&D &D with. Anyway, having a baby face isn't great for getting with the ladies. They like a rugged man, you know. You might find this hard to believe, but I never really had a girlfriend before. I didn't say anything. I wasn't sure what to say. But now I can be what I want to be. I have gotten so much ass since Canton B. Really? Hell yeah. What about that one girl you were looking for? Sarah? He grinned. Yeah. She had a sweet ass and tits like you would not believe. I felt the anger welling up at that, but I stifled it. And? I asked, hoping he'd give more information. And nothing. Stay away from her, he said. For one thing, she's mine. For another, she's a vamp. A vamp? I grinned. I've always been attracted to vamps. 
Fucking stay away from her, he yelled and slammed his fist on the table. Then he composed himself. Sorry, she, she really hurt me. I need to talk with her. What happened? I'd rather not go into it, he said. No offense, brother, but it's personal. Okay, sorry. I, I, um, so what comic books were you into, he said. Probably nothing good, since it's Marvel. Uh, well, I liked, hey, you know what? I stopped speaking and shrugged. Did you ever cosplay, he asked. You mean dress up and go to conventions? That's what I said. No, I said. I went to the Superman Festival up in Metropolis years ago. I saw some people doing that. The guy that used to live here had some serious cosplay shit. I only found one thing that fit me, but I bet the other stuff is about your size. I don't think so. I really... Come on, he said, standing. Let's do it, man. Let's open all these toys and comic books, too. It's not like they're worth anything anymore. I'm still eating, I said. Maybe later. Besides, I honestly haven't read comic books in years. That stuff in the garage is really cool, but dressing up seems... I didn't finish the sentence because of the change in his expression. What? He said defensively. Stupid? Childish? No, I said. Nothing. Never mind. He sat heavily and gave me a cold stare. Same old shit. I didn't mean anything, I said. I'm just not into it. Bikers put on all the leather and shit and people say that's cool. Those rednecks dress up in cowboy hats and boots and western overcoats, and people say that's cool. I put on my Star Trek The Original Series Chief Engineer's uniform, and they say I'm an immature geek. There's no difference. I guess, I said. I never did any of that, so... What about wearing football jerseys, huh? For that matter, what about fantasy football? How's that any different from D&D? &D? I've heard those arguments before, and I don't really like football, so you're preaching to the choir. Fucking Marvel Comics, he sneered. I should have expected you to be a tool. I stopped chewing my Italian beef, then nonchalantly let my hand fall under the table into the grip of my pistol. He noticed. Hands above the table, motherfucker, he said. What's wrong with you? What are you going to do? Are you going to shoot me over fantasy fucking football? I put my hand above the table and grabbed my fork. I started chewing again and shrugged. Just being cautious. Then I grinned and added, I thought maybe some Han and Greedo shit was about to go down. He gave me a blank stare. Then that broad, goofy smile returned. Shit. If anybody in this situation is Han, it's me. It sure as hell isn't you. And trust me, I will shoot first. I downed my drink and pushed my glass toward him. Another one of those would be great. You make a killer whatever that was. He took my glass, then started measuring ingredients in the measuring cups. He acted like his feelings were hurt. Oh, what the hell, I said flippantly. What kind of costumes does the guy have? Fuck you. He said, I don't want to do it anymore. Sure you do, I said. You're already doing it. You look just like the Punisher. Or were you going for Steven Seagal? He grinned a little. This isn't cosplay. This is just me on a normal day. Post-apocalypse, that is. Well, you do look like a badass, I said. Even if it is a Marvel character. The ladies love this look, he said. I should have dressed like this before. Here's your drink. But really, what costumes does he have? Nah, I know you don't want to do it, he said. Then he added in a sassy tone. Besides, he's all out of Captain Janeway uniforms, so... I really do now, I said, trying to sound sincere. You've piqued my interest. What sort of costumes are there? He made a face like he was bored with the idea. A lot of cliché shit. 
He has a red shirt uniform from the original series. He has the Luke Skywalker outfit, the black one from Return of the Jedi. He has Batman, but it's the Adam West one. And there's a Stormtrooper helmet, but it's homemade and kind of lame. There's a Klingon uniform, but it's the only one that fits me, because it has adjustable straps, so I'd have to wear that one. Chapter 26 The living room was lit with the flames of candles and lamps like a Klingon temple. One could almost hear the utterance of guttural prayers to Kalis. The Klingon warrior entered boldly with his batleth. Je kehek, he shouted. Batman stood by the table in the dining room in his blue tights, cape, mask, and bright yellow utility belt, with a drink in his hand, trying his best not to smile. On the table were vintage Planet of the Apes action figures and an ad at poised as if in battle. There's no room in Gotham City for the likes of you, Klingon. Then uncontrollable giggles erupted. You must make room, human. Batman continued to giggle. He took a sip, swayed, and then pushed a button on his utility belt. A little grappling hook shot a few inches into the air, then landed on the carpet, pulling a tangle of string out after it. This brought Batman to his knees with laughter, causing him to spill his drink. The Klingon swung his batleth and ripped into the yellow sofa with the pink rose print. Ye jatko, the Klingon bellowed. Batman rolled to the floor, laughing. The Klingon then swung his batleth a second time, hitting the ceiling fan and taking out a lamp and television. Stop! You're killing me, I yelled, in the agony of uncontrollable laughter. Bruce stalked over and stood over me. His wig with attached forehead ridges wasn't quite straight on his head. You are drunk, human. Your species is weak. I couldn't quit laughing. Bruce's arms dropped to his side. Really, man, you're super drunk. This isn't even fun. You have no idea how much fun this is for me. Really? He smiled. See? I told you. I knew you would like it. <laughs> yeah, I said. And look, my utility belt has a pouch for my new cell phone. I guess I should have loosened up some before the world went to hell. He helped me up, and we both sat at the table and poured ourselves another drink. I should have too, he said. Especially with girls. There was this woman I really liked where I worked. I wish I would have asked her out while I had the chance. No regrets, I said. Did I tell you I was with a stripper? No shit. Yeah, well, I didn't know she was a stripper at the time, and I was the only one that didn't get to see her naked. Bruce slammed his hand on the table and laughed. I joined him. I laughed until my sides hurt. She's dead now, I said in a sudden, serious tone. Her name was Jen. His expression sobered. Sorry to hear that, brother. My girl's name was Tanya. I have no idea what happened to her. She might be alive somewhere. Maybe you'll get your chance to ask her on that date, I said. It's good that we can sit here and drink like this, he said. Like men. What's more manly than Batman and a Klingon warrior, I said. He lifted his glass. To men. To men, I said, lifting my own glass. He took a drink and set his glass on the table. Then he took off his wig and scratched his head. If you're desperate for a woman, there's something you can do, he said. I never said I was desperate, I said. It would just be nice, that's all. Well, anyway, one thing you can do, and you might think this sounds bad, but one thing you can do is find a woman that caught the virus but isn't full-blown goon. There's not as much of that anymore, but they're still around. I'll find you one. 
You just have to make sure you tie her down good so she can't claw and bite you and make sure you use a condom. They can be really good, and it's not like it's wrong because their mind is gone anyway. I had memories of corn dogs, poor captive tied to a bed. I frowned and looked away. I met a guy that did that, I said. I prefer my women to be in their right mind and willing. Don't knock it till you've tried it, he said. The newly turned are really warm because they still have that fever. I think it makes it better. I had a different woman almost every day those first two weeks. I shook my head. You're killing my buzz. He seemed uncomfortable with my reaction to the conversation. He knew he'd crossed a line and shared too much. I'm not a weirdo, he blurted out. I've had healthy women, too. Okay, I said. Whatever. It's just not for me. I'll bet I could change your mind, he said. Doubt it, I replied softly. I think I'm going to go crash. I'll probably just sleep in my truck tonight. Don't be a fool, he said. Take one of the bedrooms. I was just trying to help you get laid, that's all. That's what friends do. You're too drunk to go outside now anyway. I am not that drunk, he laughed. <laughs> Take the room at the end of the hall. You're going to have a hell of a hangover in the morning. I stood, swayed, and sat again. Bruce laughed again and got up. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Wayne, he said. Let's get you into the bat cave. He lifted me under my arm and stumbled with me toward the bedroom. On the way, we passed a mirror. The sight of 1960s Batman being helped to bed by a Klingon was hilarious, but I didn't have it in me to laugh anymore. The hallway was almost completely dark. When we got to our destination, he propped me against the wall, then opened the door. The bedroom was illuminated by several candles. Seated on the floor was Princess Leia in her skimpy slave girl clothes, I blinked twice, sure that the alcohol was causing a hallucination. She looked up at us, then slowly stood. She was wearing a dog collar, and it was chained to an eye bolt in the floor. Her hands were cuffed. What do you think? Bruce said. Every man's fantasy. Am I right? Where'd she come from? Has she been here the whole time? I told you I could change your mind, he said. She's got the sea bees, but she's not a goon yet. She's perfect. There's not a mark on her except for a bite on her ankle. If he hadn't told me, I wouldn't have guessed she was sick. How did you get her into those clothes? I found a trank gun at the zoo in Memphis, he said, and patted the pistol on his belt, which I had mistaken for part of the Klingon costume. It would probably kill a normal person, but it knocks them right out for a while. I took her down a couple of days ago up near Riverton, and as soon as I got her clothes off her, I knew she'd be perfect for that Leia slave costume. I turned and faced him. In the candlelight, his goofy smile looked sinister. Don't get any closer than that mark, he said, pointing to a white line spray-painted on the hardwood floor. That's where she runs out of chain. Give me a second, and I'll restrain her better so we can move her. What for? What do you think? No, I... No. Hell no. Why not? You don't like what you see? She's beautiful. She's infected. It's Princess Leia, man. Princess fucking Leia. Damn it, now you've ruined that movie for me. Now every time I see it, I'm going to think of this. You won't ever see that movie again anyway, he said. I even tranked her again this morning and gave her a bath. You're a sicko. Sarah was right about you, I said. I shoved him hard against the wall and started walking toward the living room. Say what now? He said. I kept walking, but I didn't get far. He grabbed my cape yanked me backward, and slammed me against the wall. Sarah was right about what? He sneered in my face. What the hell would you know about Sarah? 
In my inebriated state, I was having trouble remembering what Sarah had told me about him and what he had told me Sarah had said, if anything. Differentiating between the two would be very important. Nothing, I said. How would I know? How could I know? He glared at me a moment. Then he grabbed my shoulders and turned me toward the zombie Leia again. Naga chuk, human. I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to go to bed. He bellowed and pushed me back toward the living room. I tumbled and my cape flew up over my head. Before I could recover from my fall, he had grabbed my cape and was dragging me. He lifted me to my feet, twirled me around, and then shoved me toward the dining room table. I couldn't get my balance, and I plowed face first across the tabletop, through all the liquor bottles, bartending supplies, the tote of military cell phones, and collector toys. The suit's fabric provided little friction, and I shot over the edge and spilled to the other side. I rolled and pulled the cape from my face to see the big Klingon standing over me. I looked around for something to use as a weapon. The Dr. Zaius action figure was by my leg. I grabbed it and held it like a knife. Then Bruce kicked, and his boot caught me just below my left eye. For an instant, my head seemed to fill with white light. Then pain shot through to the back of my head. I clutched my face and fell to my back. Blood was coming out of my nose. Then he had both of my feet and dragged me again. I opened my eyes. I was beneath the mangled ceiling fan in the living room. Bruce came into view again. He was holding my clothes. I'm going in there to have me some princess, he said. Get out of the bat suit before you get blood on it. You're not worthy to wear it anyway. He dropped the clothes in my face. After you've changed, you can leave. I was wrong about you, and... He stopped talking abruptly. I pulled the clothes off my face to see why. He was bending over to pick up something on the floor. When he rose, I saw the note. Sarah's note had fallen out of my pocket. That's mine, I said. Give it back. He opened it and started reading it. Give it to me, I said, and tried to get up. He put a boot on my chest and pushed me down again. This note is for me, he said. Why did you have it? Why didn't you tell me about it? I didn't answer him. He roared in anger and pulled the pistol on his hip. I threw my clothes up in the air, then grabbed his foot and gave it a hard twist. He hopped back but didn't fall. I rolled away from him and attempted to stand, but I stepped on my cape and fell again. Then he fired his weapon and hit me in the back, between the shoulders. Chapter 27 the window threw a rhombus of sunlight on the floor. The warm light crept along the carpet to my sprawled, unconscious body. Outside, a horn honked a steady beat. The horn was annoying, but it was the light that woke me. My face hurt, my back hurt, my head hurt, and I thought I might puke. I was pleased to find that my head was still attached to my body. I pushed myself up to hands and knees. There was a spot of not-quite-dried blood in the floor beneath me, and that scared me. I couldn't breathe through my nose. Then I remembered that Bruce's kick to my face had caused a nosebleed. I got to my feet and went to the closest mirror. Adam West looked back at me. Crusty black blood had dried in my nostrils and on my upper lip. The sharp pain in my back hurt worse when I moved. I turned so my back was facing the mirror and looked over my shoulder. The dart from the tranquilizer gun was still there, pinning my cape to me. It was in that sweet spot between the shoulders that is impossible to reach. I still tried several times to reach it. Finally, I just tugged on the cape until the dart pulled out. Shit! 
that hurt. I rubbed my eyes and tried to think. What the hell is up with the noise? I went to the window and looked outside. There was a crowd of zombies gathered around my truck and scattered around the outside of the house. The clothes I'd had on the night before, along with my holster and pistol, were outside, piled on top of the cab of my truck. I didn't see the yellow muscle car of doom out there. My guess was that Bruce had set off the alarm on the truck and left, but I needed to search the house to be sure he was gone. I looked around for a weapon. The batleth was propped against the recliner. I picked it up and was surprised by its weight. This was no plastic toy. The handle was wood, and the blade was metal. I touched the edge. It was sharp. Fukya human, I said. I went into each room, my batleth ready. I found each room unoccupied. I saved the bedroom at the end of the hall for last. I turned the knob and pushed the door open. Princess Leia was already standing. We regarded each other in silence. The only change from the night before was that her hair had fallen some in front and hung down in her face. For some reason, it made her even more attractive. Her top lip curled back, and she hissed. You know what sucks? I said to her, and stepped just shy of the line on the floor. The shitty thing is that the future of humanity, if there is one, won't include any contributions from you. Instead, the DNA and genes or whatever that are passed on will be from shitheads, cavemen like Bruce and Corndog. And me. Well, if there are any women left, that is. She ran at me. The chain snapped taut, but she continued until her bare feet pawed the air, and she slammed down on her back. She lay there gagging against her collar. I wondered if she'd broken her own neck. She squirmed, and a puddle of urine spread beneath her. Damn shame. I stepped out shut the door, and went back to the living room. Bruce was definitely gone. I looked at my watch. It was twenty minutes before ten. The meeting with Pastor Andrew at the old shopping plaza would be underway soon. Bruce knew about the meeting. Sarah wanted Bruce to know about it, which meant... Hell, I had no idea what that meant. I had to get there to stop whatever ugliness was about to go down, or participate in it, or something. All I knew for sure was that there were angry people showing up for a meeting, and I needed to be one of them. The AR-15 and bug-out weapons were in my truck, but there was no way I could get in there with the crowd around the truck and garage. I looked at my watch again. I didn't have time. I had to go. I went to the windows again for a look. The north side of the house, the side with the driveway and garage, was the most infested side. There were zombies on the lawn on the south side of the house, but I thought if I left the house in a hard run, I could pick my way through them and get clear. I took a moment to clean my nose. I pulled at the Batman mask, but it was so snug, and my face was swollen where Bruce had kicked me. It hurt like crazy. I decided to leave it and cut it off when I had more time. Then I grabbed a small bottle of water, had a quick drink, and left via the front door. I only used my bat left twice in my escape from the immediate area. The things weren't really that interested in me because they had honed in on the sound of the horn. By the time they noticed me and made up their mind to come after me, I was past them. That end of town had been blown to hell by the tanks weeks before. There was a lot of rubble, burned-out cars and fallen poles and trees— a few houses and businesses had survived unharmed, but not many. Even if I found a car, there would be too much debris on the road to get it out. My only option was to hoof it for two or three blocks until things cleared up. My head was throbbing with every heartbeat, and I had an intense pain behind my eyes. I was going to have to lay off the drinking some. Alcohol, the thing that was keeping me alive, was killing me. The cape produced a lot of drag and slowed me down. 
Unfortunately, it was sewn into the suit. It wasn't lost on me that if there had been anyone left in the world watching, I would have been a sight. A hungover Batman carrying a batleth, dodging and hurtling obstacles on a zombie-populated rubble-strewn street would have been an awesome thing to witness. I grinned a little, thinking about it, as I leapt over a fallen streetlight and felt the cape flap beneath me. Then the thought came to me that Batman ought to have a batleth. It was a batleth, after all. I looked down at the weapon and noticed something I'd never noticed before. The damn thing sort of resembled the bat symbol. Whoa, I whispered. Holy Klingon coincidence, Batman. Either my mind was blown or I was still a little drunk. I was sure I had just made a huge discovery that needed to be mauled over and debated in the internet forums. Batman has a bat left. Your argument is invalid, human. Too bad the only person left on Earth to appreciate my discovery was a psychopath with a ninja sword and a grudge against my girlfriend. I entered an area where there was more road than there were holes. The buildings were in better condition, as were the cars. In a nearby driveway, I saw a red jeep that looked promising. I ran over to it and was disappointed to find it occupied by a whole family of zombies, including a toddler in a car seat. I was about to leave when I looked into the open garage and spied a blue moped. I went in and looked it over. The front tire was a little low, but not flat. It didn't look like it was missing any parts. I opened the fuel tank, then rocked the bike. Gasoline sloshed inside. I had never ridden one before, but I didn't think it would be that difficult to start. I was wrong. I pushed buttons and turned knobs. I looked for a place for a key. None of it worked. I was frustrated, but it was a moped. I could just ride it like a bicycle. Wrong again. The pedals were really difficult to push. Just as I was about to get off and run some more, my foot slipped on the pedal and caused it to go backward. The engine made a noise. I turned the pedal, stood, and pushed down hard. The engine sputtered. I tried again, and it came to life. It was loud, like a chainsaw. I hooked my bat lift on the back of the bike, and out I went. I checked my watch. It was five minutes after ten. The old shopping plaza was on the south side of town near Walmart and Lowe's Home Improvement. Two miles, maybe more. I was going to be late, but hopefully not too late. I buzzed down 8th Street, passed the museum, took a left on Broadway, dodged a cluster of zombies, took a right at the courthouse, passed the east side of the First Baptist Church, leaned onto Water Street, and leaned again onto South 6th Street. I was hunched over the handlebars, my cape was flapping, and I was eating bugs. Chapter 28 South 6th Street became Burger Road. The abandoned cars and undead were more numerous. I maneuvered through them and zipped into the parking lot at almost fifteen minutes after ten. There was a group of zombies following me, but they weren't fast enough to be a threat. The lot was large and uncluttered. The old shopping plaza had been the hottest spot in town when I was a kid, and at that time it was not uncommon to find the lot nearly full. Then, several years ago, the big chain stores moved down the road, and the stores that were left just didn't attract the large crowds. I used to think all that asphalt was a big waste of space, but now I was grateful for the emptiness, because I could see any potential threats. This was probably the reason why Pastor Andrew had chosen this location for a meeting. Between the shoe store and the movie theater was a circle of cars. I did a quick look around for the yellow muscle car and the RV, but I didn't see either of them. However, I did see a yellow car on the far end of the lot. It was far away, but it looked like someone was inside it behind the wheel. I presumed it was Sarah waiting to meet Bruce, as her letter had indicated. When I got closer to the circle of cars, I noticed a man and a woman inside. 
They were both wearing masks over their noses and mouths, and they were armed. They seemed relaxed. They watched me, Batman on a moped, drive around the circle and never once pointed their guns at me. I stopped, killed the engine, and put down the kickstand. The two in the circle stared at me but didn't speak. I lifted my hand in a tentative wave. Andrew, I said. The man returned the wave and chuckled. Is it Halloween? Sorry about the costume, I said. It's a long story. Are you alone? he asked. That's my friend over there, I said, and pointed to the yellow car. Andrew looked at the car, then studied me a moment. The car wasn't here yesterday, but there ain't nobody in it. What you see behind the wheel is a mannequin. I squinted toward the car again, confused. I think he's crazy, Andrew, the woman said. He's dressed funny, and he thinks a mannequin is his friend. I looked out toward the road. The zombies that had followed the sound of my engine were arriving. May I come in there with you? I can explain. Of course, he said. I dismounted the bike, heard the crack of gunfire, and then gasoline streamed out of a hole in the moped's fuel tank. I immediately ducked down. What the hell are you doing? I yelled. I'm unarmed. It wasn't us, Andrew called back. Another shot went off and hit the moped's seat. There's no cover over there. Andrew yelled to me. Get in here with us. Another bullet hit the asphalt behind me. I scrambled toward the cars, slid across the hood of a Honda, and landed inside the circle tangled up in my cape. The woman helped me up, then pulled me against a car door on the other side. There was another shot, and a bullet punched a hole in the windshield. Pastor Andrew was peering up over a car with binoculars. They're over there. On the other side, Dan, he said into a radio. On the roof of that jewelry store. I see him, a voice came back. It's a woman and a man. I can take him. Whoa, I said. Stop. Who is that? My brother is on the roof of the theater, the woman said. He's a good shot. No, I said. Stop him. I think it's Sarah. Stop him. I stood up and waved my arms. Don't shoot. The woman grabbed my cape and yanked me down again. Another bullet hit the car behind us. Stay down, dumbass, she said. Make it a warning shot, Dan. Try not to hit him. Andrew looked over his shoulder at me, then turned back to his binoculars. Dan fired twice. There was silence. The radio hissed then. They're backing down. Let's move this while we can. We're moving, Andrew said. He clipped the radio to his belt. Then he and the woman ran to the other side of the circle and climbed into a blue car. I stood and looked toward the jewelry store. If Sarah was over there, I wanted to get over there, too. Because of my Batman get-up, she had probably mistaken me for Bruce Lee, even though I was shorter and lacked his girth. The zombies were at the circle by that time, and some of them were reaching over the cars for me. Get in the car! the woman yelled to me. It's not safe here. I had to get the Batman mask off so Sarah would know it was me. I pulled on my mask again and winced in pain. Now, damn it, or we're leaving you. Reluctantly, I climbed into the back seat with her. There was a duffel bag and a shotgun between us. As soon as my door was shut, Pastor Andrew cut the car out of the circle and wheeled to the front of the theater. Dan ran out of the building carrying a rifle with a big scope and got in the front seat. Pastor Andrew stepped on the gas, curved back toward the shopping plaza, then around the side and connected with a side street. The woman pulled down her mask and glared at me. She was maybe five years older than me. She had some gray in her dark hair and a few lines around her eyes and mouth, but she was very attractive. Who the hell is Sarah and why was she shooting at you? she said. Her brother turned in his seat to look at me, and Pastor Andrew's eyes kept bouncing up to the rearview mirror. She's my girlfriend, and, oh, well, that explains everything, she said. Her brother laughed. No, I said. She thinks I'm someone else. 
So it's Batman that she hates, her brother said, and laughed again. Pastor Andrew took a hard left, and we all had to brace ourselves in the turn. There's this other guy in town. She thought I was him. Why don't you take that silly mask off? The woman said. I can't, I said. My face is swollen and it hurts. If you have some scissors, I could cut it off. The woman bent forward and pulled a knife from her boot. Hold still, she said. Pastor Andrew took a right turn and we braced ourselves again. Take it easy, Andrew, she said. I've got my knife out back here. I don't think so, I said. Let's wait until we stop. Oh, hush and hold still. Better watch her, Dan said with a grin. He held up his hand to show me it was missing the pinky finger. Look what she did to me. Danny, turn around. Dan laughed and faced front. She grabbed the mask and peeled it away from my face, just enough to get the knife between. I shut my eyes. The cold steel of the blade pressed against my face. Then I heard the sound of the fabric tearing away. There, she said. You should be able to get it off now. I reached up and grabbed the pointed bat ear and gave it a good yank. There was the relief of air hitting my sweaty head. Thanks, I said, and looked over at her. She had an odd look on her face. Well, look at you, she grinned. You made it. Huh? You don't recognize me. I looked at her more closely, but I couldn't place her. You worked in the museum, didn't you? She asked. Yeah. I was there when it all went down. I took those awful shoes from that Red Cross display. They hurt my feet like hell. You're the woman in the mask, I said, almost in a whisper. Woman in the mask? I never knew your name, so that's what I always called you. She grinned again. That sounds so mysterious. I could be a Bond girl or something. I never saw her face that day, and even if I had, I don't know if I would have remembered what she looked like. I had a lot to process that day. I wondered what happened to you, she said. You stole my phone. It got shitty reception anyway. I did you a favor. She reached over and patted my hand. The car slowed. I looked out the window. We were headed north on the bypass and about to connect with East Broadway. Where are we going? I asked. Back to our place, Pastor Andrew said. Cheryl, can he be trusted? Yeah, he's a good guy, I guess. He's dressed like Batman, ain't he? You okay with that? Andrew said to me. Well, I don't want you to drop me here, I said, but I would like to find Sarah. I'll let you talk to her on the radio broadcast if you want to, he said. Maybe you could tell her to stop shooting. Chapter 29 They lived in the airport. It was equipped with solar power and a backup diesel generator. The terminal was small when compared to other airports, but there was only one runway, and the traffic before Canton B consisted of day-trippers and single-engine craft, small courier flights, and crop dusters. Short-range commuter and cargo flights took off from Riverton. The group had installed a chest freezer, clothes washer and dryer, and a full-sized refrigerator freezer. There was also air conditioning, a microwave, hot water, and a huge TV with a stack of movies and television program season box sets. The living quarters ain't ideal, but there ain't many of us, and we're outside as much as we can be, Cheryl said as she gave me a tour. After the ice storm, the airport got an overhaul so to be better prepared for emergencies and power outages. It was government funds, but don't mention that to Danny because he'll give you an earful about FEMA and liberals in the government and handouts. He still does it, even though they've all been gone for months. Anyway, they installed the solar and the diesel. There were some cots and emergency rations. There is a locker room and shower. It worked out well for us. 
There was another generator on a truck, and we used that to power the equipment at the radio station. We walked past a couple of closed doors, and she stopped by an open door. The bathroom is right in there. You can take a shower if you want. I'll go find you some new clothes and an ice pack for your face. Thanks, I said. She lingered there, then said, You saved my ass that morning. I appreciate that. No, I replied. You saved mine. If you hadn't been there to fill me in on everything and tell me what to do, I would never have made it. You can thank Danny for that, she nodded. I just told you to do what he did. He's going to outlive all of us. I looked past her into the main lounge slash reception area to make sure no one was around. You seem like an honest person, I said. Is everything good here? We've had problems with other groups. We want to start over, she said. You won't have problems with us, but it looks like we might have problems if we get involved with you. It looks like you come with problems. What happened today... I was going to explain, but I found that I couldn't. Talk to Andrew about it, she said. You don't call him Pastor Andrew? I don't go to church, she said. I answer to me, and I answer to God. I don't need a middleman. So is Andrew in charge here? She shrugged. I don't know. I don't care. I don't do that. He talks on the radio, and he reads the Bible. Danny and the others like the devotionals. Then what about... Get a shower, she interrupted. You can talk to Andrew when you're done. I have some chores to do. After a hot shower, I sat on a couch in the lounge area enjoying the air conditioning. I was in a new pair of Levi's, a new t-shirt, and a slightly used pair of Nikes. They assured me they had found the shoes in a house and had not taken them off the feet of a zombie. The shoes smelled fine, so I believed them. Cheryl provided me with an ice pack for my face and an additional special treat. It was a green ice pop, one of those popsicles in the long tubes. I hadn't seen one of those since I was a kid. All three sat in the room with me. I had not met the others in the group, and I didn't see them around. Pastor Andrew was thin and in his sixties with white thinning hair. He kind of reminded me of Fred Rogers from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Danny was broad, with a thick neck. He had a crew cut and rosy cheeks. He looked like he could have been a football player in a Norman Rockwell painting. I had an urge to call him Bubba. Cheryl was quiet, but I could tell she was a firecracker. She had a confidence about her that made me think that she knew she was the smartest person in the room, and I suspected she probably was. When you didn't talk with us on the two-way, we were concerned that you hadn't found the package we dropped, Pastor Andrew said. We found it, I said, but we had problems. I tried to explain everything that had happened over the past few days and fill in enough backstory that they could understand. I don't know if I was successful or if they just didn't care to understand. So... We need to be worried over Bruce Lee, Andrew said flatly. Maybe, I said. He seems to be fixated on Sarah, and he showed me some military stuff he'd found, like a powerful gun and some cell phones. I took the cell phone out of my pocket and held it up so they could see. He told me he had access to more military weapons. He sounds dangerous. He's unpredictable, I said. But look, he's not a zombie, so... So what? Andrew said. You said he was forcing himself on him. Yeah, I said. It's just that I don't want to kill healthy men. I didn't mention the healthy men I'd killed before. He ain't healthy, son, Andrew said. He's sick. He has a mental sickness. That ain't no different than if he was raping animals. We wouldn't let that stand, neither, would we? No. Does that phone work? Cheryl asked. I handed it over to her. You can turn it on, but that's about it. She looked it over and passed it to Dan. 
Well, let's just pray that I can reason with the young man, Andrew said. Maybe I can lead him to the Lord. I shrugged and mumbled, Lord Vader, maybe. That's disrespectful, Dan said. Sorry. Oh, it's all right, Andrew said. I think what Dan is trying to say is that now more than ever we should turn our focus and affection toward the Lord. He's the only one that can pull us out of this, and it can't do nothing but hurt to be sacrilegious. Joking is fine, but like the word says, there is a time to laugh and a time to mourn. Right now, it is more important that we humble ourselves and mourn the sins that brought this calamity on us. I looked over at Cheryl, and she gave me an almost imperceptible shake of her head to let me know not to continue the conversation. Okay, I said. In your broadcast, you said you wanted help here. What is your plan? Clayfield is a lovely town, Andrew said. I grew up here. It's a lovely little town. We'd all love to preserve it if we could. What we'd like to do is clear the downtown area. Right now it is more comfortable for us to live here at the airport, but we can make one of the buildings on the court square suit us with some work. We'll still use the airport as long as we need to. Yeah, but how do you plan to clear the town? Kind of what we did at the cinema when we circled the wagons, but on a larger scale. We'll block the streets with cars. That will serve as our temporary wall. There was a group in Riverton that was trying something similar, but they didn't make it, God help them. He sighed, then continued. We'll clear an area and expand. I would think in a few weeks we could close off several blocks in downtown. Then we'll work on doing something more permanent with a wall or fence. There are many places where the buildings themselves will serve as sections of the wall, so it won't be as difficult as it might sound. We'll need to get started soon, Dan said to me. I don't know if you've noticed, but some of the fuel is going bad. I have some stabilizer that will extend the life, but eventually, in a few months, it's going to be bicycles and horses around here. We might find fuel that will still work, but it'll be chancy. Why haven't you already started? I said. You've all been together here for a while, right? No, Andrew said. Gail, Laney, and I have been together almost since the beginning. We had some others with us, too. We met... Tim back in April. We were living out near Belfast for a while. Things got bad for us, and we lost the others. Dan and Cheryl found us about two weeks ago, and were kind enough to invite us to live with them here and share their electricity and running water. As far as getting started, we have started. A few days ago, we secured a building on the west side of the court square. Tim, Laney, and Gail are there right now trying to install solar panels on the roof. Really, we feel like it was a sign from the Lord that we heard your gunfire. We knew it was the Lord bringing us help the way he brought the animals to Noah. I'm happy to help, I said. I want to preserve Clayfield, too. I don't want to be negative, but it sounds like we're building a prison for ourselves. No, he replied. Think of it as a haven. It will be like one of the walled cities of old, or maybe a fort. First Baptist will be a beacon of hope and safety. Dan told us your farm had a fence around it. It's the same thing. It will be a place of safety away from the dead where we can move around unharmed. I know the dead have been hanging on, but I can't see that continuing much longer. Pastor Andrew smiled. It seemed forced and fake. Then it will protect us from the gangs. We've had the misfortune of seeing what they do. Well, I'm not sure if any of this will do any good, 
but I'll help you. Wonderful news. Do you think we can count on your friends? Yeah, I said. I'll need to talk to them first. Sarah was upset the last time I saw her. Losing a friend can do that, Andrew said. We've all been through that too much. Chapter 30 At five o'clock, Pastor Andrew pointed at me. That was my signal to talk. I cleared my throat and leaned in close to the big foam-covered microphone. Sarah and Grant, I said, feeling self-conscious. I thought my voice sounded different, sort of like Bruce Lee's tough guy voice. I hope you're listening. I looked up at Andrew. He gave me an encouraging nod. I, well, that was me in the Batman costume. I hope you thought I was someone else and that you weren't trying to shoot me. I looked at Andrew again. He motioned for me to keep talking. Even if you did think I was someone else, don't do that again. Your, um, intended target was probably watching and knows what you have planned. I have to go back out to the house tomorrow morning. You meet me there. That is all. I'm going to turn it back over to Andrew now. Andrew smiled at me and pushed a button on the console in front of him. Good afternoon, everyone. Pastor Andrew here. That was a good friend, getting a message out to some more friends. I thought we could return to our usual broadcasts today. I'll give you a word from the Lord, and then I'll play a couple of songs. As always, if you want to meet with us, you can do so on Tuesdays and Fridays at 10 in the a.m out at the old shopping center on Burger Road. He opened his Bible and leafed through the pages. We'll pick up where we left off in Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 1. There was a knock on the studio window. I looked up, and Cheryl was motioning me out. I gave Andrew a little wave and left the room. When I went out into the lobby... I could still hear Andrew talking through speakers mounted on the outside of the sound studio, but the volume was low and easily ignored. You don't want to sit in there, she said. It's kind of dull. Is anyone out there listening? I said. Probably not, she said. Here, I'll buy you a drink. She walked over to an RC cola machine near the front door. There was a bucket of quarters on the floor. She got some out of the bucket and fed them in. I hope you like Sundrop, she said as she pushed the button. She handed me the green and yellow can. It's cold, I said. Yep, I've been trying to convince the others to stock it with beer, but Andrew says we might enjoy drinking it too much if we did. She rolled her eyes. Maybe you should advertise that you're doing broadcasts, I said. Put some signs up around town and outside of town, too. If there are any people out there, they'll have to go out sometimes for supplies. Right now, they don't know to tune in. I thought of that, she said, but I didn't mention it to them. The thing is, I don't think doing these radio shows is a very good idea. It could attract undesirables. Danny and I had a little trouble with some looters, and I don't want a repeat of that. It might be different if we were on a ham radio, but this is a station. Any idiot can look up the address in the phone book. I think we've been fortunate that we haven't been discovered. How do you feel about walling off the town? I don't see the point, she said. I'm a sentimental gal, but I think it's a waste of time. I think we should shut the radio station down, use the terminal as a base, and just wait the things out. They're falling apart anyway. This will all be over by Christmas. Once they've all rotted away, we can go in and restart the town then. Probably, I said. Definitely, she countered. The undead are a nuisance, but they aren't our real threat anymore. The real problem now is the looters and gangs. I know for a fact that at least three groups from out of town have blown through Clayfield. They take what they want 
and they make a mess. Some of them are heavily armed with military weapons. Hell, for all I know, they could be military. There are some good people, too, and good people need to band together, but it's just too risky to advertise. I wish Danny and the others would see that. Nicholas Somerville was trying to get people together in the beginning, I said. He had me believing we could retake the town. I know now it wasn't really possible. There weren't enough of us, and there are less of us now. We can do it, she said. We might not be able to keep up with it all, but we can start again. I think what Andrew has planned is a good idea, but I think we should make it smaller and wait a few months. We need to be smart about it. Tell me about north of the river, I said. Andrew said you and Dan flew over. It looks bad, she said. I don't know what happened there, but it looks bad. Mr. Somerville went west, I said. He went to Missouri by boat. He never came back. I've heard that different cities were nuked, Nashville and Jackson, Mississippi. I don't know, she said. We didn't fly south because we knew it had all gone to shit down there. I don't know what it looks like when a nuke goes off except what I've seen on TV, but there were places in Illinois that might have qualified. It could be they torched it to burn them up. But it was napalm or something. Danny and I have talked about using the crop duster to spray gasoline on the big crowds, then dropping a flare on them, but we knew the fire could get out of hand. The door opened, and Dan came in the building. He was carrying a shotgun and a toolbox. We might want to find another power source for the station, he said. That generator is acting up. Everything is still working, Cheryl said. We just bought a cold pop. It's making noises, Cheryl. It don't sound right. So I figure it's about to go out, and fixing it is above my pay grade. It's been running solid for two weeks straight. We don't need it anyway, she said. Nobody's listening out there. I sat, and then, through the speakers and interfering with Andrew's broadcast, there was an irregular beeping noise. Before Canton B, I'd heard the noise many times through my home computer and stereo speakers. It was the sound of a cell phone signal cutting in. Dan, Cheryl, and I looked at each other in surprise. Then I pulled the little device Bruce had given me from my pant pocket. A tiny green LED was lit on the top. Are you getting a call? Cheryl asked. Or did you butt dial somebody? It didn't ring or vibrate, I said. I tapped it and held it up to my ear. Hello? I waited and listened, but there was nothing. Then the chirping in the station's speakers stopped, and we could hear Andrew speaking again. Weird, Dan said. Let me have that. I'll leave it here for Gail, so she can take a look. She knows about gadgets. She'll probably stop by and look over the equipment when she gets back from town. Maybe she can figure out how to answer it, or use it to call out. Don't matter, Cheryl said. There ain't nobody left to call. By dinner time, the rest of the group had returned. We all sat at a long table in a boardroom at the airport and ate green bean casserole. Tim was in his early twenties, thin and tan with a patchy beard. Other than introductions, he didn't speak at all during the meal. Laney did enough talking for both of them. She was at least ten years older than Tim and the dominant personality in the relationship. She was tall, big-boned, but not fat, and loud. Her breasts were so large she might have tipped over had it not been for her generous backside to keep her balanced. Gail was younger than the other two and just a wisp. Gail knows her stuff, Andrew said. She's overseeing the solar panel installation. She's a real crackerjack. Gail blushed. It's just things I learned from my dad, and... Tim knows electrical, Laney said. He's doing a lot of it. He was thinking about being a journeyman once. Tim cleared his throat, but didn't look up from his plate. How'd it go today, Gail? Andrew asked. 
We got one section of lights to work on the top floor, but all the- She hooked them up wrong, Laney interrupted. It took Tim an hour to trace the problem. I don't think we can power the whole building with the panels we have right now, Gail said, ignoring Laney's interruption. I think we should focus on setting up a living area in one section, then add more as we really need it. It might be a good idea, Dan said. We should go ahead and insulate the space, too. Tim says there is plenty of power, Laney said. Gail just had it hooked up wrong. Dan, do you think you could go out there with me tomorrow and look it over? Gail asked. When she said it, she blushed. I knew it was more than just an invitation to check her work. What's he going to do? Laney said. He never thought about being a journeyman. He was just a grease monkey that dusted crops. All she wants is another pair of eyes, Dan said. Ain't that right, Gail? Another pair would be nice, Gail said. Do you know what it takes to be a journeyman? Laney said. A whole lot more than a pair of eyes. I'd love to hear the qualifications of a journeyman, Laney, Cheryl said. In fact, I'd love to hear what one is. Don't sweat it, Cheryl, Dan said. It's just Laney being Laney. She doesn't even know what it is, Cheryl said. But she keeps saying the word like it's the damn end-all, be-all. Laney looked at Tim. Are you going to let them get away with this? No need to bicker, Pastor Andrews said and took a sip of wine. We're all disciples of Christ. The room got quiet, and everyone ate for a while. Tell us about Sarah, Laney said to me. Do you love her? I stopped mid-chew and looked around. Everyone was looking at me. Yeah, I said. I mean, yeah. You know, there have been some complications, stuff happening. Yeah. You sound like you don't know, Laney said. Tim knew the moment he saw me. Tim cleared his throat again. I'm... I'm happy for you, I said. What did you do before all this? Laney asked. I was a museum director, I said. Laney laughed. Well, like they say, those that can do, and those that can't... She ended the sentence with a shrug and eye roll. How about you? I asked. What did you do? My late husband's father owned the biggest car dealership in western Kentucky, Laney replied. Oh, I said. One of us will go out with you to your farm tomorrow, Andrew said to me. No, I said. It won't be necessary. I think it would be safer, Andrew said. I insist. I can go with you, or maybe Tim. I am grateful, I said, feeling annoyed, but I can take care of myself. I've been doing fine this whole time. I would feel better if... It's okay, Andrew, Cheryl said. I'll drive out there with him. Why don't you go with the others and see how the solar panels are coming along? Thanks, but I'll be fine, I said. I'm going anyway, she said. I'm curious about your cistern set up. We'll have to set up something like that in town if we can't get city water working again. I sighed and went back to my meal. Sure, I don't care. Chapter 31 Do you think your farm is a total loss? Cheryl said as we drove out to the Laster place early the next morning. No, I said. It could be cleaned and repaired, but why would I want to? I just could move in some other place. I'll wait and see what Sarah wants to do. Do you have a lot of supplies? You'd have to move all that, build a new fence. You'd have to start completely over somewhere else. The house is nasty now, I said. They got in. They've bled all over the furniture and the floor. There's splatter on the walls. It's going to stink in there today. Plus, Grant and Christine shot a lot of them around the sides of the property. I was counting on Grant to clean it up. It's going to stink like rot. It stinks everywhere, she said. 
but it'll stink there worse, I said. The furniture can be burned. I'm sure we could take care of those floors and walls with some bleach. Why are you so interested, I said. When Sarah and Grant come back, we'll be helping you and your group. I probably won't have time to do much of anything at the farm. Are you going to live in town with Andrew? No, I said. I like the company, but I don't like to be told what to do anymore. I don't think I could stand to be around Laney very long either. Then all the more reason not to start completely over, she said. Even if we set up a community in town, we're going to have to plant crops, keep livestock, and hunt for our food somewhere. You might just have the only farm in all of Grace County that's been kept up. It wasn't a real farm, I said, not in the sense that it produced a lot of food. It had horses on it when I moved in. Besides, it's getting a little late to be planting crops now. I don't have a lot of seed left. There's another place not far from there where I can move. Sarah's teacher was holed up there a few weeks back. It's fenced and secure. It'll do. Or I could just take over the airport. We've collected some seeds. I just think it would be foolish to let the farm go. I chuckled. Why don't you hold your opinions until we get out there? You might change your mind then. Hell, I might change my mind after seeing it with a clear head. There were still five creatures walking around on the property. Cheryl and I killed them and left them where they fell. Once that work was finished, we inspected the house, barns, garden, and cistern. You've kept most of the property clean considering you didn't have a mower, she said, as we both leaned against the fence by the front pasture. Sling blade, I said. I whacked on it some every day. That's what I'm talking about, she said. The place is cleaner than any other. It'll be easier to get into shape than somewhere else. I don't know. You've collected a lot of stuff here. You've got more guns and food here than Danny had back when he was prepping. So... What happened there? I said. How did looters manage to take your stuff? You said he was ready. Danny's my brother, and I love him, but he's a blabbermouth. He was always bragging to everybody about what he had. He had a website, and he'd post videos of his stuff. He got too cocky about it. One of the big prepper rules is you don't talk about it. We made the mistake of helping the wrong person, I said. That's one thing you can't control she said, unless you just refuse to help everybody. She looked around, then wiped the sweat from her forehead with the back of her hand. This is no big deal, she said. I'll talk to Andrew. With all of us working on it, we could knock it out in about a week. If we could get some power equipment out here, we could do it in less time, maybe even slap some paint over the splatter on the walls. We have more solar panels, too. Maybe we could get that water well working again. Do you think he would go for that? He'd better, she said. If he wants to eat, then he'd sure as hell better. He knows as well as anyone that the chef boy R.D. and Rossaroni ain't going to last forever. I've been saying the same thing all this time. Glad we're on the same page, she said. Of course, you should clear it all with your little girlfriend. What's that supposed to mean? I mean, run it all by Sarah, and if she doesn't try to shoot you, or if she's not too busy with another dude... Ah, I said. Yeah, you're funny. She smiled and looked around. Well, we might as well make ourselves useful until they show up. Do you have rubber gloves? We dragged all the dead zombies out of the house and piled them in the driveway. Then we moved the living room furniture out and piled it on top of them. I went to the barn and came back with a jug of kerosene. We soaked the pile, then set it on fire. Once it was blazing, we went out to collect the rest of the dead. We fed the fire with bodies until noon. Then we took a break and went inside to eat. They should have been here by now, I said, as I ate some peanut butter out of the jar. Maybe they didn't hear the broadcast, Cheryl said. Pass me a beer. I handed her a bottle, then went to the window and looked toward the road. Maybe something has happened, I said. Maybe they're in trouble. It could be they just didn't want to come, she said. She did run off and leave you. She did, 
try to shoot you. I told you, I know, I know, but at least consider that as a possibility. I won't believe that. How long do you want to wait for them? She asked. We can keep working here for a while, but we told Andrew we'd be back before the broadcast. We have plenty of time, I said. We dumped the last corpse into the fire after two o'clock. Sarah and Grant had not arrived. You can try talking to them on the radio again, Cheryl said. They probably weren't listening yesterday. No, I said. I'm going to visit Bruce. I bet he knows where they are. Cheryl looked at her watch. Okay, we have time, but do you really think he'll still be there at that house? I would think he'd move to another place. No, he likes that house way too much. No, she said. I'm going. It might take a while, I said. Do me a favor. Go upstairs and get me a couple of changes of clothes from my closet and take it over to the airport while I'm at Bruce's house. You can take a couple of guns and some food, too. Enough chatter, she said. Let's get your things now and get on the road. Shit. Fine. I'm going out to the barn to get some extra guns and ammo. You go up and grab me some clothes. I'm not particular. Just get two of everything. When I came back from the barn with the guns, Cheryl was waiting for me on the front porch. She was holding a cardboard box, and my clothes were piled in it. There should have been a duffel bag up there, I said. Didn't you see it? Yeah, I saw it, she said. But I put some canned goods in here, and a couple of these. She reached in the box and fished out a Playboy magazine. I wouldn't want you to do without. That's none of your business, I said. And have you been washing your underwear and socks in the pond? They look awful. The wash water is a little muddy sometimes, I said. I should have gone up there myself. Yep, but you didn't. I noticed the Raquel Welsh issue was especially worn. Dog-eared pages. Oh, and you have quite the condom selection up there. You do realize I could shoot you right now, and no one would ever know what really happened? She gave me a grin. You would know. Then she pulled out the issue with Raquel in her red swimsuit on the cover. Miss Welch would know. Whatever, I said. Let's go. Chapter 32 Bruce Lee wasn't home, but neither was the missus, so I knew he had been back since I left. The Leia slave girl costume was soaking in the bathroom sink. The bedroom was clean and smelled strongly of bleach. The toys that had been set up on the dining table were gone, as was the gray plastic tote. However, two of the cell phones were on the floor. I grabbed them, and we went outside. Behind the house, I found my truck had been vandalized. The tires had been slashed, and there were several zombie heads in the front seat, including Leia's. In the door, with a key, he had scratched the phrase, I like to suck big dicks. My guns, bug-out supplies, and helmet were gone. What an asshole, I said. Nothing to do here now, Cheryl said. Let's go on home. Not yet, I said. I walked past the truck to the garage and went inside. I went straight to the Romulan Warbird and removed the plexiglass cube that was over it. I took the spaceship model from its display stand and went back outside. What's that? Cheryl said. Some kind of toy? It's a piece of television history, and I'm taking it. The damn thing probably won't fit in the car, she said. That don't matter no more anyway. It matters to me, I said. It matters to Bruce, too. This is going to annoy the hell out of him. We were running a little late, but we thought we could make it before Andrew finished his broadcast. I wanted to put out another message to Sarah and Grant. That would never happen. We saw the smoke long before we got there. The radio station and the grounds surrounding it were in flames. Two of the walls had collapsed outward. 
Pastor Andrew, Gail, Tim, and Laney were standing away from the remains of the building, watching it burn. What happened? Cheryl said when we got out. Don't know, Andrew said. Dan thinks maybe the generator got too hot. Where is he? Cheryl said. He ran over to the airport to get the fire truck. I told him not to worry about it. The damage is already done. We won't be making broadcasts from here anymore. The fire could spread, though, I said. I'll go help him. Andrew nodded. There was a field between the station and the airport. I ran down the path that had been made by the group's daily treks back and forth. Then I passed through the opening in the chain-link fence that surrounded the airport grounds, a space big enough to drive a golf cart through. After that, I crossed another field, then the airport's taxiway, then a median, then the runway. It seemed to take forever. I was impressed with what a strategic place it was. Anyone, zombie or human, attempting to sneak up on the terminal would be seen long before they got close. There was nowhere for them to take cover especially if someone was on the roof or in the airport's modest tower. A shooter with a rifle and scope in the terminal could take down any intruder before they were a real threat. Dan and Cheryl had been smart to choose this place. Whether they had been smart in choosing their living companions remained to be seen. I had not been given a complete tour of the whole complex, only the terminal. I didn't really know where I was going— but I presumed the airport's emergency vehicles must have been parked in a garage or hangar. There were several large buildings away from the terminal, so I made for them. I crossed a wide patch of tall grass, then ran onto another paved area. The first large building was ahead to my left. Before I could get there, I could see Dan on his way in a big, bright green tanker truck. He slowed enough for me to hop on to the running board on the passenger side. Once I was on, he sped up again. The access hole in the fence wasn't large enough for the truck, so we had to take the road. Even though the radio station was only a couple hundred yards from the runway, we had to drive more than a mile around to get over to it. Dan let down the window so he could talk to me. The place is liable to burn to the ground before we get there, he yelled. I nodded. It was probably that generator, he continued. I should have shut her down yesterday and tried to do the maintenance, but the pastor wanted the recording to stay on. His assessment seemed about right, I answered with another nod. Can you put it out? I yelled back. Ain't never used a fire truck, he said, patting the dashboard. We'll see. The building is a loss anyway, I said. Let's just see if we can keep it from getting to the airport. Ain't no wind, he replied. At least there's that. We pulled up close to the station, but not too close. I hopped down and ran around the truck to assist Dan. The heat from the fire was almost unbearable. There's one of them water cannons on top of the truck, he yelled as we ran toward the rear. I'm going to climb up there and see if I can get her to work. Check and see if there's a hose. He stopped, turned, and grabbed my shoulder to make sure I was paying attention. I gotta tell you, though, he said, I got no idea what I'm doing. Are you sure there's water in it? The gauge says there is, he said, as he began to scale the side of the truck. He did eventually get the water cannon to work, but not before the fire had caught in the field. Once it was evident the fire would spread toward the airport terminal, Dan made the decision to stop fighting the fire at the station and move the truck to protect the airport. Of course, the taxiway and runway formed an effective barrier for the fire and made our job a lot easier. We pulled directly onto the runway and soaked the brush on either end. The fire just burned itself out. An hour and a half later, Dan and I sat on top of the now-empty tanker truck, looking out at the blackened field and still-smoking remains of the radio station. The sun was low in the sky, and the rest of the group had returned to the airport terminal to get cleaned up and prepare for the evening meal. 
I hate to lose the station, Dan said. But hell, we should have burned all these weeds down weeks ago. It's clean now. Yeah, I said. And open. Nothing can hide. Then I had a thought. Why don't you... We... Why don't we just stay here? Why bother with town? He shrugged. That's what the pastor wants. Cheryl was saying that we should repair the damage over at the Lassiter place, I said. You know, so we could plant crops. I could live there and do that, I suppose. But why couldn't I plant here? There's all this open land. There's electricity and clean water. Why move into town at all? Why worry about the Lassiter place? I say we make a home here. Ain't my decision, he said. The pastor hears the Lord on these things. Come on, I said. You're a smart guy, Dan. I wouldn't be alive right now if your sister hadn't told me about the things you had done to prepare. I owe you my life. Oh, hail, he said and blushed. What do you think, Dan? I said. What do you think is the best thing to do? Who am I? he said, looking down at his feet. I don't hear from the Lord like that. I ain't nobody that God should talk to me. You're as likely to hear from God as Andrew, I said. You're a survivor. There aren't too many people left for God to talk to anymore. There were lots of people that claimed to hear from God before, and now they're dead or worse. You hear from God by listening to yourself. That's how God talks. What does your gut tell you? He took a deep breath and looked around. This place is pretty sweet, he said. It ain't heaven, mind you, but it's pretty damn sweet considering. I could see planting some corn over there, a lot of it. We could put a sniper in the tower. We could still go into town and kill the dead. Humanely, of course. Sure, humanely. He paused. I could see the idea working in his head. It was already there. I knew it was there because I knew he had chosen the airport for all these reasons before Pastor Andrew entered the picture. Then he looked at me. Don't matter, though, he said. The pastor has done heard from God on this, and he wants to move into town. You like Clayfield, don't you? Yeah, I said. I love Clayfield. Well, there you go. Out on the highway, there were a few zombies stumbling around. They'd been attracted to the smoke and fire. We watched them a moment. Cheryl told me that first day you were ready for this. He chuckled. I had a lot of guns and food, but I wasn't ready for this. You were as ready as a man could be, I said. Whole armies fell, Dan. Nations fell. You were ready. In my book, that makes you more fit to lead than any man I know. He gave me a hard look. What do you have against the pastor? I ain't gonna have none of this. You ain't gonna turn me on him. I'm not trying to turn you on him. I'm just trying to... Hush, he said, his eyes flashing anger. I ain't gonna have it. I shook my head and grinned. You're too smart for this shit, man. You sound like Cheryl. Blood is thicker than water, I said. That don't make no sense. Okay, I said. Sorry. I don't want to make an enemy of you. I just think this looks like a good place to stay, and I think I will stay here. If you're moving into Clayfield, I'll just take over here. Pastor Andrew said, The Bible says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. We're all men, I replied. Every one of us, even Pastor Andrew. I don't want to talk about this no more, he said, and turned so he could climb down the side of the truck. We're saving Clayfield, and we're setting up a haven for any lost and wandering soul that might have survived this hell. It's the will of God. If you have a problem with that, then take it up with him. Chapter 33 the conversation at dinner was minimal. We ate squirrel and dumplings with a side of black-eyed peas. The food wasn't very good, but I didn't complain. 
Any discussion that took place was about the fire, and I was too preoccupied with my concern for Sarah to pay attention. As we were finishing up, I tuned in a little more. I think we can take this fire as a sign, Andrew said in a soft and solemn tone. Now that we have the help of our new friend, God has seen fit to push us along toward our goal. I must say that I enjoyed making the broadcast, and maybe I was dragging my feet because of that. God has his ways. Tomorrow we'll focus our whole effort on blocking all the streets on the court square. No more dilly-dally. After the meal, I helped Cheryl with the dishes while the others went into the lounge-slash-waiting area of the terminal for their evening devotional. They don't try to pressure you to go in there with them? I asked. We're not a cult, Cheryl said with a chuckle. Andrew doesn't try to control us. The others like him and like what he has to say. Andrew just fell into the role of leader. I think Dan might be better suited. I said, as I carried a stack of dirty plates over to the sink. Danny told me you talked to him about that. You should just let go of that idea. I love him, but Danny ain't no leader of men. I won't question his advice on surviving this hell, but he ain't gonna be the one in charge of rebuilding civilization. He don't have it in him. And Andrew does? Cheryl shrugged. The others like to be petted. Andrew knows how to say stuff that makes them feel better. They like to know that God is still around and doing his mysterious ways. Andrew can give them that. He's not hurting anything, and he's got Danny there to advise him on practical matters, so I ain't worried. Cheryl scrubbed the dishes, then passed them to me to rinse. What do you think about the fire? she said. Do you think it was the generator? What else could it be? I asked. You said you trusted Dan on those things. I don't know, she said hesitantly. You said Founder's hardware burned down. I'm just wondering if the same might have happened here. Maybe that crazy man heard a broadcast and found the station. Maybe he thought we lived there. Everybody was gone when it started, so he could have done it. Could be, I said. If he's still around, we're going to have trouble with him in town. There's really no reason for the group to move there. This place has everything to live. She passed the last dish to me and dried her hands. Would you and your friends be against me for giving you a hand at the farm? She asked. Her voice sounded strained, like she was uncomfortable with asking. I need to find my friends before anything else, I said. But, like I said, this place has everything. I'd like to stay here if everyone else is moving away. The living space is so much more comfortable than the Laster house. Now that the fields have been burned, I can see turning them under and planting stuff. I don't know if we'll get a harvest this late in the season, but maybe we could ask Andrew to get God to hold off on winter for a bit. Don't be a smart ass, she grinned. They might hear you. The next morning, after breakfast, we all armed ourselves, and Dan led us out to one of the hangars. I took a look back toward the radio station. Smoke still rose from it and drifted with the breeze off to the south. There was a hole in the side of the brick facade approximately 18 inches in diameter. I hadn't noticed it before. I pointed it out to Dan. The fire probably weakened the mortar, he said. It caused the bricks to collapse. Give it a stiff wind and that whole wall will probably crumble. I nodded, but I wasn't convinced. When we got to the hangar, Dan pushed open the huge door, and I saw that the building was full of cars, trucks, and vans. They were neatly parked in four rows with ten in each row. Were these here when you moved in? I asked. Nah, Dan replied. We've been collecting them. These all had gas in the tanks and keys. I've put some fuel stabilizer in them, but the gas ain't gonna last forever. 
He nodded over to the far wall and a dozen or more portable gasoline cans. We've been collecting those, too. Do you know how to siphon gas? Yeah. Dan, make sure the tank on the blue van is full, Andrew said. We'll be using it the most today. Dan nodded and left us to get one of the gas cans. Today, we'll move most or all of these vehicles around the court square for our first temporary wall, Andrew said to the group. I want everyone to know their job so no one gets hurt. On our first runs, we'll park bumper to bumper the full length of Broadway to the north of the courthouse by the sidewalk in front of the bank. Leave no space between the cars. Bump into each other if you must. Gail will drive the blue van, and she'll pull alongside you to pick you up one at a time. I don't want anyone out of their vehicle for very long. We'll probably use up most of these just blocking that one street, Laney said. The north end of the square is so open. What if we used tractor trailers instead, I said. They're longer. We thought of that already, Laney said. The trailers are too high off the ground. They are too easy for the dead to crawl under. The car should suffice in the short term, Andrew said. Laney tells me her ex-husband's dealership should have enough cars to fill in any extra space. She knows how to get at the keys. Laney visibly puffed up with pride. Well, I'm happy to help you, I said, but I can't today. First, I want to locate Sarah and Grant. I'm worried about them. They're in God's hands, Andrew said. I have peace about that. I'm glad to hear that, I said, but I'd like to see them. I'm going to look for them today, check places Sarah might have gone. I'll be back to help you later on. We could really use the help now, brother, Andrew said. When he said brother, it brought Bruce Lee instantly to my mind. I need to do this, I said. If you must, Andrew said. I'm afraid I can't spare anyone to help you today. He's one of us now, Andrew, Cheryl said. We don't go out alone. That's one of the rules. One of your rules. Andrew frowned. What part of that did you not hear? Laney said. The pastor told you he can't spare anyone. Now get in line, like the rest of us. Mind your own beeswax, Laney, Dan said. I'm going with him, Cheryl said. There will still be plenty of work left for us to do when we get back. We ain't shirking our responsibilities. I can't stop you, Andrew said. What about a car, I said. Can you spare a car? Andrew begrudgingly agreed to let us take the car we'd used the day before. I emptied out the Romulan Warbird and the cell phones I'd taken from Bruce's house, along with the supplies we'd retrieved from the Lasseter house. Everyone impatiently watched me pull out all the superfluous stuff. I made sure to hide the cover of the Playboy that was sticking out of the box. I carried it all over and set it next to the wall in the hangar and returned with the bag of phones. I got a couple more of these, I said to Gail, who was waiting next to her van. What is it? she asked. Some kind of phone, I replied. Haven't you seen the other one yet? What other one? I looked over to Dan, and he gave me an apologetic expression. Sorry, he said. I forgot to mention it to her. I guess it burned up in the fire at the station. I gave her one and handed another one to Dan. If you get a chance, see if you can get them to work, I said. Or we could crack them open and use the parts for something. There are cell phones everywhere, Gail said. They don't work anymore. I know, I said. But these might be different. For one thing, they're solar powered. So? she replied. That doesn't mean you're going to talk to somebody that ain't there. Okay, I said, frustrated. Throw them away then. I thought it might be something. She shrugged and put it in her pocket. I looked out at Dan again. 
We'll look him over, he said, and tossed it into the car. Cheryl and I left with the others, but we went the opposite direction. I drove us out to the Lassiter place first on the off chance Sarah and Grant had gone back. They weren't there, but I left them a note. Since Blaine's house was the next closest place, I drove over there. I hadn't been there in a while. It looked differently being overgrown. Cheryl and I went out to his garden plot to have a look. That looks like garlic, Cheryl said, pointing to some tall stalks with purple flowers. They need to be harvested, I replied. Then I grinned at a memory. This is what he planted last fall. I remember he told me about planting them. He loved garlic. Tomatoes over there, Cheryl said. There were several cherry tomato plants that had come up wild. There were also some plants that were either pumpkins or gourds. I wouldn't know for sure until the fruit developed more. Blaine's apple and pear trees were loaded with fruit, and they'd be ready to pick in August and September. We'll come back for the garlic later, I said. I left a note on the shop door at Blaine's, then decided to go over to the little house on the edge of town where Sarah and I had first met Corndog. When I got back to the car, Cheryl was in the driver's seat. I didn't argue about driving. I just got in. Chapter 34 So Sarah means a lot to you? Cheryl asked. She's not just somebody you're shacking up with to get through this? Yeah, I said. I care about her, but I don't really think I know her the way I thought I did. Did she change that much while she was gone? She asked, as she pulled out onto the main highway to Clayfield. I don't know, I shrugged. Maybe. Well, shit, I've changed a lot since this all happened. You need to expect that. Nobody is what they used to be. I suppose. Tell me when I need to turn, she said. Just stay on this road until you get to the bypass, I replied. Ahead, there were black tire marks on the road. They curved toward the shoulder. There was an RV on its side in the drainage ditch. Stop, I said. That's them. Oh, no, no. Cheryl slowed, then stopped in the middle of the road. Oh, no. Oh, shit, I said. You sure that's them? She said. That thing could have been there since February. It's them. I opened the door, pulled up my mask, and got out. Wait, Cheryl yelled, but I was already running toward the wreck. There was a creature standing near the overturned vehicle. It moaned and came at me. I reached for my pistol, but it wasn't there. I'd left my weapon in the car. I stepped backward. Cheryl fired, and the thing's head snapped back. You're gonna get your ass chewed on if you don't start thinking, she said. I ran up to the windshield and cupped my hands around my eyes to look in. I can't tell if they're in there, I said. She came up next to me and looked in, too. If they did get out, we should see some evidence of it. An open door or broken window. I ran around the vehicle, looking for any signs Sarah and Grant had escaped. When I returned, Cheryl had her hand on the hood. The engine is cold, she said. This happened a while ago. Maybe this morning. Maybe yesterday. There was a crowd around it for a while, too. Look at how all the grass and brush has been trampled down. I don't see any dead zombies except the one I just shot, so maybe they never came out of it. Maybe they got out before the zombies got here, I said. Maybe they climbed out through the side door and it shut. You can climb up there and see, or... She pushed a button on her keychain, and the trunk popped open on her car. There's an axe in the trunk, she said. You can bust the windshield out of this thing. I ran back and got the axe while Cheryl walked around the wreck. The zombies headed toward town, she called out to me. They left a snail trail of their juices on the pavement. It's funny how they would still use the road. The first swing of the axe bounced off the windshield. The next three punched holes in it and spiderwebbed it. 
The fourth caused the glass to cave, then collapse into the cab, all in one big floppy piece. I started to climb inside, but Cheryl grabbed my shoulder. You might not like what you find in there, she said. Just wait out here and let me take a look. Honestly, I don't think anything bothers me anymore, I said. Do you really want to see her if something has happened? Do you really want to see her like that? Is that how you want to remember? I thought a moment, and a vivid image popped into my head of Jen with her throat ripped open. Okay, I'll wait out here. She stepped through the opening and climbed over the driver's seat. I turned and looked around for any sign of visitors that might have been attracted to Cheryl's gunshot. Far out in an old bean field beside the road, I spied some movement in the weeds. It was a gray horse. I didn't know if it was the same gray horse I had tried to help the week before, but I liked to think it was. I'd been so preoccupied with Sarah's return that I had not had another thought about it since that day. It was on its way across the field, and it was taking its time. It was walking with its head down, but I didn't see anything on which it could be grazing. Occasionally it would lift its head to get its bearings, then the head would go down again. I whistled. Its head came up, and it looked at me. Ears perked. I whistled again. There was a racket inside the RV, and Cheryl came into view. What is it? Do we have trouble? No, I said. Sorry. There's a horse in the field over there. She stumbled out of the hole where the windshield had been and looked out. I haven't seen any livestock in a while, she said. I faced her and looked past her into the RV. They ain't there, she said. I was relieved, but also concerned. If they climbed out of the wreck, they would have had to go on foot. But where? There weren't any houses in view. It was just woods and fallow farmland. What do you think? Cheryl said, as if reading my thoughts. Would they go into the woods or walk down the road and try to find a house? I thought about our experience in the woods behind the Lassiter house. They wouldn't go in the woods, I said. The RV is pointed toward town, so I would presume they would go back and find a house they might have passed. That sounds reasonable, she said. We passed a house just the other side of those trees? We'll go back. I looked out at the horse again, and Cheryl's gaze followed mine. Danny said we're going to need horses soon, she said. Too bad we don't have a way to catch it. I had a whole herd out there at the farm, I said. We let them go. There's still one on the property somewhere. You don't look after it, she said, sounding perturbed. No, I replied, offering no defense. It looks after itself. We watched the horse move through the weeds a moment longer. Come on, I said. At the house, the lawn was waist high. The paved driveway and concrete sidewalk gave us neat corridors through the grass. The front door was unlocked. The place had been looted and the zombies inside had been executed. I didn't remember doing it, but it could have been me that did it. I had been in so many houses, and unless there was something odd or spectacular about it, they all kind of looked the same. I had tried to mark the front of the houses I went into, but I hadn't marked them all. Sarah and Grant weren't there, so we drove down to the next house. We repeated this four times. I don't think they came this way, I said, as I sat down on a blue sofa in the living room of the last house. If they were hiding a while to recoup from injuries, they would have stopped at the last house. There were plenty of supplies in that one. Maybe they found a car in the road that worked and took it. Yeah, I said, frustrated. Could be. I hope so. Listen, she said in a whisper. She ran over to a window and looked out to the road. Do you hear that? I could make out the sound of an approaching vehicle. Yeah. I said. Could be them. We both ran out into the driveway. A white truck came in fast from the east going toward Clayfield. If the occupant or occupants of the vehicle had seen us, they probably thought we were zombies because they didn't break. 
Who the hell was it? Cheryl said. I saw as much as you. Come on, she said. Let's chase him down. We got in the car, and Cheryl had us rolling before I could get my door shut. I sank back into the seat as she mashed the accelerator. The engine roared, and the transmission tried to keep up. I watched the speedometer needle cross sixty, then seventy, then eighty. There's a pistol in the glove box, she said. We put one in every vehicle, just in case. There was an abandoned car in the road ahead. She slid into the other lane. I opened the glove compartment and pulled out the weapon. They're hauling ass, she said, as we passed the wrecked RV. We were on a long, straight stretch of road with several low, sloping hills. The truck was three hills away. The straightness of the road would be ending for them soon. They topped the next hill and their brake lights lit up. Then they disappeared behind the rise. Take it easy, I said, as I put on my seatbelt. We have curves coming up. When we crested that particular hill, I felt funny in my stomach as we briefly became airborne. The mob of creatures that had left the RV was right there at the bottom, scattered across both lanes. Holy shit! Cheryl screamed. Some of them had been struck down by the truck. The rest were still walking with their backs to us. Everything seemed to slow down. I took a deep breath. Just before we made contact, one of the creatures looked over its shoulder, then thump, thump, thump. Something like a bucket of pea soup splashed against our windshield. A dark form sailed over the car. Cheryl's airbag deployed. Thump, thump. My airbag hit me in the face, slamming me backward. The car groaned. The tires screamed. I was in a daze. I exhaled. The engine hissed. There were moans. I smelled decay and hot rubber. We were still. God damn airbag knocked the shit out of me, Cheryl said hoarsely. You okay? Huh? was all I could manage to say. Fucking foreign car, she said. If I'd been driving my 79 Caprice, we would have made it just fine. Are you sure you're okay? What? I wiped the blood from my nose. She tried to start the engine. It turned over and over and over, but wouldn't catch. I heard her pumping the gas pedal. God damn foreign piece of shit. It turned over and over and over and it started. Okay, baby, stay cranked for me, she said. She revved the engine. I rubbed my eyes again, but I couldn't wipe the blur away. Jesus Christ, I can't see a damn thing, she said under her breath. Then she screamed, Fucking move! We lurched forward. The windshield wipers came on and smeared zombie juices. You're making it worse, I said. Something was scraping under us. There was another thump against the car. The light from outside filtered in through the shifting movements of the zombies surrounding us. Talk to me over there, she said. How are we doing? I can't see, I said. Then, outside, there was a gunshot. Damn it, Cheryl said. Gun, gun, I need a gun. Three more shots rang out. Cheryl's hand fumbled over my lap and came away with the pistol I'd taken from the glove compartment. There was another shot. Move now, yelled a man's voice from some distance away. Is he talking to us, I said. I can't see shit, Cheryl said. Drive, the man yelled. Drive now. Do it, I said. We crept along at first, then Cheryl punched it. We traveled for several feet, then, Whoa, the man yelled. Stop. Cheryl slowed. What do you think? Stop the car, I said. Just stop. We're not going anywhere like this anyway. We came to a dead stop, and she shifted it into park. She checked the gun to make sure it was loaded. Be ready, but give the man a chance. The dark shape of a man approached. He was carrying a rifle. Cheryl was silent. I squeezed my nose with my shirt tail. Y'all all right? The voice said. 
Hell no, we ain't all right, Cheryl said. Climb on out if you can, the voice said. Y'all need to come with me. They'll be up your ass pretty damn quick. I could see the shape of the man through the windshield, but I couldn't make out any features. I tried to open my door, but I couldn't get it to budge. Cheryl climbed out of the car, then reached back in for her shotgun. Come on, she said. I crawled over the seat and out the driver's door. Once out, she handed me the pistol. The man was ahead of us, jogging toward his truck. He took a quick glance over his shoulder to make sure we were following. Then he stopped and turned. Well, shitfire, son, he grinned. I've been looking all over for you since yesterday. Mr. Somerville? Chapter 35 Nicholas Somerville stood still and waited for us to catch up. Like everyone, he'd lost some weight since I'd last seen him. His beard and hair were a little longer, too. He gave me a friendly slap on my shoulder, then looked past me to the approaching zombies. His rifle came up, and he let off two rounds. Then the three of us proceeded to his truck. Cheryl climbed into the back seat, and I sat up front with Nicholas. I introduced the two as we pulled away and resumed our course to downtown Clayfield. "'What happened to you?' I said. "'Where have you been?' "'I spent the better part of two weeks in Bubble Land, thanks to some bad navigating on my part,' Nicholas replied. "'Bubble Land?' I said, puzzled. "'You mean Kentucky Bend? That place?' "'Long story,' he said. What I want to know is, did Judy and Sarah make it back? I finally got to Springfield. They weren't there. Sarah's in Clayfield, I said. Judy's in Biloxi. What the hell is she doing down there? He said, frustrated. I explained everything that had happened as quickly as I could, including some of the information about Cheryl's groups. We've got to find that girl so she can show me where Judy is, Somerville said. I want to get down there as soon as possible. Then he looked in the mirror at Cheryl. Can your brother fly us down there? I don't know if there's a plane in Clayfield that will make it that far and back. What about Dr. Bailey's bird? Is it still parked out there? He was always going on about it at the country club. It was some kind of cloud name. Cumulus? Cirrus, Cheryl said. Cirrus CR-22. That's the one. Is it there? That should get us there. It's there, she replied. But we never went out in that one before. There's a little Cessna there that we used when we went out together, but I don't know if it would make it to Biloxi and back. Daddy knows more about it than I do. We can't worry about the return trip until after we get there, he said. Danny might have a different opinion on that, she shot back. No need to get your hackles up, he said. I apologize for making assumptions. I'm just worried about Judy. Cheryl nodded, but I could tell the hackle remark had made her angry. Have y'all seen any other aircraft? Helicopters? Drones? Anything? No, I said. Sarah told me they'd seen drones down south. They're around, he said, and they're bad news. Those sons of bitches have been laying down incendiary bombs wherever they see sizable crowds of the infected. That's all fine, but the collateral damage is unacceptable in my book. They're burning everything. It's only a matter of time before they work their way to Clayfield. I reckon they're spread pretty thin, so it might be a while before they show up around here. So the government is still intact? I said. Somerville snorted. <laughs> I didn't say that. Somebody somewhere is controlling those drones. Somebody is flying those choppers. Their chain of command might not go any higher than lieutenant. The president is probably in a bunker somewhere, eating his advisors. We got to within two blocks of the courthouse and had to stop. The undead were crowded in around the square. What's all this? Somerville said. They've been parking cars here this morning, Cheryl said. I guess the things are stirred up from all the activity here. Andrew thought something like this might happen. You don't think they're stuck in there somewhere, do you? I said. They wouldn't risk getting caught up in all that, she said. 
I imagine they've been keeping an eye on it. I doubt this crowd showed up all at once, probably been trickling in. They're probably at the airport now, waiting for things to die down. A bloated creature with a black beard stopped by my window and looked in at us. It put a scabby hand on my mirror and pressed its nose against the glass. Oddly enough, this reminded me of my own nose. I pulled down the sun visor so I could look in the mirror there. The bleeding had stopped. My nose was a little swollen and starting to bruise, but I didn't think it was broken. It would match nicely with the bruise and swelling on my cheek where Bruce Lee had kicked me. From our location, I could see the building Andrew had chosen and the solar panels sticking up on top of it. Why did Andrew want that particular building? Was it arbitrary, or was there a practical or a tactical reason? It's the tallest one on the same side as the church, Cheryl said. It ain't the tallest by much, but it's the tallest. I hadn't noticed that. I didn't think I'd been in that building since Canton B had struck. At one time, when I was a boy, it was a shoe store. I remember my mom taking me in there and buying me those red goose shoes around Christmas time. The shop owner gave me a golden egg with a slot in it that I could use as a bank. It was a long time ago, before my parents separated and my dad left. A flood of memories rushed in that made me smile. Christmases and trick-or-treating, and our family trip to Opryland. Then I thought about all the bad, and my frown returned. I looked around at the other buildings surrounding the square. I had not been in many of them because I didn't think I'd be able to find any useful supplies inside. Houses were where most of the supplies were. I looked at the courthouse itself. It reminded me of a haunted house with its tall spire, open door, and broken windows. I hadn't seen a need to go in there either. I thought there would be guns inside because the building also housed the sheriff's office and it was adjacent to the county jail. However, I never thought it was worth the risk. The building was almost 130 years old with four levels, including the basement. It was like a maze in there, and I could easily see myself getting turned around and cornered. Of course, if the square were to be secured, all of the zombies would have to be eliminated inside. We'd have to clear out every room and dark basement. After that, I could finally wander around inside the courthouse without the fear of being accosted. I was glad it was going to happen, but I was also glad I'd be going back to air conditioning and artificially flavored pop ice at the end of the day. Want to pull back and wait a while for him? Somerville said. Nah, Cheryl said. Let's get back to the airport. Somerville put the truck in reverse and backed to the next cross street and turned around. It'll take a few hours of quiet before they all leave, he said, unless something is done to lure them somewhere else. We were right outside of the city limits when we saw the procession of vehicles approaching from the opposite direction. Here they come, Somerville said. He steered to the middle of the road, flashed his lights, and stopped. The cars slowed and stopped well back. They don't know it's us, Cheryl said. Toward the end of the line, a door opened, and Dan got out with a rifle. Better let them see who you are, she said. I got out and waved at them with both arms. Dan returned the wave, then motioned for the line to move. When I climbed back in, Gail was pulling her van up next to us. She rolled down her window and gave Somerville a suspicious look. "'The town is crowded, darling,' he said. "'Y'all will want to turn it around until tomorrow, probably.' She looked past him to me for confirmation, then leaned in, trying to see Cheryl. Cheryl stood as much as she could and came halfway over the front seat to talk to Gail over Somerville's shoulder. "'He's right, hon,' she said. "'We'll have to wait. They're everywhere right now.' I'll let y'all tell the pastor, she said. Then she looked at Somerville and gave him a small smile and a nod. Pastor Andrew was already on his way on foot. What's the problem? He said. Can't get into downtown right now, Somerville said. Andrew stopped between the vehicles and extended his hand. Somerville shook it through the open window. Andrew Harp, 
he said. And you are St. Nick Somerville. I don't know about the saint part, Nicholas grinned. We're all saints so long as we've been cleansed of our sins, Andrew grinned back. That's going to take some serious baptizing, preacher. Andrew looked toward the town. So, there are too many? I thought we had time for one more run. Not today, I'm afraid, unless you want to create a diversion. Andrew shook his head. No need. They'll disperse on their own soon enough. Let's head back to the airport for an early supper. I could eat, Somerville said. Chapter 36 Somerville followed the blue van back to the airport. Here's a group there in Bubble Land that's doing good, he spoke as he drove. They're made up of some locals and some people that migrated in. They insist on calling it Bubble Land now more than ever. They know their insulated bubbles save them. Hell, there's even talk of making a flag. It's pretty much a zombie-free zone. They're practically surrounded by a river, and the only way into them by land is a narrow spot less than a mile wide north of Tiptonville. That bottleneck is patrolled around the clock. They've been building a fence across there on Highway 22. There are more than 60 survivors in there, and they work together. They have a strong leader. Wouldn't surprise me if that bunch was the core group that eventually rebuilt this nation. It's going to take a bit more than 60 people to rebuild the nation, Cheryl said. Sure, Somerville said. But this group is strong and organized, and they're the largest group I've seen yet. Granted, I haven't been out too much. At one time, Clayfield might have had that many, but we could never agree to work together. At some point, and it might not be for another year or two or maybe even a decade, but at some point some of the stronger groups are going to start searching for other groups. By that time, I doubt the dead will be a problem. We'll probably wind up with several city-states eventually. They'll work together or they'll fight. The stronger groups will destroy or absorb the weaker. I'm sure our museum director here can give us a history lesson. I nodded as I thought about what he said. The world had been set back considerably. Even after the Canton B problem went away, we had so many other problems ahead of us. We would revert back and back and back, and then stop and march forward again. I wondered how far back we'd go before we stopped and reversed course. Would it be like the mid-nineteenth century? Would we be in a state comparable to ancient Greece? Or would we, as Jen suggested, go all the way back to cavemen? I didn't think I'd see anything so severe in my lifetime, but my descendants could very well become that. Then I thought about what we were doing in Clayfield at that moment. I could easily see that escalating into a similar situation as medieval serfdom. The walled city of Clayfield, ruled by King Andrew, or the evil Queen Laney extorting food and supplies from surrounding farms. We pulled onto the access road for the airport. Surely Andrew can see the importance of tracking down Sarah and her friend, Somerville said. I realize I might sound selfish in my reasoning here, being that I want to go get Judy, but it ain't like we have that many people left. If this Andrew fella is that into Jesus, then he knows about leaving the ninety-nine to search for the one. That might be a card we could play, Cheryl said. It would be more effective if you played it in the presence of everybody else. Plus, Somerville continued, and I don't mean to harp on this the way Nathan Camp, Willie Roop, and that asshole doctor did, but that's a young, fertile womb there. I know there can't be many of those left. Hell, if we were to scrape together every fertile female left on the whole planet, we might not come away with more than two or three dozen. They're a goddamn treasure. I think we can take a break from building a wall long enough to protect one of them. Cheryl chuckled. Well, you're going to have a hard time on that argument, especially since Andrew believes the entire planet started with Eve. Didn't it? Somerville said with a grin. Cheryl sighed. In Andrew's mind, Laney and Gale could single-handedly repopulate the human race. 
why should he deviate from God's plan for one girl? If that is really how he thinks, then maybe he shouldn't be in charge, Somerville said. On this we can agree, Cheryl said. I shudder to think about a population that springs from Laney's womb, I said. We drove on to the main airport complex, and Somerville looked across the field on the other side of the runway at the still-smoking remains of the radio station. What happened to 94 Smooth? he asked. My brother thinks the generator got too hot, Cheryl said. Personally, I think that Bruce Lee did it. Generator? What's that hole in the wall? I noticed that too, I said. Dan said the fire made the wall collapse there. They were running a generator to keep the equipment on so they could broadcast. You were broadcasting? Hell, they can triangulate that shit. I'll bet my last dollar a drone shot a firebomb up your ass. Why would they target survivors? Cheryl said. I told you, Somerville said. They're burning everything. Survivors would be carriers of the disease and a whole lot harder to eradicate. They're not taking any chances. If they know you're out there, they'll put a bullseye on you. If they're here, then that crowd around the courthouse is going to draw some attention and probably keep them in the area. They could have their eyes on the airport right now. When did the fire happen? Yesterday, I said. We were gone. Somerville shook his head. Y'all can do what you want, but I suggest you relocate as soon as possible. They'll burn you out here if they see activity. One surveillance craft would be all it would take, and that radio station is way too close for comfort. The blue van stopped in front of the hangar, and we stopped right behind them. We got out, and Somerville went straight to Andrew. The meeting started out very diplomatic. Somerville was a skilled politician, after all. However, the niceties faded quickly. By the time I walked up, both men were wagging their heads and frowning. We'll move soon enough, but we can't abandon the airport right now, Councilman. You must understand the importance of this. What's important is the safety of these people, Somerville said. You haven't seen what I have seen. That is irrelevant, sir, Andrew said. When God says do a thing, it is our responsibility to God my ass at that. Dan stepped in and pushed a finger against Somerville's chest. You'll watch your words. You might have been a big shot in Clayfield, but you're in the county now. Somerville laughed. Shit, son, in case you ain't heard, there ain't no counties and cities no more. Hell, we ain't no more than a couple miles from the city limits anyway. Back when I ran for council, you might not have had a dog in that fight, but now you do. And whether you can recognize it or not, I'm it. Everybody settle down, Cheryl said, especially you, Danny. The councilman is right. We could be in danger here, and it don't make no sense to stay until things calm down. If the military or whoever blew up the radio station, then... Hey, Cheryl, I told you it was the generator. If they did, then we ain't safe here. Pastor Andrew looked into the hangar. The others were standing by cars, listening to the argument. Andrew looked at the ground and bit his lip. Then he looked back at me. Would there be enough room at your farm for a temporary stay? I nodded. Yeah, but the outside of the property is surrounded by dead bodies. The smell is pretty bad. It won't be comfortable like here. I'm thinking in terms of security, not comfort, Andrew said. Yeah, we could make room. Andrew regarded Somerville, then looked around at the others. Everyone run into the terminal and pack a bag. Each of you pack three days food, clothing, bedding, and anything personal. We ain't taking everything, just three days' worth. Hopefully, this will all blow over. Dan, you fill the tanker truck with water. It'll take several hours to do that with a garden hose, Pastor, Dan said. Do it. Take Tim with you. You two can join us at the farm later. Dan nodded. Then he and Tim ran to perform the task. 
Once you all are finished, return here to the hangar, Andrew said. Would that satisfy you, Mr. Somerville? Somerville nodded. It makes me feel a lot better. Now, let's talk about Sarah. As I told your friend, the young lady is in God's hands. That ain't good enough, Somerville said. Right now, she and her friend are my only way of finding my wife. They know exactly where she is. Cheryl grabbed my arm and gave me a tug. Come help me, she whispered. Andrew and Nicholas can work this out. I pulled away from her. I need to be in on this conversation. No, you don't, she said. Andrew is a mild-mannered man, but you don't want him to feel like you're ganging up on him. Gail told me he's made some harsh decisions in the past, and these others will do what he says. Walk with me. I went with her. You said this wasn't a cult. You said everyone was free to do what they want. They are, so long as they don't threaten the group or Andrew's authority. It's best for now if Nicholas talked with him one-on-one. -on -one. I never liked the man, but the councilman has a reputation as a slick talker. Maybe... He can convince Andrew to send the whole group out to look for your friends. Chapter 37 When I entered the terminal with Cheryl, the others were already busy packing things. We passed Laney in the kitchen. A duffel bag was on the floor beside her, and she was standing on tiptoes so she could pull canned goods from the cupboard. She scowled at us as we walked by. What sort of harsh decisions, I said to Cheryl, like putting people out of the group, putting people down. Putting people down, I asked, killing them for endangering the group. Seriously? Endangering them how? Were they infected or something? I don't know, Cheryl replied. It was before I knew him. Well, that makes things a whole lot easier for me, I said. I definitely won't be sticking around. You should talk to Dan. Get him to come along. Danny is all about Andrew, she said, shaking her head. Let's get our things. When the time is right, we'll go. I don't think any of us is in danger from Andrew or the others, but the last thing we need is for Andrew to get a bigger head than he already has. As much as I hate to say it, Nicholas Somerville might be the only person with enough charisma to get everyone's attention. I packed a few things, but only as a pretense. The bulk of my things were still over at the Lassiter house, and some of my things were still sitting in that box in the hangar. I came out of the room I'd shared with Dan the night before. Cheryl was already standing by the door, with a bag on her back. Did you remember to get your dirty magazines, hon? she said with a straight face. Shut up, I said. Let's go. We were the first to return. Only twelve cars had been moved to make the wall on Broadway. That left twenty-eight in the hangar. Pick one in the front row, Cheryl said. I'm looking forward to when we clear out these in the front. I want to drive that Porsche back there. Porsche, I said. What Porsche? I walked inside the hangar, past the parked cars, to the black Porsche 911 in the corner. Shit, I said. I've got dibs on that one, she said. Where did this come from? I said, my voice sounding hoarse. They had it already, Cheryl said. Tim drove it over here from their other place. I stared at the car and felt sick. Tell me, tell me about their other place, I said softly. Did you see it? Cheryl came up beside me and put a hand on the left headlight of the car. It was out near Belfast. The original house had burned, but there was a windmill. They had electricity for a while, but it was damaged in a storm, and they didn't know how to fix it. Shit, I said again. What? Was Andrew with them at that time? Andrew has always been with them, she said. I heard a noise and looked outside. The others in the group were coming. Somerville was with them. When they entered the hangar, I pointed at the Porsche. What the hell is this? I shouted. 
Andrew got a befuddled look on his face. He looked around at the others, then looked at me. It's a sports car, he said. What about its original owner? I asked. What about him? Andrew said. He was one of those gays, Laney said. He's gone now. What did you do to him? I said. We asked him to leave our group, Andrew said. He agreed. Liar, I said. Stop it, Cheryl hissed. This ain't helping. God brought the plague on us because of people like him, Laney said. People like him, I said. Thoughts rushed at me faster than I could process. I remembered the men we'd met at Lowe's. They'd had the Porsche. Was there another man in your group? A man named Hank? Laney stepped forward. How do you know Hank? Hank was Laney's husband, Andrew said. He was killed. How did you know him? What's going on? Somerville asked. I didn't answer him. This was the group responsible for taking Brian's house and forcing him out on his own. It could be argued that they were responsible for his death, and ultimately Jen's death, too. I recognized the hypocrisy of those thoughts, particularly since they were coming days after I had scolded Christine for the same thing. It just seemed so obvious here. They were to blame. I pulled my pistol. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I didn't point it at anyone. It just seemed natural and comforting for me to hold it. Everyone else reacted by going for their own guns. Hold up, Cheryl said, putting herself between me and the rest of the group and raising both hands. Everything is fine. Obviously he's upset. It could be that he's upset for good reason. Let's everybody put their guns away and hear him out. The car belonged to a friend, I said. You were friends with him? Laney snorted. That says a lot, doesn't it? Any accusations I could have made would have never penetrated their self-righteousness. I glanced over at Somerville. He had a concerned look on his face, like I might say or do something to mess up any plans he might have made. I holstered my weapon and looked into their faces. I had so many things I wanted to say to them, but I couldn't put it into words. We'll need to put away our differences and work together, Andrew said. God sent you here to us. God can heal your heart. Work together, I said. Where was that sentiment when you shoved Brian out in the cold with a peanut butter sandwich and a car that barely worked? I thought we were being more than compassionate, considering, Laney said. Hush now, Laney, Andrew said. Then he spoke to me. That young man was a danger to our way of life. He defied my decisions at every turn. His house was overrun by the dead, and he had been bitten. He was obviously not fit. Like... This other man you have told us about, he had a mental sickness, and a sin sickness. Somerville came forward and took me aside. You need to let this go for now, he said softly, so the others couldn't hear. It ain't the right time for this. Like it or not, this is probably the last group of survivors left in this town. If we ever hope to do anything here, we're going to need them. Otherwise, let's just ride off Clayfield and give it to the dead. I shook my head and looked back out at the group. They wouldn't even help me find Sarah. I can't stand the sight of them now. Get over it, he said sternly. I'll smooth things over with Dan. He said he'd fly me down to Biloxi, but we'll have to help them seal the court square first. Fuck that, I said. You don't need him. Drive down there. You ain't hearing me, son, he said. I'm going to work with this group. This is all there is. The more healthy bodies we have, the better chance we have. Bide your time. Don't do anything stupid. I don't recall you being so careful when it came to Willie Roop and his bunch. A lot has happened since then, he said. 
I wasn't as desperate then as I am now. Just get in line and do what they want. Give me some time, and I'll have them eaten out of my hand. We looked out again, and the others were standing there staring at us. I just want to find Sarah, I said. We will, Somerville replied softly. Then, to the others, he said, We should drive as few cars as possible. We don't want to attract attention. Chapter 38 We drove over to the Lasseter place in the three vehicles. I rode with Somerville and the supplies. I didn't say anything on the way over. I was too angry. When we arrived, we set the gate into place and secured it. The others got out at the house and walked around, giving themselves a tour. I frowned at the condition of the place. A few weeks before, I had been proud about what I'd accomplished there, and I would have gladly welcomed visitors, but on that day, I was embarrassed. I immediately started straightening things out. This embarrassment over the condition of the property irritated me further. I was angry with myself for even caring what these people thought, yet I still cared. I pushed a trellis back into place, pushed some zombie bones back into the burn pile, righted an overturned barrel. Hail, son, calm down, Somerville said. You're fretting like an uptight housewife. They know what happened here. You ain't got to impress nobody. Leave me alone, I said. It's bad enough that I have to put up with these people. I can see you had a garden there, he interrupted. I stared at him, and he stared back. The expression on his face let me know we were changing the subject, and that was final. Fine, I said. I'll play along. I still see some green in there, he went on. It might be weeds, but it's green. I walked over to the fence and looked into the garden plot. It looks like some of the sweet potatoes might pull through, I said. They're putting on new leaves. What's that over there, he said, pointing to the corner. That is a weed, I said. But that over there on the other side is a pepper plant, I think. Not a total loss, then, he said. Andrew came up to us. This will do, he said. I'm grateful to you for your hospitality. We all have to help each other, don't we? I said with a sarcastic tone. We're all used to the generator power and running water at the airport, so we'll be roughing it here. Do you have plenty of candles? And what about rest facilities? There's a composting toilet in the barn on the right, I said. If you use the toilets in the house, you'll have to haul in water to flush them. I guess things are going to be a little hairy around here now that there are eight staying here. We'll manage, Andrew said. Dan will be here with the water later on. Of course, we could always just dig a latrine. Then he looked out toward the back pasture. Laney told me she saw a horse out there. Yeah, I said. I have a couple of chickens, too. Really? Don't get any ideas, I said. We're not cooking them. I'll need them. No, no, of course. I agree. You know, I think Dan is right. Eventually, we will need horses. Is that the only one you have? Yeah, I said. Cheryl and I saw another out not more than a couple miles from here. I know the general area where it might be. I don't know how much they wander from a given area, but maybe you could find it and catch it at some point. I know where there is a goat, too, if it hasn't been eaten already. That would be good, Andrew nodded. Any livestock would be good. We stood there a moment, not saying anything. Then Andrew broke the silence again. I'd like to get the others settled in. Is there a particular place you prefer to sleep? I wouldn't want to step on your toes. I sleep in that first bedroom at the top of the stairs, but it doesn't matter now. There is a queen bed in there, and there is a single in the other bedroom. I had to burn the other bed and the couch. In fact, the inside of the house probably smells pretty bad. We might all want to sleep in the barns tonight. 
Do you have some bleach? I'll get the others to work cleaning the inside of the house. Yeah, I said. I'll show you where. By dusk, the worst spots in the house had been scrubbed, and all the windows were open to air out the smell of chlorine. We sat across the length of the porch in the twilight, eating canned peaches and listening to crickets and frogs. There was little to no conversation. Ordinarily, I would have felt peaceful and comforting having the other healthy people around, but I was edgy and anxious. Dan and Tim arrived with the water after dark. Once everyone was sure of their safety, we all went to bed. The next day, I got up a little later than everyone else. I didn't like being the last one up, but it was nice to have coffee and food waiting for me. The others were sitting around in the kitchen, finishing their breakfast when I came downstairs. Morning, Dan said. Cheryl was telling us about the other horse you saw. I nodded while I poured myself a cup of coffee. I really didn't want to talk to anyone. We should catch it, he said. It looks like we might wait a day or two to get back to work in town, so we have time today. If that's what you want to do, I said. I didn't care. Cheryl can show you where. I'm going out to look for Sarah and Grant today. I won't be able to help you. Where are you planning to look? Somerville asked. The usual places, I said. Then I'll just drive around, I guess. I aim to come along, he said. How is it this farm doesn't have a livestock trailer? Dan said. It did, I said, but we moved it. Somebody took it later. I've seen more around. It won't be hard to find one. You'll have to find a truck to pull it unless Mr. Somerville will let you use his. Mine don't have a hitch, he said. You'll have to find another one. There's a truck in the hangar that has a hitch, Dan said. We'll go over there and pick it up. I'd stay clear of the airport for a while, Somerville said. But that's just me. You do what you want. I don't want to spend extra time looking for a truck, Dan said. This is a sure thing, and it won't take more than a couple of minutes to pick it up. I think we'll be fine. Suit yourself. Cheryl, Dan, and Gail loaded some guns, a halter, some rope, and a bag of sweet feed into the back of their car and left to go find a truck, trailer, and the horse. Somerville drove us the opposite direction in his truck. The rest stayed behind. Andrew told me they would do some work around the place and try to repair the cistern. I suppose he was making an effort to have a good relationship, but I knew it was only because I was an able-bodied man that could help him later, and he knew he wouldn't be able to manipulate me with religion. Let's check where her teacher was staying, I said. Do you remember how to get there? I think so. Somerville said. You ain't still pissed at me about yesterday, are you? I'm not happy about it, I replied. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I guess so. We were quiet for a while. Then I spoke again. In the beginning, this was all really scary, I said. But there was something freeing about it. Jen, Sarah, and I used to sit around and talk about all the things we'd be able to do now. There'd be no one to stop us or tell us we couldn't do it. We wouldn't have bills to pay or a society that disapproved. We'd dream about a time when the infected would die off. We'd take what we wanted, and we'd live like kings. I don't know, he said. Judy and I talked about things like that. We had quieter dreams, though. Nothing extravagant in mind. It doesn't matter, I said. It'll never be like that. The undead situation is brutal, but everything else is brutal, too. That's how we live now. That preacher and his group forced Brian out of his own house for no other reason than they disapproved of him. That's pretty damn brutal. Our selection of companions has gotten ugly. Well, now, Somerville said, slowing the truck, what do we have up here? Ahead, Two zombies were on their knees, facing each other over the center line. One of them held a large snapping turtle by its back legs and was attempting to chew through its shell. The other creature had one of the turtle's front legs, and the turtle was lashing out repeatedly, biting chunks out of the zombie's sinewy arm. 
Somerville stopped the truck. Have you ever eaten turtle? he asked me. No. It's tasty, he said, but they're a pain in the ass to butcher. You could lose a finger trying to catch them if you ain't careful. That's a big one there. We could throw it in the back of the truck. What do you think? I'd rather eat spam, I said. Somerville got out of the truck and walked out to them. He looked around, then pulled his pistol. He put one round each in their heads. The turtle dropped, landed on one of the creatures, and rolled onto its back in the road. It kicked at the air and extended its neck, trying to right itself. Somerville watched it a moment, then pushed it over with the toe of his boot. The turtle came forward quickly and bit the boot. Somerville danced back and fired two shots into the turtle's shell. He looked over at me, grinned, and shook his head. Then he holstered his weapon and returned to the truck. No good deed goes unpunished, he said. The little shit was home free, but he had to be a dumbass. Chapter 39 Somerville and I went to most of the same places Cheryl and I had gone the day before. When we stopped at Blaine's place, I took the time to dig up the garlic. We also picked a pailful of blackberries. It wouldn't be long before blackberry season would be over. Another week or two would do it. I had hoped to put more berries away in the form of preserves, but those plans had been sidetracked. Somerville was eager to get back on the road. The tall weeds that had taken over made him nervous. He acted irritated when I went to get the pail from Blaine's shed. Either we take an hour and pick these, or we leave them to go to waste, I said. There is no waiting for this stuff. They're ready now, and they won't be here in a couple of days after the birds find them. Speaking of birds, Somerville said. He was looking up. I followed his gaze. Two silver aircraft came over. They weren't silent, but they weren't very loud either. They were too high to give a detailed description without binoculars, but they were a basic airplane shape. Are they drones? I said. Yeah, he said. Do you think they're flying them out of Fort Campbell? Probably farther away, he replied. But I don't know what kind of range they have. We watched them fly east to west until we couldn't see them any more. Why weren't they sent out in the beginning? They were, he said. I guess that's what those reports were of cities getting bombed. I guess they stuck to the higher population centers. A fella in Bubble Land told me he'd seen helicopters, too. My guess is they'll burn out the bulk of the infected, then in a year or so they'll send ground troops into important places to do cleanup if they need to. Important places, I repeated. Don't ask me to define that, he said. I wouldn't know. Once we'd collected the berries and the garlic and loaded them into the truck, Somerville said, Where to now? I shook my head. One place is as good as the next. I'm hoping to get lucky. Do you think Cheryl is right? Do you think they left town? No, I said. Do you want to go out and help the others catch that horse? What for? A friendly gesture, I said. No, I said. Then I thought a moment. But we could go catch that goat. The farm that butts up against the back side of the Laster farm had a goat on the property. We haven't checked there, but there is a slim chance Grant and Sarah went there. All right, then. Let's go catch a goat. I was surprised to find the goat right away. It was still very much alive, even though there were a few of the undead walking around in the weeds with it. Catching him didn't happen right away, however. He didn't act frightened, he just treated us like a nuisance. We'd sneak up on him while he was eating, then at the very last second he'd run a short distance away. Several times we thought we had him, but he easily avoided us. Plus, we would have to stop every few minutes to club a zombie or two. Finally, we got him cornered in a barn. I grabbed his horns and held him while Somerville got a rope on him. He was incredibly strong, and it took everything we had to get him in the truck. 
When we brought him back to the Lassiter farm, Andrew, Tim, and Laney left their work at the cistern and walked over to meet us. Real meat, Laney said. I'm so tired of eating squirrels and rabbits. This isn't food, I said. We'll have to stick with squirrels a while longer, Laney, Andrew said, patting the goat. This is going to be part of our breed stock. My breed stock, I corrected. I caught it. The goat belongs to me. Andrew stared at me blankly. Of course. I was being presumptuous. That horse out there in the pasture belongs to me too, I said. And the chickens, just so you know. Right, he said. Of course. I don't mind sharing some stuff, but I don't want you thinking that you can lay claim to everything here. This is temporary. Stop being such a jerk, Laney said. No, Laney, Andrew said. He's right. We'll try to do the right thing around here. I do hope we can eventually move forward in the love of Jesus. I snorted and tugged the goat toward one of the barns. Once we got the goat secured in one of the stalls, Somerville took me aside again. Take it easy on the old man, he said. You're just showing everybody your cards and your ass. You'll never know when you need these people. I took the garlic into the other barn. Somerville followed me. I can drive to Biloxi, he said, but it sure would be nice to have five hundred miles worth of zombies, gangs, and burning land beneath me instead of around me. Hell, that's a thousand miles there and back. I found some old window screens and spread out the garlic on them to cure. Ain't you gonna say nothing? he said. Fine, I said. I'll be nice. Let's get the berries. Maybe they'll be appeased with berries. That's what Jesus would do. I went out to the truck and got the pail of blackberries and took them to the others. Any of you canned before? I asked. Andrew nodded. We put away some of our garden every year. I have a book that tells how to do it, but I'd feel better if someone with experience did it. He took the bucket of berries, then looked up at me. You want us to can them for you? No, I said. I'm trying to apologize. I want you to have them. You can make some preserves for the winter if you want. Why not eat them while they're fresh? And save your canning supplies for next year or the year after. I've been trying to preserve any extra produce, but I guess there isn't much extra now. There's still plenty of food out there, Andrew said. Once we get set up and secured in town, I plan to concentrate on preparing for winter. Do whatever you want, I said. They're your berries now. Thank you he said. We'll all share in God's bounty. Dan, Cheryl, and Gail returned at dusk. Gail and Cheryl arrived in the car, and Dan came in right after them in a pickup, pulling a little two-horse trailer. We all moved out to the front porch. When the truck was parked, Dan hopped out. Did you catch it? Andrew said. Yeah, she's in there, Dan said, sounding a little frantic. There's a fire in town. It's big. We saw it before we left. You can see it from here. Everyone got up and walked out into the yard so they could look toward the town. We didn't have a good view because of trees, but I could make out the glow. Well, Somerville said in a resigned tone, I guess we all know what this means. Shouldn't we try to do something? Gail said. Are you sure that is downtown? Andrew said. Pretty sure, Dan said. Why don't we drive out that way to see? The tanker truck ain't all the way full, but we got a lot of water. We could try to put it out. We need to stay put, Somerville said. They could be out flying around. They probably have heat sensors and night vision. Hell, they could just see your headlights. I hate to say it, but let it burn. Councilman, would they target the buildings? Andrew said. Maybe it's the mob that's burning. Could be, Somerville replied. I don't know if it matters. 
That stuff they're using is a lot like napalm. It splatters and burns. I've seen them fire into buildings when they thought someone was inside. Andrew, give the word, and I'll try to put it out, Dan said. The others turned to Andrew and waited for him to make a decision. He was quiet a moment, then he sighed. God led me to retake Clayfield and the church, he said. We just need to trust God will protect it. Maybe this is divine providence. Maybe he's using this to destroy our enemies. Yeah, Somerville said. Go with that. We're just going to watch it burn? Gale said. We're going to cry out to God, Andrew replied. Let's get that horse put up, then we'll put on a pot of coffee. We're going to pray for rain. Nicholas Somerville, Cheryl, and I didn't stay up with the others. We didn't pray, and it didn't rain. I don't know about Cheryl and Somerville, but I didn't sleep very much either. I lay awake, worrying about Sarah and the town and everything. My mom always told me that worry was faith in reverse. Maybe my worry negated the faith of the others. I did worry pretty hard. When the sun rose, I had already been up for an hour. I was standing alone in the front yard with a cup of coffee, looking to the west when Somerville came outside. No rain, he said flatly. How'd you sleep? I didn't much, I replied. He looked with me toward Clayfield. Is the fire out? Looks like it, I said. I don't even see smoke. He nodded. Who left? What? The Prius is gone. I turned and looked at the driveway. The little car was missing. I don't know, I said. I didn't hear anyone leave. You wouldn't have heard it, he said. It's a Prius. The front door opened, and Gail stepped out. She gave us a timid wave and sat down. Good morning, Somerville said. Who left? Do you know? Dan and Pastor Andrew drove into town to have a look when they saw the fire was dying, she replied. When was this? Dunno, she shrugged. After we got done praying, during the night. Were they coming right back, or did they plan to stay a while? he asked. Dunno, she shrugged again. He turned back to me. It's just as well, he said. I was going to suggest the same thing. I don't see the point of everybody going, but it's a good idea to send a couple of people to scout it out. The powers that be might be satisfied with the damage they've done here and plan to move on. They don't completely clean out the infected? What I saw in Missouri was they'd go where the crowds were. Sometimes that meant there were survivors there, and sometimes not. In that case, we dodged a bullet, I said. Sarah and Christine had every zombie for miles surrounding this place for days. We're lucky the aircraft weren't in the area then. The place is still surrounded, Somerville said. What's up with all the dead bodies on the ground outside of the back pasture? Grant and Christine did that, I said. I can't move them. There are too many. Let's just hope they're not too obvious from the air. They might decide to hit this farmhouse just to make sure. Chapter 40 Within an hour, everyone was up. There was plenty of oatmeal and coffee. Dan and Andrew returned as we were finishing breakfast, and they had someone with them. When the little silver car quietly stopped, Andrew and Dan got out. Then Andrew held open the back door, while Grant crawled out of the back seat, when I saw him through the window, I stood without thinking, and my cereal bowl fell from my lap to the floor. Sarah, I whispered. I ran out of the house to meet them. Where's Sarah? Others from the house came outside and gathered around us. Grant had a deer-in-the-headlights look on his face. His pants were torn and singed and stained with blood. His left arm was in a sling made from his own ripped T-shirt, and his hand was wrapped in another bloody cloth. His eyes moved over me as if he didn't recognize me. He ain't said nothing since we found him, 
Dan said. Do you know him? Yeah, I said. Grant. This is Grant. What happened? I don't know, Andrew said. We found him in the county jail of all places. The poor boy won't talk to us and won't let us see to him. I think maybe he's messed himself. What happened? I said again, staring into Grant's wide and scared eyes. Where's Sarah? He shook his head. He took her. I couldn't stop him. I looked down at the sling. Can we see your arm? He looked down, then up at me again. I think he's in shock or something, Andrew said. We just led him around like an old mare on a rope. He's just a big puppy dog like this. Grant, is your arm broken? I asked slowly, as if talking to a small child. He shook his head. What about your hand? I asked, reaching for the bloody cloth sticking out of the sling. No, he said. Don't touch it. Cheryl stepped in. Let me take him, hon. I know some first aid, and Tim was trained as a field medic. I looked back at Tim. Really? Tim was in the military? Let us take your friend, she said. We'll do our best. They led Grant into the house, and I turned back to Andrew. You found him in the jail? The jail had caved in on one side, Dan said. We could see straight down into the lower level. He was down in there in the corridor between the cells. He had a case of MREs, an empty water jug, and half a bottle of Jack in there with him. Let me have the keys to that Prius, I said. I'm going out to look for Sarah. Cool your jets, son, Somerville said from behind me. We need to get some information from that boy first. Ain't no sense in driving around with no direction in mind. I can't just sit around, I said. At least when I thought she was with Grant, I thought he could keep her safe, but... Cheryl ran out of the house and headed for one of the cars. Cheryl? I gotta get the other medical supplies, she said. His fingers have been cut off. He ain't got nothing but a thumb and a pinky on that left hand. I started to go to the house, but Somerville stopped me. Let them do their work. Andrew seemed unfazed by all of it. To me, it came across as being callous. He raised his arms and motioned the others to gather around. I am pleased to report the town is still there for the most part. Praise God, Andrew said. Several buildings were destroyed on the northeast side within a couple of blocks from the courthouse. We did lose three buildings on the east side of the square, but they'd already been damaged by the fire from the drugstore. City Hall and the police station were both heavily damaged. The National Bank across the street was, too. It's gutted. The trees and grass on the courthouse lawn burned, and the courthouse itself is a little scorched, but it's still there. The cars we parked were burned, but still functional as a wall. The important thing is that the church was unharmed, except for a few broken windows. Hundreds of the dead have been destroyed. These drones were a gift from God. That's great news, Somerville said. But don't be lulled into thinking the drones are our friends. They'd burn you if they got the chance. God will protect us, Andrew said with a broad smile. He's working all things out for our good. Now... I'm ready for something to eat. After breakfast, I think we should resume our work on the court square. I think you should wait a while, Somerville said. The last thing we want to do is all be out together as a group with those birds in the air. Besides, right now, the important thing is finding that girl. Sarah has been out there now for days, and now we know she's in this bastard's hands. She should be our priority. Once Grant is up to talking, we can split up and search. We'd be less obvious like that. Have faith, Councilman, Andrew said. 
Somerville looked at me and under his breath said, I'm still waiting for the rain. Andrew, Dan, Gale, and Laney went into the house, but I just kept standing there in the driveway. I was nonplussed. Nicholas Somerville stood there with me quietly digging at the ground with the toe of his boot. Then he sighed heavily and said, Sometimes we have to make concessions. I know I'm new now, just coming back and all, but I'm real desperate to see this group stay together and for it to include us. We're running out of people in this world. We can give Andrew some reins here. You've changed some, I said. Nah, he said. I'm the same old Nick. I was kind of hard in the beginning because I thought I needed to be. But I held public office once, too, you know. You don't get anything done in that job if you don't know how to placate. Who's going to placate me? Listen, son, what we do here is we advise, then we sit back and make them think it was their idea. I know just enough Bible to be dangerous. I think I can come up with some scriptures that I can throw around in conversation to make Andrew and the others think about their actions. Meanwhile, Sarah could be a hundred miles away, I said sullenly. Ain't nobody stopping you from looking, he said. You can leave now and look for her, but all you're going to do is waste time and gasoline until we hear what Grant has to say. I looked at the ground. I knew he was right. Even in a little town like Clayfield, it would take weeks to do a door-to-door -door search. We had a similar talk, me and you, at the river a few weeks back, remember? He said. I nodded. I know you need to find her. I need to find Judy. You don't need Sarah for that, I said softly. Grant is back now. He could show you. It ain't going to be like that. We'll find that girl, then I'll get them to fly me south. With any luck, I'll talk that whole bunch in Biloxi into coming here to Clayfield. We need to build our numbers here. I can be persuasive. I surprise even myself sometimes. Cheryl came out to the porch, then stopped. Am I interrupting? No, I said. Did he say anything? She walked down the porch and came out to us. Then she hesitated before she spoke again. What? I said. He fought Bruce, trying to protect Sarah. He lost his fingers when he grabbed the blade of the sword. Where's Sarah? He doesn't know, she said. But he said that Bruce took her and he wasn't gentle about it. He beat on her some. He raped her there on the road. I felt tears burning my eyes, and I turned my head so they couldn't see my face. He wasn't alone, Cheryl continued. There were others with him. Grant said he saw at least three more. What? I said. Where would he find others? Maybe they were with him the whole time, and... No, I said. When I saw him, he was alone. He said he was with a group, but he never led me to believe they were close by. Makes sense, Somerville said. I doubt anyone could survive out there very long without someone to watch their back. I did, I said. Until lately, I haven't had anybody but me. I don't know what to make of it. Cheryl said. I was just about to tell Andrew. Everyone will want to know if there's a possibility of trouble from another gang. We can't wait any longer, I said. Now that we know what there is to know, we have to go out. We have to do something. Somerville nodded. Okay, but what and where? I don't know. I'd say the court square would be a good place to start. I'm sure that fire attracted their attention as much as it did ours. He might have left now that he's got her, Cheryl said. They could be anywhere. Well, if we don't find them in a couple of days, I'll head west, I said. She told me he was headed west when she met him. West is kind of general, don't you think? Somerville said. What else do I have? I'm going in to talk to the others, Cheryl said. They need to know. I have a few more guns that I haven't moved from the barns, I said. I'm going to get them. Get everyone ready to go. 
Chapter 41 I left them and went into one of the barns. From one of the stalls I retrieved the wheelbarrow. Then I pushed it to the base of the loft's ladder. Leaving it, I climbed up. In the loft, I kept a twenty-two rifle, a twelve-gauge shotgun, and the Lupara-style 410. There were also two boxes of shells for each weapon. I hauled them down to the wheelbarrow, then pushed it to the second barn. From that barn, I collected a twenty-two revolver, a thirty-aught thirty, and another twelve-gauge, along with two more boxes of shells for each. I did all of this in a daze. It didn't feel real. It seemed so much quieter around me. The air was hot and still. When I returned to the house, I could hear loud voices inside. How the hell do you justify that? It just ain't Christian. Somerville was using his persuasive, sweet-talking skills on Andrew. You ain't gonna talk that way, Dan said on his feet. Andrew is a man of God, and the only light we got right now. Somerville rubbed his eyes and took a breath. All right, he said. All right, look, I'm sorry. I lost my head there for a second. It's just that girl ain't got nobody but us. Surely God would want us to go out looking. And we shall, Councilman, Andrew said in an impatient tone. But if we're going to make a trip into town looking for her, why not seal the square while we're there? Surely you can see the logic in that. It seems to me you have your priorities in the wrong place, Somerville said. Things have quieted down, Andrew said. We'll make a quick run over to the airport. We'll get a few more supplies. Then we'll each drive over to the square. I think that will do it for the short term. We should be able to seal it well enough to give us safe passage in and out of the church on the 7th Street entrance. Dan was telling me that we could string up welded wire or barbed wire to cover any holes or weak spots. Fuck the damn wall, I yelled, and fuck you. All eyes were on me, and the room got uncomfortably quiet. Every minute that passes is another minute that he could be hurting her, I continued. I spent time with him. He's a sociopath, and he's pissed at Sarah. Do you understand? Andrew cleared his throat. There is no excuse for that sort of language. We don't use offensive words in our group. Something in me snapped. I used to hear about that. I used to hear people say it. I always thought it was a figure of speech, but I literally heard a snap. Then my whole body was awash in what felt like liquid rage. The next thing I knew, I had Andrew by the throat, and I was trying to shove that 410 up his nose. Guns sprang out around the table, but I ignored them. Brian and Jen died because of what you did, but you're offended by a word. Let him go, Dan said. I could hear his voice shaking. You offer nothing to this group, old man, I continued. No fucking thing. I think that makes you a burden. I looked up at the others. Dan, Gale, and Laney were aiming their pistols at me. I felt no fear. I pushed Andrew hard, and he fell backward in his chair to the kitchen floor. I waited for one of them to shoot me, but they didn't. Andrew's nose was bleeding. He tried to get up. I'm going to take the Prius and look for Sarah, I said in a surprisingly calm tone. Y'all can kiss my ass. I turned and left the house, got my wheelbarrow, and pushed it out to the car. To the west, I could see a dark bank of clouds. It would be a horrible time for a rain. It would be a coincidence that would solidify the group around the pastor, Yet the air was so still and heavy. Cheryl came out after me. They won't help you now, she said. You know that, right? They weren't going to help me anyway, I said, loading the guns into the car. They're more concerned about building their fort and not saying bad words. The front door opened. 
and Somerville came outside and joined us. What kind of shit was that? he said. Like I said, kiss my ass, was my reply. He sighed and shook his head. So, you're just going out by yourself? I don't know. Am I? Hell, I'll go with you, he said. Is your head clear? Are you going to be pulling stupid stunts like you did in there? I loaded the last gun to the car and shut the door. Maybe. Do you even know where you're going? I told you. I'm going to start at the court square and work my way from there. The front door of the house opened again. Andrew, Dan, and Laney came out on the porch and stopped there. I don't hold no grudge on you, Andrew said, wiping his nose. We're going to help you today, but after that, I'm afraid we're going to have to go our separate ways. Fuck you, I said. You need to show some respect, Laney said. The pastor is trying to do right by you. He's turning the other cheek. I got in the car, started it, then rolled down the window. You coming? I said to Somerville. Yeah, he said. I'll be along directly. I'll drive my truck and meet you at the courthouse. I need to talk with these people a bit. Whatever, I said. I was on autopilot. I don't remember the drive into town. I just kept replaying everything in my head. I came in from South 6th Street and had to stop at Water Street. Pastor Andrew's assessment of the town's condition had been grossly optimistic. Downtown Clayfield was hollow and black. There was not a single blade of grass, not a single pane of glass. The buildings that had survived the fire looked like empty shells. The dead lay in charred, bony heaps in the streets. I armed myself and got out of my car. It was even hotter here. The area had retained some of the heat from the fire. The bricks and asphalt and metal were still warm, and some of it still smoked. A cool breeze moved between the buildings and brushed my skin. The contrast between this and the actual temperature was noticeable and out of place. Ash fluttered and danced over the ground. I walked over charred bones on my way up 6th toward Broadway. The wall of cars was ahead. The courthouse was to my left. There were four zombies on Broadway near the Hill Hotel. They'd been burned, too. They were black and blistery but somehow they had survived. They were the only ones. It was as if the creatures knew what had happened here and were staying away. I broke open the 410 to double-check it. Both barrels were loaded. I snapped it shut and pulled the pistol on my hip to check the magazine. I had extra ammunition in my pockets. I was as ready as I could be. My first stop would be the county jail, which was adjacent to the courthouse. If Grant had been shut up in there by Bruce, then maybe there would be some clue in there as to where I could find him and Sarah. Then I detected the sound of an alarm far away. Because of the buildings, I couldn't get a fix on the direction from which it was coming. I stood still and listened. I looked over to the creatures by the old hotel. They didn't act interested. I tried my best not to make any noise. It was difficult to be quiet when the ground was littered with brittle bones that crunched and snapped under my boots. The breeze picked up, and the ash took to the air and swirled like snow. To my left was the fire truck that had been left there by Nathan Camp's people. It was as black as everything else. Then I heard laughter. I stopped and stood still again, holding my breath, I was standing on the corner of 6th and Broadway on what had once been the sidewalk around the courthouse lawn. Over on 7th Street, I saw the source of the laughter. Two men came out of the old shoe store, Andrew's selected building. They were both carrying pry bars, and they were talking. I couldn't make out their words. They looked my direction, but didn't react. One of them said something 
The other laughed again, and they headed north, toward the hotel. I suppose they thought I was a zombie. I moved toward Andrew's wall of cars that were lined up on the other side of the road. I tried to put some odd movements in my gait, so they wouldn't suspect I was a healthy man. Of course, if they looked closely enough and thought about it, they would have noticed my clothing, mask, and guns. I made it to the line of cars and stopped. All that remained of the vehicles was the metal. Everything else had been burned away. I put my hand on the hood of the car beside me. It was still uncomfortably hot, and I couldn't stand to touch it for more than a few seconds. The men ignored me. They were approached by the four creatures. They put the zombies down quickly using the pry bars. The ash moved around more, and the stiff breeze felt good against my face. Above us, the dark clouds piled up from the west. I watched them bludgeon the things and tried to decide what to do. It would be naive for me to think they were only armed with pry bars. Surely they had hidden firearms or maybe friends somewhere out of sight watching out for them. Still, they were my only lead. If there was a chance they knew where Sarah was, I had to get the information from them. I stumbled toward them, doing my best to mimic the stride of the undead. Then, behind me, I heard a vehicle approaching from East Broadway. I presumed it was Somerville coming to join me in my search, and I cursed at his bad timing. I turned and looked east. As it got closer, I realized it wasn't him. It was the yellow firebird decorated with human heads. I started to lift the lupara when I noticed something that caused me to utter a gasp of shock and caused my whole body to close down for a moment. Front and center, mounted like a hood ornament, was Sarah's severed head. Chapter 42 At first, I couldn't breathe. Then the breaths came quick and loud, as if I was vomiting air. I couldn't move, yet the car kept coming. In fact, it sped up and steered toward me. I continued to stare at Sarah's vacant, pallid face. Her eyes were closed, and her forehead was dark and scabby. A sound came out of me over which I had no control. It was something like a whine, something like a groan. A second before the car hit, I found my legs and jumped onto the hood of the burned car that was nearest me. The yellow hot rod scraped along where I had been standing, taking out the fender. The jolt against my vehicle combined with my own momentum sent me tumbling over the car to the sidewalk on the other side. The muscle car rolled over bones and bodies, then turned the corner onto 7th Street and was blocked from view by the abandoned fire truck on the courthouse lawn. I stood and pulled my pistol. I heard the rumble of the firebird as it idled there for a moment, then the engine shut off. A door opened and closed. I still didn't have a line of sight. I looked to my right. The men moved toward the car. I felt dizzy with shock and grief over what I'd seen. I couldn't think. I listened to my own breath. Why would you do that? I said. Hey, asshole, Bruce Lee yelled. I let you live, and how do you repay me, huh? You killed Leia, and you stole my Romulan warbird? You stole my damn warbird! He finally came into view. The motherfucker was still dressed like a Klingon. He had a bulging messenger bag over his right shoulder. The katana sword was in one hand, and the AA-12 in the other. His eyes found mine and locked there. He was expressionless. I lifted the 410, but I was so overcome by rage and grief that I fired wild. He didn't move. He didn't even flinch. Then, briefly, an almost undetectable smug grin crossed his lips, then vanished. But I saw it. I saw it, and it pushed me into a further state of passion. 
I wailed and fired again. I missed by a mile. What is that? He said in a friendly tone. Is that a snake gun? The two men ran in from the hotel, pulling pistols from their waistbands. I got this, Bruce said. The men looked back and forth between us as if trying to make up their minds. Hang back. I got this, Bruce ordered. They nodded and put their guns away. Why the hell would you bring a little two-shot snake gun? Two creatures came in behind him from the courthouse. He saw them and turned to face them. Hell yeah, he shouted. Come on, then. His blade sliced through the air and lopped off the head of the closest creature. The other came near. Bruce pivoted and lashed out with a beautiful roundhouse kick and tagged the thing on its rotting ear. I was surprised at Bruce's agility and balance considering his size. He surprised me again by dropping low and sweeping the creature's legs with another deft kick. The zombie landed on its side and immediately lost its head to the downward arc of the katana. That's what I'm talking about, Bruce laughed. I was so dumbfounded by the whole situation that I hadn't noticed how closely the things were gathering in around me from the bank. The female behind me was right at arm's length. I dropped the now empty 410 and pulled my pistol. It was just in time. The barrel pushed into her eye socket and I blew the back of her head out. I put down another one. Then I turned my pistol toward Bruce again. He saw what I was doing and pulled a creature in front of him like a shield. The bloated thing stumbled in between us just as I fired, and a yellowish fluid spewed from its back. The two men pointed their guns at me. Bruce yelled at me. You're about to get your ass kicked if you don't stop shooting at me. And you two, I said, I got this. I bellowed with rage and frustration, then leapt sliding over the roof of the burned car like a 1970s TV action star. I was out of my mind. He shoved his shield aside and met me in the street. I lifted my pistol once more, and he slapped me in the head with the flat side of his sword. I lost my weapon and went to my knees. I heard the two men laughing. We were supposed to be friends, he said. You lied to me. You stole my stuff. And you insulted me. I clutched the side of my head and tried to see through blurry eyes. My senses swarmed in at me again with a roar. You killed her. Why do you have such a burr up your ass? He said. Is this about that cunt, Sarah? You said you didn't know her. Why should you care? She got what was coming to her. I roared then scrambled to my feet. I tried to hit him, but my arms flailed in a windmill. I fell again, sobbing. He got a big laugh out of it. I'm going to kill you, I said. You are not, he said. You're just being a pussy. Okay, boys, hold him for me. He turned his back to me and slashed a zombie in half at the waist. The two men moved in, each grabbing one of my arms, and lifted me to my feet. Bruce returned his attention to me and sniffed. I don't know, brother. I don't think the two of us can be friends anymore if you're going to keep acting like this. Thunder rumbled. The sky was taking on a yellowish-green cast. I saw you with that group at the shopping center, he said. I noticed you got a woman. Where is she? Do you have other women I don't know about? There are no women, I said. One of the men punched me in the kidney. I can make him tell us where she is, he said. Shut the fuck up, Brad, Bruce yelled. Nobody asked you, Brad. Bruce stepped back and extended the sword so that the tip of it touched the tip of my nose. The stench of the juices dripping from the blade was sickening. Tell you what, he said, I'll put the katana away, and the two of us can settle this like gentlemen. If you win, you can keep the warbird. If I win, you have to return it, and I'm going to want an apology. What about the women? 
the other man said. He said there was women here. For the love of God, Bruce yelled. I've got this. A gust of wind pushed through and whipped at our clothes and hair. He walked over to the fire truck on the courthouse lawn and put his sword on the hood. Then he did the same with the AA-12. Let him go, he said, bobbing from side to side and hopping in place. Then watch me work. The men stepped away. Bruce and I were about twenty feet apart. I didn't know how to fight, not like him. I knew enough from watching TV that I should not make the first move. Those martial arts classes were for self-defense. He'd be trained to counter my attack. Maybe he wasn't as skilled at offense. Maybe I could grab his leg when he kicked and push him down. Maybe I could see it coming and dodge. I wondered if martial arts training even mattered in a real fight. It was probably just something that looked pretty in the movies. It mattered. I saw a blur coming at my face. When I moved to protect it, he punched me in the crotch. I went straight to my knees. Then I saw stars when his fist connected to my jaw. The toe of his boot found my solar plexus, and the pain was blinding. I lay there on the sidewalk in front of the courthouse and the bones and ash, trying to catch my breath, and Bruce seemed completely relaxed. What happened here? he said. Why'd you burn the town? The wind threw ash in my face and eyes. What's up with all the cars? He said, standing over me and looking around. Why are you lining them up like that? I didn't answer him. You trying to copy me? He grinned. You know, I was lining my yellow cars up for a reason. They were vamp bait. I rolled onto my back, gasped for air then rolled over again and tried to crawl away through the bones and charred bodies. Stay put, he said, and kicked me in the side. He took a few steps away from me and kicked an approaching zombie in the face. Then he looked at the line of cars again. Why don't you just go away, I said, feeling empty inside. You got what you came for. You got your revenge. Sarah's dead. She is that. I rolled onto my back and kicked out at him. He laughed when I missed. You are such a pussy, he grinned. What about my warbird? Where is it? I tried to kick him again, and he dodged, then stomped me in the crotch. I curled up in a ball as the pain crept into my belly. If you get me the warbird, I won't let Brad and Oz anywhere near your woman. How's that for a deal? I took a breath. Bruce looked to the east and stepped away from me. I rolled onto my side. Nicholas Somerville had pulled up in his truck next to the remains of the drugstore. Then there was gunfire. Pull the truck around, Bruce yelled. Then the first fat drop of rain hit me in the face. Chapter 43 Another drop of rain fell and hit the ground in front of me, then another. I watched Somerville get out of his truck and take a shot at Bruce. Then he ran for cover behind a partial wall of one of the collapsed buildings. The sky flickered and thunder rumbled again. The rain got a little harder. It dotted the ground and punched small holes in areas of deeper ash causing a hiss when it touched the hot embers beneath. Near my head, not more than a foot away, the water streaked through the ash on a warped metal plate that had once been a historical marker. The wooden base to which it had been attached was burned up, but the plaque itself remained, partially covered by a human rib cage. The words were difficult to read, but I didn't need to read them. I knew what it said. I knew where I was. On that very spot where I lay, there had once been a tree. On and around that tree, more than two hundred men and women had lost their lives. During the Civil War, executions of Confederate soldiers and Confederate sympathizers took place there daily for more than a month after Union soldiers took the town. 
Some of the killings were hangings, others were from gunfire, but they all died in or around that tree. After the war, executions, both legal capital punishment and illegal lynchings, were not unheard of. The tree had been cut down before I was born, but whenever I visited the spot, I could feel it there. The space felt heavy, as if the ghosts of all those tortured souls remained. I thought I could feel them there then. They were waiting for me to join them. I would haunt this spot with those spirits that had died violent, fear-filled deaths. In that moment, I felt that it was fitting that I should die there. It seemed poetic. Jen was gone. Sarah was gone. Everything that gave me hope was gone. There was something freeing about that moment. I didn't feel the need to struggle anymore. Then I was yanked from my musings by the rapid blasts of the AA-12. I didn't see Mr. Somerville, but the automatic shotgun chiseled away at his cover. I rolled and looked toward the fire truck. Bruce strode toward the rubble on 6th Street, firing the weapon with one hand. The empty shell casings flew out of the side of it in a red blur. He stopped a moment and changed out the magazine canister. You can't hide from this thing, my brother, he yelled. Then the sky opened up with wind and water. It got dark. The temperature dropped ten degrees. The AA-12 came to life again. Slowly, I got to my feet and looked around. There was the Klingon with his war machine. Over there were five walking corpses, disoriented by the noise and heavy downpour. I noticed a charred, leafless tree waving its blackened branches. To my right, where Mr. Somerville hid, were flying chips of brick and stone. Behind me, stumbling up the street, was another corpse, and behind it, another. None of it seemed to have anything to do with me. My eyes found the yellow firebird. I got a shiver. I moved toward it, marching into the wind and driving rain. Bruce paused and looked over at me. Where are you going? he yelled. I ignored him. Somerville took the opportunity to slip his gun over the wall and fire off two rounds. Thunder crashed. Somerville fired again. Then Bruce, with an annoyed look on his face, resumed his volley. I plodded forward toward the firebird. The sounds of the gunfire and weather faded from my awareness. The cold rain stung my face and soaked my clothes. A tattered piece of cloth, perhaps the remnants of an awning from one of the local businesses, caught up in the wind sailed by. I crossed the courthouse lawn and on to 7th Street. I stepped in front of the firebird and looked down into Sarah's face. Her wet hair was plastered to her forehead and cheeks. Rain dripped from the end of her nose. Her eyes were shut, and her lips were parted. She looked like she was asleep. Beneath the soaked hair I noticed scratches in her forehead. Hesitantly, I reached out and pushed the hair aside. The scratches were actually a word that had been carved there. My mouth formed the word, but I couldn't speak. Suddenly, her eyelids fluttered and opened. Gray, milky orbs had replaced her beautiful eyes. I took a step back. Oh, Sarah, sweetheart, I'm so sorry. I reached for my pistol, but my holster was empty. I'd dropped my guns during my altercation with Bruce Lee. The wind increased, and pea-sized hail pecked against the car and bounced in the road. A branch cracked and fell from one of the burned trees on the courthouse lawn. Ahead and to the north, near the next cross street, a frail zombie toppled over and rolled in the wind. Then vehicles arrived from the south. Behind me, coming to a stop more than a block away on South 7th Street, were four cars. I turned to see them and their bright headlights hit me in the face. I stood there and waited. I was unarmed, 
and lacked any motivation to fight. They parked two abreast in the street. Doors opened. Still I waited. The hailstones beat me and gathered around my feet in the crevices between the zombie bones. They fell and piled until it looked like snow. I didn't hear anything but my own breathing. I sat down in the bones and the tiny balls of ice. Time passed. It felt like hours, but it was only a few seconds. The hail changed back to rain. Dark, blurry shapes approached me in the downpour, moving in and out of the high beams. They might have been running, but I couldn't tell. They might have been zombies. I didn't know. I didn't care. Thunder crashed again. There were faces in front of me. Hands gripped my shoulder. Is he injured? One said. Where's the councilman? Said another. Sarah was my reply. That's the yellow car he told us about, another said. The man must be in the area. Then everything sort of came into focus again. I could smell the wet and the ash. I could hear the wind and the patter of the rain. I could see Cheryl in front of me with Dan, Gail, and Andrew. Are you hurt? she said. I didn't know how to describe how hurt I was. The rain slowed. We heard machine guns when we were coming in, Cheryl said. Are you okay? I looked toward Sixth Street. Somerville's truck was gone. Bruce was gone. Had any of it even happened? I turned to see if the firebird was still behind me. Maybe we... No, the yellow car was still there with all of its trophies. Sarah's head gazed down at me. She blinked. Her tongue slid out, then went back in. Are you okay? Cheryl asked again, squatting next to me. I couldn't answer her. Behind Andrew's vehicle, more headlights. It was Nicholas in his truck. Councilman! Andrew shouted. Are you hurt? He made his way toward us with his pistol in his hand. He was limping. I stood on wobbly legs, and Cheryl stood with me. The others went out to meet him, but he pushed past them and came straight to me. What the hell happened to you, son? He said in an angry tone. I thought you were dead. Then I saw you get up and walk away. I thought you turned or something. I almost shot you. I reached over and stroked Sarah's wet head. Her mouth opened and shut, trying to bite me. I found her, I said. Chapter 44 They escorted me to a car and put me in the back seat. Cheryl got behind the wheel and cranked it. When the wiper blades raked away the muddy ash from the windows, I could see Andrew, Somerville, and Gail in front of the yellow firebird. Dan was walking up the street toward the hotel. Cheryl put her arm up on the seat and turned so she could see to back out. Her eyes found mine. She was crying, but she didn't say anything. We backed away. I watched the others through the windshield. Somerville put his pistol to Sarah's head. I looked down at my lap. The report of the gun startled me. Then we backed away. I spent the rest of the day in my bedroom, on the bed, staring at the ceiling. At some point, I fell asleep. The next morning, Cheryl came in with a tray of food and set it on the dresser. Do you think you could eat something? She said. I shook my head. Can I get you anything? Does Grant know? I asked. I should talk to him. I told him last night, she said. He's sleeping now. Tim gave him some painkillers. I nodded and continued to stare at the ceiling. Cheryl came over and sat on the bed. She took my hand and held it with both of hers. There ain't nothing I can say, she said. I know. We sat there quietly a while. Then there was a knock 
and Somerville pushed the door open. They exchanged a nod, then Cheryl patted my hand and left the room. Nicholas came in and leaned against the dresser. You going to eat? he said. Not hungry, I replied. He picked up a cracker from my plate and put it in his mouth. What happened yesterday? I said. I was hoping you knew, Somerville replied. I tried to chase them when they left, but I couldn't find them. I'm surprised he left the car. I'm not, I said. He made it for her. Andrew asked that I come talk to you, Somerville said. We can't let this man live. It's not about revenge, but you can use that if it will make it easier. For the safety of everyone here, of everyone everywhere, we have to put him down. We're going out to look for him. Everyone is on board with this. All right, I said. We kept his car, he said. It's out in the driveway right now, but we'll move it soon. I propped myself up on my elbows and looked hard at Somerville. Jesus, man, we thought we could use it to draw him out. Not likely, I said. Sarah, Sarah ain't on it no more, he said. We took care of her. We buried her. We plan to have a service as soon as you're up to it. I don't want a damn service, I said. Get that car out of my driveway. This is different, he said, ignoring me. We've had run-ins with other people, but this is the first time we ever went looking to kill somebody. It feels different. It doesn't feel like anything, I said, and laid back. I just want to sleep right now. Can we talk about this later? Somerville stood there a moment, then said, No. We're going out now, and we need everyone in on this. He's got more firepower than we do, and we don't know how many men he has with him. I need you out of bed and ready to go in fifteen minutes. I sat up again and looked at him. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. This is important. Andrew and the others think it would be negligent of us to allow him to leave and let him hurt someone else. I agree with them. Negligent? I scoffed. Negligent? Now there's an interesting word coming from Andrew. I know, he said. We'll sort through all this after we take care of this Lee fella. I sighed and threw my legs over the side of the bed. Somerville nodded, satisfied. I'm sorry as hell about Sarah, he said. I'll meet you downstairs. Try to eat. You'll need your strength. As I walked out, I said, The preacher got his rein. I know, Somerville said, without breaking stride. We'll never hear the end of it. I came downstairs about ten minutes later. I looked into the bedroom and saw Grant asleep on some blankets in the floor. I found Cheryl in the kitchen putting food and water into backpacks. Are you going? she said. Yeah, I replied. I don't want to, but I am. None of us want this, but it has to be done. I don't give a shit at this moment, I said. She zipped up the bags, then turned to me. I'm staying here with Grant, she said. He has a fever, and I'm going to keep an eye on him. Here, take these bags out when you go. I nodded and pulled the bags from the counter. She gave me a sympathetic look and patted my face. You stay alive, she said. I always do, I replied. The others were standing in the driveway by the Prius. They were all armed. Tim, Somerville, and Gail had binoculars around their necks. When I joined them, they nodded at me solemnly. I dropped the backpacks on the ground. Sorry for your loss, Andrew said. I looked out near the gate by the road where the yellow firebird was parked. Sarah's head was missing, otherwise it looked the same, still adorned with the other trophies. The gray plastic tote was outside the car, next to a pile of clothing and a cardboard box. We were just going over the plan, Andrew said. Do you have any other firearms or ammunition on the property? No, I said. Not here. I've put guns in other places around town in case I ever needed them. This will have to do, then, he said. 
We have what we have, Somerville said. Andrew spread a map of Clayfield out on the hood of the Prius, and everyone gathered around. He talked a while. He pointed at the map. I didn't hear anything he said. I was zoned out, staring at that firebird and the gray plastic tote. Then I looked into the faces of those around me. I didn't want to try with them. I didn't want to be a part of their group. Then I noticed Gale holding an AR-15. Where did you get that? I blurted out, pointing at the rifle and interrupting Andrew. It was in the... the... his car. There was a helmet with it. It was the rifle and helmet Bruce Lee had taken from my truck. I frowned. Once they come to investigate the fire, Andrew continued, they'll see the car and come in closer. I think it will be a good trap. Now, if... Laney, I interrupted Andrew again. Do you have something skimpy you could wear? A bikini or something? Everyone looked up at me. Excuse me, Laney said. Then she shot a look to Tim, who regarded me with a poker face. You can make yourself useful, I said. You're a buxom woman, and Bruce had this Princess Leia slave girl costume, so... Tim took a step closer and cocked his head to the side. He continued to stare at me, but everyone else was checking out Laney. I paused and held up my hands, then started over, focusing my conversation on Somerville. They want the same damn thing the others wanted. If you're looking for bait, then Laney, Gale, and Cheryl are it. You leave Gale and Cheryl out of this, Dan said. I get it. It was Tim. He could speak. Everyone got completely quiet and turned to hear more. He looked around and nodded. I get it. Laney has this cheetah thing she wears. Tim! Laney shouted, turning three shades of red. It wouldn't have to be so obvious, I said. In fact, don't be too obvious, or he'll know it's a trap. They already know we have a woman with us. That's why they're hanging around. We just need to advertise it, and Laney, your body is like a woman billboard. Gee, thanks, she said. He meant it in a good way, I think, Tim said. Then he looked at me. Watch yourself. Looks like we finally found something Tim wants to talk about, I said. Tim, you were in the military, right? He nodded and looked around uncomfortably. Army. Good. This is what we're going to do, I said, as I took my AR-15 from Gale's hands. Whatever your plans were with the car, use Laney and Gale instead. I'm going to take the blue van. Tim, you're with me. I started walking toward the van, and no one moved. What the hell are you doing? Somerville asked. I'm taking the van over to the airport and get the spaceship model I left. You just do whatever it was you were going to do. Just make sure Laney shows some leg. Weren't you listening to the plan? Andrew said. No, but I'm sure it was genius. Tim can fill me in on the way. Chapter 45 Nicholas followed me out to the van. It would be best if you went along with us on this, he said. I am, I said. We're going after the same thing. He grabbed my shoulder and stopped me. I turned to face him and saw that Tim was not with me. Tim, let's go. Tim was talking with Laney and Andrew. We don't need to be all bunched up together, I said. Get one of the women to distract them. Tim and I will take care of Bruce. I looked back at the others in the group. Tim was kissing Laney. Andrew, Dan, and Gail were looking over the map again. Are they staying here indefinitely after this? I asked as I climbed in the van. Will I need to move? I haven't said, he replied. It's your place, so I guess that's up to you. Tim, I yelled, then waited while Tim ran over. He climbed in, and I pulled up next to the yellow hot rod. I got out and grabbed the gray tote and put it in the van. Nicholas, I called out. Get the gate for me, would you? What's this all about? Tim asked as we pulled out of the driveway. What are we going to do? 
Do you have some experience with explosives? I asked. Some, he said. That crate back there, I said. I think there are explosives in it underneath all those cell phones. Tell me if you can do anything with them. He stared at me blankly, then turned in the seat. I heard him open the box and dig around. We're going to return Bruce's Romulan warbird, then we're going to blow his ass up, I said. Do you see them? Shit, he said. Yeah, that's a brick of C4, but there ain't a detonator that I can find. Then he turned back and sat down. He was holding two of the cell phones, one of the small ones and one of the large ones. I'm more interested in these. These ain't phones. Where'd he get these? I reached for one of them, and Tim jerked it away. What is it, then? I asked. This is a transponder, he said. Something new they've been using since the outbreak. Airplanes have those, don't they? I said. Same principle. Tim said, but these are used specifically for targeting. Targeting what? I asked. What do you think? Tim replied, holding up the device. He sighed and continued. Before my squad was overrun outside of Nashville, we were deploying these things, planting them. They were partnered with the horns. What horns? I asked. I didn't see any in the box, he said. They're horns, you know, Horns, noisemakers, they're loud as hell and they could blast for days before the battery died. They didn't usually go that long, though. We find a place where the goons were really thick. We'd move in, activate the transponder, and turn on the horn. Then we'd get the hell out. They would give the goons time to form a nice big crowd before they sent in the airstrike. It gave us plenty of time to leave the area. There were several squads out doing it. Does Andrew know about this? No, he said. Laney doesn't even know. They know that I'm AWOL, but that's it. I thought the airstrikes were over, but I got suspicious when the radio station went up. Then, when Nicholas got here with his news, I didn't have no part in burning survivors. We were ordered to do it, but I didn't. I didn't want anyone to think that I would do that. Then they hit Clayfield. I didn't have anything to do with that either. They already know I'm AWOL. That's bad enough. With their fucked up morality, I'm surprised they let you stay knowing you were a deserter, I said. I didn't desert. I just didn't have anywhere else to go, Tim said. I nodded. Okay, sorry. You better be glad I'm here or it could have been worse if these things got in the wrong hands. When you turn these things on and activate them, they send out a signal. You're not calling Mama. You're not speed dialing for a goddamn pizza. Shit, I said, a dawning coming over me. Oh, shit. We blew up the radio station. We burned Clayfield. You've been messing around with them? Tim said. No wonder. Communication has been spotty in the field. They don't do any confirmations on these. Not now. If telemetry is sent, you can bet your ass the boys in the bunker will send in the fire. They're not robots, I said. Aren't they piloted remotely by a real person? Aren't they able to see the target? Not always. Some are autonomous. Anyway, even if a human had the controls, they're going to burn whatever we tell them to burn. If the transponder is activated, that's all they need. As far as they're concerned right now, there is no friendly fire. Then he held up the larger device. This is like a remote. It lets you activate the horns and transponders from another location as far away as ten clicks. We never used them, but they gave them to us in case we needed extra time to get out of an area. The transponders won't do anything unless they're activated, but we should get them far away from us just to be sure. What we need to do is take this box and dump it in the river. Accidents happen, and I don't want to get firebombed because somebody screwed around with these. I pulled the van into the hangar with the other cars. We got out, and I looked back in the corner at Brian Davies' Porsche. Did you play a part in that? I asked. Before my time, he said. Would you have? I can't say what I would have done, he said. I wasn't there. Yeah, but I wasn't there, 
he stated flatly. I looked at the ground and nodded. Okay, I'll go get the Warbird, and you get the C-4 rigged to it. I told you, he said. There isn't a detonator in the box. It won't blow without a detonator. You can't make one? I'm not MacGyver. What if we shoot it? You can shoot it, burn it, throw it around, he said. It doesn't matter. If you want it to explode, you need a detonator. Anyway, if you're trying to shoot it to blow him up, why not just shoot him? That was disappointing. I was looking forward to the look on Bruce Lee's baby face when his precious spaceship exploded in his hands. I sighed and went over to my pile of stuff by the wall and picked up the Star Trek model and brought it back to the van. Okay, then, I said. Change of plans. We'll take it over there and strap it to the hood of the zombie mobile so he can see it. Go get me those bungee cords. Tim regarded me for a moment and said, You mean, you mean like he did with your friend's head? Sarah, I said. That was her name. The model is to him what Sarah's head was to me. Man, that's messed up. She and I had an argument the last time I saw her. I looked over at Tim, and he had an uneasy look on his face. I said, He would think we could all learn to be nice to each other, especially now, but we can't. Everybody is scared and on edge, he said. Everybody is bad, I said. I left Tim for a moment and returned with three red bungee cords. I put it all in the van. The spaceship model took up most of the rear seat. When I set it in, two little pieces snapped off. <laughs> I broke it, I said with a chuckle. Twenty-five thousand dollars. I hope he's got insurance. Twenty-five? It's just a model. It's more than that. Tim grunted his disapproval. He didn't understand. How long would it take after we activate the transponder for the drones to get here? I asked. We're not activating transponders to kill one guy, he said. It's too risky. You saw what happened in the town. Those things will be better off in the river. How long? Like I told you, they allow some time to pass so a crowd can gather. It could be as little as an hour or as long as twelve hours. There's no way to know. How do you activate them? He shook his head. I'm not going to show you, not for this. I did it once by accident, I said. What if I do it again? You should show me how so I can avoid it. No. If you don't have one, you won't accidentally activate it. Are the drones coming out of Fort Campbell? Fort Campbell is gone. Where are they coming from? I don't know, he said. It doesn't matter, does it? Anyway, it isn't always drones. They've got everything going on this. Nukes? I asked. Well, he said, not nukes. Not yet. Chapter 46 We came into Clayfield from the east, then had to skirt around to the south until we found a passable street that would let us out onto the west side of town. The others had already set their trap. We could see a column of black smoke rising. They'll be over on 12th. Tim said, over by the tobacco warehouses and the railroad tracks. They were going to burn some tires in the road to attract attention. They had planned to park the firebird nearby. When the man came in for the car, they would ambush him. Subtle, I said, as opposed to putting my wife out as bait in a bikini. Well, the warehouses are right on the street, he said. They should be able to hem them in. Dan is supposed to be up on the grain elevator on Ann Street in a sniping position. Pastor Andrew and Gail will be in the warehouse closest to Broadway. Nicholas and Laney are supposed to be on the other side of West Broadway by the bus station. In that case, I said, we'll go in through Ninth and pull in behind the warehouses on the other side of the tracks on West North Street. West North Street ended abruptly at an embankment. To the right were a small unmarked building and a large gravel lot. On the lot were a tractor trailer, a forklift, 
and a dumpster. I pulled into the lot and parked between the tractor trailer and the building. This mostly shielded us. Ahead and perpendicular to us were two sets of railroad tracks spaced wide apart. Between them was a low concrete platform. On the other side were the tobacco warehouses on 12th Street. Even though we could see the smoke, we didn't have a view of the fire. We could, however, see the firebird from our location. It was parked off to our right, on the other side, over at the end of Depot Street, which, like West North Street, officially stopped at the tracks. The only difference being, rather than an embankment to stop traffic from driving out on the rails, the road continued a little farther as a driveway to access the platform between the two lines. Near the Firebird, on the tracks, were four boxcars, and on top of the closest one was Laney, wearing a big sun hat and a yellow dress. Oh yeah, I said, that's all kinds of subtle. What the hell is she doing up there? he said. I told her not to do it. At least she's not in a swimsuit. It looks like she has visitors. He put the binoculars to his eyes. Ten, no, thirteen goons. She's not in any danger from them right now, but that could change. I hold you responsible for this. This was your idea. I didn't think she would actually go along with it. She had a choice. We can't let anything happen to her, he said. We sat there for almost two hours. It was very hot, but we couldn't turn on the engine and air conditioning because we didn't want to attract any zombies. The best we could do was let the windows down on the passenger side of the vehicle. Meanwhile, the number of Laney's undead admirers grew to forty-six. The pile of tires burned and smoked. Bruce Lee and his friends had not arrived. They're not going to fall for this, I said. They're probably watching us right now. No shit, Tim replied. He was in the bench seat behind me, wiping sweat from his face with a bandana. It was a ridiculous idea to begin with. Laney's got to be uncomfortable up there. What if she needs to go to the bathroom or something? I've had to piss for twenty minutes. I'm tired of waiting, I said. I'm going to try and make something happen. I got out, slung the AR-15 over my shoulder, then walked to the rear of the van. Where are you taking it? He said. Where he can see it. The zombies around the train are going to come after me. When they do, get Laney out of there. I jogged up and over the embankment and got out onto the first set of tracks with that oversized model in my arms. To my left, down the line, was the railroad crossing at West Broadway and another platform near the lumber yard. Ahead and to my right were the train cars, Laney, and the Firebird. Far to my right were warehouses, trees, and train tracks. I still didn't see Andrew, Gale, or Dan. Laney watched me in silence, unsure what I was doing. She looked good in the dress. Too bad she was such an ugly and deplorable person on the inside. The creatures around her saw me and moved after me. I picked up my pace and cut off to the left. I crossed over the next set of tracks, ran down another embankment, and in the narrow space between two warehouses, the zombie mob followed. The narrow alley let me out onto 12th Street, where a pile of tires still burned. There were two zombies near the fire, seemingly fascinated by it. They were both too close and too hot. Their skin smoked. I took a right so I could get on Depot Street and get the firebird. The pursuing creatures were momentarily distracted by the fire, which gave me time to gain access to the muscle car. The long bolt to which Sarah's head had been affixed jutted up from the hood. It was dark and crusty. Flies were everywhere. There was a mounting bracket on the other side of the model. I attempted to slide it down onto the bolt, but the hole was too small. I slammed it down hard and made it fit. Oops, I said. I broke it again. I checked on Laney. She was climbing down the ladder on the side of the car while Tim waited below her. 
I waved away the flies swarming around the car door and climbed inside. There were two pine tree air fresheners hanging from the mirror, but they weren't helping very much. I turned the key, and the hot rod rumbled. The zombies heard the engine and spilled onto Depot Street. I drove over the tracks into the median where the platform was. I would be able to head south between the two sets of track for almost half a mile before they converged at a splitter and became one again. I had my eye on the second platform to the south, down by the lumber yard. Tim and Laney ran back toward the van, and I headed for the second platform. There was a ramp access up on it for dollies and forklifts. The zombies crossed the first set of tracks. Some of them chased Tim and Laney, and some of them chased me. The firebird fishtailed in the loose rocks between the tracks as I sped to the platform. The spaceship model looked so much bigger out on the hood, as if the car was wearing a giant gray bow tie. I ran it fast until the last minute, then stomped the brakes and rolled gently up the ramp and onto the platform. Quickly I got out and grabbed my AR-15. I took aim and fired into the approaching crowd, then reached in my pocket and pulled out a transponder. I pushed the button on the side. The screen lit up, giving me two red circles on the screen. I paused and fired three rounds, dropping the closest creatures. I looked at the device again. The LED was still dark. I pushed the second button, but there was no change. I touched the red circles, but nothing happened. I tried pushing the first button a second time. Nothing happened. Damn it. Work for me. Work for me. Work for me. I moved my fingers over the display. Nothing happened. I fired again and took a quick look toward the tracks and warehouses, hoping to see one of the group coming to assist me. Nobody made an effort to come out of hiding and give me a hand. I pushed the button a third time. Nothing. I flipped it over and over in my hands to see if there was another button I'd missed. Screw it. I dropped it, then put the rifle to my shoulder and took out five more of the things that were coming for me. More were coming in from both directions on West Broadway, attracted to my gunfire. I did a quick look around for a short stick or piece of wood. Not seeing one close by, I put the butt of the rifle against the car's horn and wedged it against the seat. The horn blared. I shut the door and pulled my pistol. Then the van appeared on West Broadway. I climbed down from the platform and made for the lumber yard. The creatures gathered around the platform and reached for the car. Tim wheeled around to pick me up. You had a transponder, Tim said to me as I climbed in the side door. I saw it. What the hell are you thinking? Don't worry about it, I said. I couldn't get it to work. What's a transponder? Laney asked. Nothing, Tim said. Where are the others? I asked. Where they were told to be and doing what they were told to do, Laney said. Unlike you. Tim drove us away from the tracks and warehouses and back toward downtown. Why did you set off the horn on the car? Tim asked. We'll be crawling with goons now. I'm making something happen, I said. I want him to work for it. You've ruined the plan, Laney said. I stood out there for nothing. Tim took a left on 8th Street. We'll circle around to our original spot and wait there, he said. When we neared the museum, I noticed the windows had been broken. There was graffiti on the outer walls, and some of the displays had been dragged out into the parking lot. Bruce Lee's handiwork, no doubt. Shit, Tim said, looking in the mirror. Here we go. I turned in my seat. A large, black Chevrolet Suburban had just turned from Broadway and was speeding up behind us. Chapter 47 I moved to the back of the van. Cover your ears, I said. Then I lifted my pistol and fired, blowing out the rear window. I braced my arm on the back seat, took aim, and fired again. Go up to West Ann Street, Laney said. Dan is in one of the silos there by the tracks. The truck came in fast and slammed into us. Our van swerved. 
They hit us again. Tim was able to maintain control. He cut it hard, to the left on West Ann Street. The Suburban followed us. I took aim again. Bruce Lee was not in the vehicle. I fired at the driver, but my aim was a little high. West Ann was narrow and short, ending at Ninth Street and the Grace County Grain Company. Ahead was a row of large corrugated steel grain bins with a grain elevator. Tim hooked us around onto Ninth Street and slammed on the brakes. A second truck was moving in on Ninth. Go, I shouted. Go around them. Tim floored it again and swerved, but the second truck nailed us. The van careened into one of the grain bins at an angle, crushing in a bottom panel and shearing the rivets. Corn spilled out over the front of the van and piled up around Laney's door. It jostled and dazed the three of us. Everything stopped. Laney and I were blocked in because of the grain. The two men behind us got out and rushed in. They opened Tim's door to drag him out. Laney produced a revolver from under her dress, leaned across the seat, and shot one of the men in the face. He collapsed straight down. She fired again at the second man. The third man came around his truck with a shotgun. Out! I yelled. Out! Get out! Laney spilled out of the door. I heard another shot. I made my way toward the driver's door. I saw Tim and Laney run toward a little red house. One of the men was chasing them with a machete in his hand. There was another shot. I heard yelling. I got out, stepping over the dead man's body. A shotgun blast exploded the window of the van. Where the hell is Dan? I said as I ducked. I moved, hunched over to the rear of the van. Laney screamed. Then there was the sound of glass breaking. I wasn't quite sure from which direction the third man would come. Then gunfire erupted some distance away. It was steady and fast. Bruce's AA-12. I got down low to see if I could see the third man's feet. I saw them right away, inches from my face. It startled me, and I rolled away from the van. He was standing right over me. The barrel of his shotgun lowered to my head. Then his own head gave a violent jerk to the side, and he dropped to his knees. I looked up to see Dan on the tallest grain bin with his rifle. I lifted my hand in thanks, then got to my feet. I ran south on Ninth Street toward the sound of the AA-12. Here and there, the monsters were moving toward the noise of the horn and gunfire. I was faster than all of them. I drew near to the little red house on my right. There was the sound of struggle inside. Tim lay outside on the ground under a broken window. His arm and face were bleeding. He was either unconscious or dead. Just past him at the rear of the house, a creature was crawling toward him. I went to him and quickly knelt to check for a pulse. I heard the back door of the house open. Then there was Laney bounding away across the backyard in a full sprint. The back door opened a second time. The other man from the black truck was in pursuit. I snatched up Tim's rifle and put it to my shoulder. I tracked the man, then just before he caught up to her, I fired. He landed on his face and rolled. Laney kept running. Laney! I yelled. Then I dropped the end of the gun down and sighted up on the creature that was crawling in. I put it down. Laney! I yelled again. Tim had a cut on his cheek and a piece of glass sticking out of his left arm near the shoulder. He had a pulse, but he wasn't awake. I got behind him and lifted him up under his armpit. The AA-12 went quiet. Then Laney returned. The sleeve of her yellow dress was torn away at the shoulder. There was blood splatter on the front. Oh, God! Tim! They were fighting, and he pushed Tim through the window. Get his legs, I said. We'll take him in the house. We carried him up the porch and into the front room, placing him on the floor. Are you still armed? I asked. She looked around on the floor, then pointed to a revolver on the other side of the room. I'm going to take Tim's rifle, I said. Use his sidearm if you need to. Keep the doors shut on this place and stay put. He's bleeding, she said, distressed. 
Check the bathroom for first aid supplies. I have to go. I stood and went to the door, then stopped. Is the house clear? I asked. We didn't look, she replied. It might be a good idea if you did that. I left via the back door and ran through the yard toward the railroad tracks. The horn of the firebird continued to wail, but the AA-12 was silent. I hoped that meant Bruce Lee was dead. After coming over a short chain-link fence, I skidded down a short hill, then out onto the tracks. There was a silver pickup parked in the crossing at West Broadway facing east. Several zombies were walking past it on their way to the Firebird. I didn't see anyone except the undead. I turned and looked up at Dan on the grain bin. He pointed toward the tobacco warehouses. I lifted my hand in acknowledgment, then ran toward the buildings. There was no actual tobacco in the warehouses at that time. It had all been auctioned and moved at least a month prior to the outbreak of Canton B. However, the wonderful aroma remained. There were nine tobacco warehouses and auction houses on this street. Some of them hadn't been used in years, yet they never lost their distinctive smell. Skylights in the first building I entered showed a giant empty room, except for a few wooden pallets here and there, and rows of support columns. I immediately left the building and ran to the next one. The next building was like the first. I was about to go to the next building when I heard several shots of different calibers, I cautiously stepped out onto 12th Street. I ran toward West Broadway, almost two blocks away, staying close to the buildings. There were more shots. Straight ahead was the bus station where Nicholas Somerville was supposed to be, but I didn't see him. As I got closer to the last warehouse on the street, I could see the door was hanging off kilter on one hinge. The lock facing and the door handle were gone, nothing but a jagged hole. Above the door, there was a tattered vinyl banner that said, Daily Flea Market, February 5th through April 30th, Buy, Sell, Trade. I crouched low and peeked inside. Immediately inside the door, there was a foyer. It had a cork board on the wall, full of business cards and homemade tear-off advertisements. A little gumball machine was beneath it, covered in dust. A little farther ahead was a staircase going up to the second floor, and a closed door, and to the left was another door, which led to the main warehouse floor. The smell of tobacco mingled with the smell of death. I stepped inside and looked through the small diamond-shaped window in the door and into the warehouse. There were tables and booths of items for sale, mostly junk. Several vendors and shoppers were still inside. They had been in there since February. I looked up at the staircase. Then a hand grabbed my shoulder. I let out a yelp and spun around. Nicholas Somerville was behind me with a finger to his lips. Shh, he whispered. They're upstairs. How many? I asked. Two, he replied. Andrew and Gail are up there, too. Quietly, I climbed the stairs to the door. I had no idea what was on the other side of it. I didn't know if there were multiple rooms. I didn't know if Bruce Lee would be there with his automatic shotgun waiting to turn me into sausage. I looked back at Somerville, hoping for a little instruction. He looked back with an expression of expectation. I put my ear to the door to listen. Let's take her with us, a man's voice said. It might be a while before we find another one. I handed Somerville the rifle and motioned him to step back. Then I pulled out my pistol, took a deep breath, and turned the knob. Chapter 48 I took in the scene as the door swung open. The room was approximately fifteen feet wide by twenty long. A wall of windows to my right provided natural light. To the left... The room was open to the auction-slash-warehouse floor below. There was a desk under the window, a round table in the middle of the room, and five straight-back wooden chairs scattered around. On the desk, 
Next to a computer was the AA-12 and Bruce's messenger bag. Andrew was seated on the floor in the far corner, propped against the wall. There were bullet holes in his chest and forehead. Gail was on the table. Her shirt was ripped open, and the man was attempting to get into her pants. Bruce, dressed once more like the Punisher, stood at the railing, looking over the balcony down at the ghoulish flea market. Immediately, things happened. Bruce turned, reached up, and pulled his sword. The man at the table backed away, and his open pants dropped around his ankles. He fell back as I fired, and I missed him. He landed on his butt, then tried to get up. I didn't miss the second time. Gail sat up, and Bruce went for her. I fired a third time, striking him in the upper chest. He took two steps back, stopped at the railing, his sword went down, point in the floor, and he leaned on it like a cane. He bent there a moment, swaying in place. Somerville entered the room with his gun raised. Bruce straightened up and frowned at us. His dark sunglasses were crooked and on the end of his nose. He moaned and coughed. The tits, he said. The tits in the yellow dress... That was like Uhura's trap in the final frontier. Did you think I wouldn't notice that? What's he talking about? Somerville said. Then Gail stepped up beside me. She lifted the AA-12 to her hip. She was crying. Bruce opened his mouth to speak, and she squeezed the trigger. In less than a second, four spent shells ejected from the side of the machine and the spray of shot tore through Bruce's forearm and opened up his belly. The katana fell to the floor with his hand still gripping the handle. His entrails spilled down his lap. He teetered there, then his body bent backward and fell over the railing into the warehouse. Gail put the weapon on the table, then turned to Andrew. Somerville and I went to the railing and looked over. Bruce was on his back on a table of used comic books. The zombies from the flea market, hungry since February, swarmed in for a meal. I moved over to the window. The crowd around the firebird had doubled in size. More moved toward it like metal filings to a magnet. Do you have a car nearby? I asked. I did, but it's blocked now, Somerville said. We'll have to find another. Tim is hurt, I said. I left him and Laney over on Ninth. We should go before too many of those things gather. I don't want to get stuck in here. I picked up Bruce Lee's messenger bag and looked inside. There was one more loaded magazine canister for the AA-12, another box of 12-gauge shells, an MRE, a bottle of water, a small bottle of vodka, and a few Star Wars action figures. I put the strap over my shoulder and grabbed the big gun. My eyes fell on the 500-year-old Japanese sword. The museum director and history lover part of me wanted to take it, to preserve it for another 500 years. I wondered how many lives had been lost on that blade during those five centuries. I wondered how many lives it had protected, the last life it had taken, so far as I knew, belonged to Sarah. Originally, it had been an instrument of honor, but now it was a murder weapon. I couldn't stand to look at it. Grab Gail and let's go, I said. Gail wailed that she wouldn't leave the pastor, so Somerville scooped her up and packed her out on his shoulder. Once we were outside, he set Gail on her feet and grabbed her wrist. Pastor Andrew, she cried. He's dead, darling, Somerville said in a sympathetic tone. Then he pulled her shirt together to cover her bare breasts. We can't take him with us. I need you to run for me now, okay? We set off north on 12th. Before we could make it to Depot Street, we had to duck into another warehouse to avoid an approaching cluster of the undead. We can go through and out the back door. I said in a hushed voice. I was in this building earlier. It's empty. 
It'll put us out right by the tracks. Once we get on the tracks, follow them to the grain company. Our footfalls echoed around in the big empty building, but the zombies outside didn't notice. They were too focused on the firebird's horn. We went from front door to back door in a straight shot. Once out on the railroad tracks, Gail saw Dan out on the grain bin. Oh no, she said tugging her shirt together tighter. He can't see me like this. I don't want him to see me this way. I don't want him to know. He'll understand, I said. That ain't what she said, is it? Somerville shot back. Then he took her wrist again and pulled her from the tracks and toward a house. What are you doing? I said. Pit stop, he said. It won't take but a minute. We've got a minute to let this girl keep her dignity, don't we? We ran down the gravel embankment into a shallow ditch, then back up to a white board fence that separated the railroad property from the backyard of the home. Somerville helped Gail over the fence, then climbed over himself. Once I was over, we went to the back door. Somerville kicked it in, and we went inside. We were greeted by a pair of taut brown corpses dressed in rags. Somerville clubbed them down with his rifle then stomped their heads until they quit moving. Then he moved clumsily around the house until he found a bedroom closet. Gail and I followed him in. I didn't see him. All I could see were clothes flying out of the closet onto the bed. Then he came around the door with a shirt. Here, he said. This will do. It's nothing like my shirt, Gail said. He'll notice. It's blue, ain't it? It's checkered, ain't it? Yes, it's plaid, but... He's a man, ain't he? Somerville said, shoving the shirt into her hands. Darling, he won't notice. Trust me on this. Now get dressed so we can go. She stared at the shirt a moment, then looked at me. I nodded. She smiled through her tears and stood on tiptoes to kiss Nicholas's cheek. You really are a saint, she whispered. Thank you. Somerville and I waited quietly on the front porch for Gail to change. The shirt was a little big on her, but she tied it at the bottom to make it fit better. The front of the house faced Ninth Street. We followed it toward the grain bins. What the hell? Somerville said as we drew near the wrecked van. Corn? There was all that corn in there this whole time? Looks like it, I said. Well, hell, there's enough food there for an army. That statement brought to my memory Bruce's story about finding the trailer full of MREs. It made me sick that we'd never know where that was. Tim and Laney are in here, I said. This red house. We went up to the porch, and I knocked. Laney? Laney, it's us. Don't shoot. The front door opened, and Laney met us with a gun in her hand. Behind her, Tim was sitting up holding a bandage on his arm. Laney said to Gail, When did you change your blouse? Have you been crying? Gail looked back at us with a worried expression. He won't notice, Somerville said. I'm going to go get Dan in one of those trucks, I said. You get Tim ready to move. I ran down the road and stopped at the black suburban that had chased us. I put the AA-12 into the back of the vehicle, then Bruce's heavy messenger bag. Dan! I yelled. Dan, come down. I climbed into the van through the rear door. Then I set the gray tote out. By the time I was loading the tote into the Suburban, Dan was walking toward me. What's going on? He said. We're leaving, I said. The men are dead. Where are the others? Are they okay? They're in the red house over there, I said. I didn't tell him about Andrew. So that's it? That wasn't so bad. Yeah, I said. Easy friggin' peasy. Maybe we should get this corn, he said. Maybe, but not right now. The dead are gathering in and Tim is hurt. We should move him. Whoa, Dan said. Look at that. He was looking to the sky. I looked up to see an aircraft coming over. The front section where the cockpit would have been was bulbous, 
The fuselage was thin. It had struts similar to some of the small craft at the Grace County Airport. It looked like a cross between a crop duster and a bug. Shit, I said. What's that doing here? We rushed back to the red house in the pickup. Dan ran in and hurried the others out. He, Gail, and Nicholas climbed into the back seat. Tim and Laney got up front with me. What are they doing here, Tim? I yelled as I pulled away and took a left onto North Street. You called them, he replied. I told you not to. Called them, Somerville said. An hour minimum. That's what you said. An hour. It hasn't been an hour. I didn't even get the damn thing activated. You must have, he said. Maybe it's not for here. Maybe they're on their way to somewhere else. Really? Probably not. What is going on? Dan said. Where's the pastor? A large mass of the undead were moving up North Street as we came to the intersection with 8th Street, forcing me to take a right. We need to put a lot of space between us and that car, Tim said. I'm trying to do that. I got to the intersection with Broadway and looked to my right. We were two blocks from the tracks, the lumber yard, and the warehouse where Andrew and Bruce Lee had died. The firebird was mostly blocked from my view, but the crowd of zombies it had attracted extended out in a wide circle. There it is, Gail said. I see the airplane. A streak of white came out of the sky. The firebird hopped into the air, flames venting from its windows. Scores of bodies sailed up and outward on the swiftly expanding inferno. The hot shock wave rolled into us and shoved us sideways. The creatures that were not instantly consumed or knocked down stumbled around in the fiery street like walking torches. The lumber yard and bus station burned. The warehouse containing Pastor Andrew's body had partially collapsed. Everyone was silent. We could hear the roar and crackle of the fire from our location two blocks away. Finally, Somerville spoke. So, so you called them? Chapter 49 For them... The loss of Pastor Andrew overshadowed everything else, including the drone attacks and Sarah's death. The pastor was dear to them, and I could sympathize, but I had not yet had an opportunity to mourn for Sarah. I wanted them to mourn for her, too. There was no reason why they would. They didn't know her. But I was angry that she got so little attention from them. It was possible that Grant was going through more heartache than I, but I couldn't bring myself to see him. He stayed in the bedroom and wouldn't come out. I sat with them all that afternoon while they cried and read passages from the Bible. In all of it, I felt left out, like I didn't belong. I'm sure Somerville felt the same way, but he didn't let on. As could be expected, there was a telling and retelling of the events of the day. They tried to make sense of it and figure out if anything could have been done differently. Accusations were never made, but I knew some of them blamed me. I didn't want to fight anymore. I didn't want to argue. I didn't even want to feel angry. I thought the best way to avoid all of that would be to get away from the others for a while. If we stayed in the area, I wouldn't be able to avoid them indefinitely, but I had to have some time alone. Even so, I knew I would need them eventually. There was no more talk of them securing and preserving the town. They had seen downtown Clayfield the same as I. The next day, after some discussion, they all packed up and moved back to the airport, even Nicholas Somerville. Cheryl invited me to join them, but I declined for the time being. I stayed with the Lassiter farm because it was familiar but I didn't plan to live there forever. There were too many ghosts there. Eventually, I would move my supplies and livestock to another location and start again. I was alone for more than a week before I saw any of them again. Then, one afternoon, two pickup trucks stopped in the road in front of the property. One was pulling a flatbed trailer, 
to which was strapped an Amish buggy. The other pulled a long livestock trailer. The door opened on the one front, and Nicholas Somerville got out. He opened the gate. I went out on the porch to watch. They drove the two trucks in and parked. Somerville got out and waved. Cheryl got out of the second truck. I went out to meet them. We've been worried about you, Cheryl said. No need, I said. Somerville extended his hand, and I shook it. I'm leaving tomorrow, he said. I wanted to say bye, in case I don't see you again. Biloxi? I kind of thought you would have already gone. Not without saying goodbye. Anyway, Dan and I had to drive up to Riverton to get fuel for the plane, and Grant wasn't feeling up to the trip until now. Barring any trouble, I should be back in less than a week with Judy. Good, I said. Then he turned and pointed at the buggy. We brought you some presents. I looked at the buggy and nodded, unsure what to say. We're trying to make amends, Cheryl said. You haven't done anything to make amends for, I said. Neither one of you have. You shouldn't be out here by yourself, Somerville said gently. It's dangerous, but more than that, it's lonely. You'll go crazy if you keep to yourself too much. I think that's happened already, I said. He sighed and looked at Cheryl, then back at me. Well, anyway, we brought you a buggy. Dan and Tim took a couple more of these over to the airport. It won't be long before the cars won't work no more, so... I appreciate that, I said. But I don't know how to operate one of those. Besides, I would think they wouldn't offer much protection from the dead. The dead will be gone by winter, hun. Cheryl said. What then? Are you going to walk everywhere? Everything sure is spread out and far away when you ain't got a car to get you there. And what if you need to carry a load of something for a distance? You'll need a wagon like this. I shrugged. Okay, let's unload it. Wouldn't hurt to have it, I guess. I'll back the trailer over there and we'll unload it by the barn, Nicholas said, and got into the truck. There's more. Cheryl grinned and took my hand. She led me to the back of the livestock trailer. Have a look. I peered inside. There were two more horses and four goats. In the front of the trailer, secured in the storage, was a cage holding three chickens, including a rooster. You've been busy, I said. We all went out to the Amish community today, she said. This is some of what we were able to save. We're going to leave one of these horses with you. We figure they have experience pulling a wagon, so it might be easier for you if the horse knows what it's doing. We'll take that gray horse with us. You can have one of these goats and all of the chickens. We have more. Okay, I said. She stood there and stared at me a moment. Or, she said, you could just come out to the airport with us. There's room. There's electricity. Everyone wants you to join us. I don't think so, I said. Not right now. She took my hand in hers. I want you to join us. Nicholas is right. This life is lonely enough without closing yourself off from everybody. I just want you to know that I'm your friend. Yeah, I said. I know. Tim, Laney, Dan, and Gail are going out on a double date this evening, she said. I would have gone with Nicholas, but he's a married man. Grant's a handsome kid, but I ain't no cougar. I'm almost old enough to be his mama. I stared at her. My last date was more than a year ago, she continued. He was a farmer. Our date was to his elderly mother's house. We had ham soup... We watched a made-for-TV movie with his mom between us on the couch, and then I drove myself home. Sounds romantic, I said. She grinned. Why are you making me fish so hard? I want you to get away from this place for a while. It'll be two friends going out. How does that sound? No pressure. No pressure? How am I supposed to make restaurant reservations? That's all covered, she said. Do you know what today is? Wednesday. No, 
maybe Friday. This is the 4th of July, and we're all going to have a picnic and watch the fireworks. The 4th? Are you sure? Close enough, she said. Tim explained about the transponders. We all talked about it, and we've decided to get some use out of them. Dan, Tim, and Nicholas drove out yesterday and set off sirens west and north out of town to draw the monsters. They also left behind the transponders. In a couple of hours, Tim is going to activate them. And then we'll wait for the show. I nodded and grinned. It's a date, then. Y'all ready to unload this buggy or what? Somerville called to us. I turned to Nicholas, and Cheryl said, It wouldn't hurt to have a bath and run a comb through your hair. I pulled up in front of the Hill Hotel a half hour before sunset. The building had not been a hotel in decades, but had been converted into office space. There were four vehicles parked around the building that hadn't been there before, one by each of the three exits and another parked beneath a window. The building was blackened by the fire, and all of the glass from the windows was gone, but it was still structurally sound. The first thing I noticed when I got out of my truck was the lack of zombies in the town. I saw only one, a child, and it was a street over. The next thing I noticed was the sound of the sirens. They were far away, but clearly audible. There you are, a voice said from above. I looked up, and Cheryl waved to me from the roof of the old hotel. Dan leaned over the edge and waved, too. Come on up, he said. We've got cold beer. I returned the wave, then leaned back in the car for the orange daylilies I'd brought for Cheryl. I felt nervous to see everyone again. I entered the building and found the stairs. There was a little fire damage on the inside, and there was glass all over the floor. I climbed up the six floors, and Cheryl met me at the roof access. She put a cold Samuel Adams in my hand. Wow, she said. Nice duds. And you smell good, too. Brumming's fashions had some good-looking suits, I said. The salesperson was a pest. After I put a hatchet in his head, I noticed this pinstripe. It looked sharp on the mannequin. I figured, what the hell? What the hell is right, she said, and here I am in my Walmart clothes. You look nice, I said. Those for me, she said. I nodded and handed her the flowers. See, she said, and kissed my cheek. We ain't forgot how to be normal. Cold beer, huh, I said, and took a drink. Really cold. We've got a cooler full of cold ones, huh? Drink all you want. Just don't fall off the roof. Chapter 50 We joined the others. They greeted me with a wave, then I endured a few bad jokes about my new suit and about how pretty I smelled. Everyone was there, including Nicholas and Grant. Dan took me to a table where there was chips and salsa. Next to that was a small grill on which sat a steaming pot of pork and beans. I wish we had burgers and hot dogs, he said. It ain't the fourth without burgers. Help yourself. We've been eating already. I looked around. There were two short telescopes set up on tripods facing north and west. There were blankets spread, flashlights and handheld spotlights, lawn chairs, the grill, the table, two coolers. How the hell did you get all this stuff up here, I said. Did you carry it up all those stairs? Dan laughed. <laughs> yeah. We packed it up here. We ain't packing it down, though. This shit stays. If we need a cooler, I'll just go get a new one. I swear it wore me out. Danny and Nicholas lugged most of it, Cheryl said. They bitched and moaned the whole time. I'm going to talk to Grant, I said. He's having a tough time, she said. Grant was alone, sitting on the short wall on the east edge of the building. How's the hand healing up? I asked. He shrugged and looked down at the bandage. It's not growing any more fingers. Can I get you a beer? He shook his head. 
I sat next to him and drank my beer for a while. Do you want to talk about what happened? I said. He shook his head again. I'm sorry, bro. I couldn't protect her. I couldn't. I know. I miss her. I know, I said. I'm sorry. I felt his eyes on me. I made eye contact so he would know I was serious. He sniffed, then looked at his hand. It would be hard enough to forget her, but now I have to look at this every day and be reminded that I let her die. No, I said. It shows me that you were willing to sacrifice yourself for her. That's the real thing. I respect that. You're a good man. He grinned for the first time. I never know about you, dude. We should have stayed in Biloxi, I guess. I looked out at the sunset and thought about it a moment. Things would have been very different had they stayed in Mississippi. Sarah dragged hell to Clayfield on a leash, but shit. We can't do shoulda, woulda, coulda. It is what it is. I missed her, and I was happy to see her. For what it's worth, I'm glad I met you, too. I'm going back to Biloxi tomorrow with Dan and the old man, Grant said. His wife is a nice lady. I met her down there. Are you coming back to Clayfield with them? I don't know, he said. It depends on what everybody else down there does. I don't want to be by myself. Cheryl walked up with a plate. You should eat before it gets dark. We don't plan to use the lights too much. After a plate of beans, chips, and salsa, I leaned on the wall with the others in the dark, waiting for it to rain fire. Those sirens have been going for more than a full day, Dan said. I'll bet nearly every goon in Grace County is around them. When did you activate the transponders? I asked. A couple of hours ago, he said. It might be tomorrow before it happens. I hope you're good for an all-nighter. Hail, Somerville said. If it ain't happened by midnight, you can forget about me. I'll be in bed. Where's bed? I asked. Here on the roof? We have a room with some cots downstairs if we need it, Gail replied. It's an interior room, so it wasn't damaged by the bombs last week. Do you expect the missiles to kill a lot? I asked. The one we saw the other day was intense, but it didn't have much spread. I kind of expected more. That's why I set off four different transponders, Tim said. We space them out enough that the drones won't cancel them out as redundant. They should fire ordnance at each individual target. They won't get all the goons, but they'll get a lot. I hope they don't burn all of western Kentucky down in the process, I said. I still want to live here. Who's up for another cold one? Dan said. What's that over there? Laney said. Where? Cheryl asked. Laney turned on her flashlight and used it to point. Over that way, she said. In the parking lot by the bank. I don't see nothing, Dan said. I do, Gail said. It's a red light. It ain't bright, but I see it. Cheryl, put a spot out that way, Dan said. I see it now, Somerville said. What do you reckon it is? Have y'all been in town after dark? Oh, shit, Tim said. Did any of you mess with the transponders? Did you drop one? No, Dan said, sounding offended. You wouldn't let us touch them, remember? Is that what it is? Gail said. What does that mean? Get a damn spotlight on it, Tim yelled. It was so out of character for Tim that everyone got uncomfortably quiet. The spotlight came up. It moved out onto the bank building. It moved down the wall to the ground, then over, then up. Then it stopped. Motherfucker, Gail said. Bruce Lee stared up into the spotlight from the parking lot across the street. One arm, black trench coat, dark cavity where his belly had been. There, through the fabric of his coat pocket, was a blinking red light. He gazed up at us, then came our way. Motherfucker, 
Gale said again. Is that a transponder? Dan said. Tim? To the north, the horizon lit up white, then orange. Party's over, Tim said. His flashlight came on and he grabbed Laney's hand. Go. No. A sound like thunder rumbled, followed by the scuffling of eight sets of feet. Beer bottles clinked and rolled being kicked around. Flashlight beams came on and moved on the rooftop. I was the fifth person through the door to the stairs. There was a flash of light and a glow from the west. The play of light and frightened voices turned the narrow stairwell into something like a haunted funhouse disco. The sound of the bombs rumbled in. As close as he is, Tim said, it'll be an almost direct hit. Do we try to get out of the building or go down to the basement? Dan said. We can't go outside, Tim said. There's no time. We're better off in the basement. We're not going to make it, Laney shouted. At the third floor landing, I opened the door. Forget the basement, I yelled. We need to put walls between us and him. They followed me in. I ran down a hallway toward the west side of the building. When I got to the window looking out toward West Broadway, I could see the fires burning miles away. The door on my right said, Terrence Baker, attorney at law. In here! I ran to the far corner and got down prone, covering my head. Others came in behind me. It got quiet. Then there was the whine of the incoming aircraft. It became brighter than a sunny day. The building shook and groaned. Then it shook harder, and I covered my ears for the noise. Then, other than the occasional pop and crash, it was quiet. I stood and looked out the window. To the west, the fire still burned. I could tell by the shadow of the hotel being thrown out onto West Broadway that a fire burned on 7th Street as well. However, the firebomb that hit Bruce Lee's transponder didn't have anything to burn other than the fuel it provided. Everything flammable had been burned up the week before. It was dwindling and would burn itself out soon. Is everybody okay? Cheryl said. I pushed past the others and opened the office door. The end of the hallway was gone, open to the outside. I walked out as far as I could and peered down the thirty or so feet to the burning street and rubble below. The entire east face of the building had collapsed. Tim came up beside me. Is that all of the transponders? he asked. Are there any more? Everyone, out on the fire escape, Somerville yelled from the office. I looked back toward the office, then at Tim. He told me he had twenty-two, I said. I had three that I gave to Dan and Gale. There was one in his pocket. I used one in the Firebird. The rest were in the tote. He nodded. Okay, we should be okay. I left the rest of them with the sirens along with the C-4, he said. Does that mean the drones won't come back, I asked. No. The next day, we stood on the runway and watched Dan pack a few supplies in the plane for their flight to Biloxi. Each had a gallon of water, a bottle of liquor, and enough food for one day. In addition to their sidearms and machetes, the plane was equipped with one 12-gauge pump shotgun and one .30-30 rifle. I'd feel better if you took more supplies, Gail said to Dan. What if you have trouble? It's a short trip, Dan said over his shoulder. You and Cheryl shouldn't fret so much. We'll be there by this evening. We'll be back by this time next week. We can always scavenge extra supplies if we need to. Y'all act like I'm going to be gone for years or something. Once the supplies were stowed, he kissed his sister on the cheek, then gave Gail a long one on the mouth. Then he left them and pulled me off to the side. Do me a favor, would you, Hoss? What's that? I said. I know we got us some tough women here, but would you mind sticking around till I get back? Ain't no man here except him. I think he's capable and all, but it would make me feel better if you was here, too, to back him up. 
I looked over at Cheryl, then back at Dan. Sure, I said. I'll stay until you get back. You can stay longer, he said. We'd be glad to have you, but I know you gotta do what you gotta do. I won't fight you on that. I nodded again and looked at Cheryl. She gave me a small smile, but I could tell she was worried. Cheryl could do a whole lot worse than you, he said. And has. Huh? Look after him, he said, and turned to get into the plane. Nicholas Somerville came up to me. I'll see you in a few days, he said. Hopefully we'll bring a whole caravan up here. Grant told me about the others there in that group. Can you imagine what we could do here with a peaceful group that size? It'll be good, I said, but I didn't feel it. He gave me a slap on the shoulder and walked away. I looked at Grant, and he lifted the bandaged hand in a wave, then climbed into the plane. The doors were shut. The engine started. Tim, Laney, Gale, Cheryl, and I moved off to the side. We all waved as the plane sped down the runway and lifted into the air. Chapter 51 Stay in bed a little longer, Cheryl said. It's cold. What time is it? I asked. I should probably check the fire. She snuggled in closer to me. Tim can check it. It's his turn. I picked up the watch from the nightstand. It's after six, I said. Stay in bed, she said. I'll make it worth your while. Oh, will you now? Oh, in that case, Tim can check the fire. I rolled over and kissed her. There was a knock at the door. Ugh, Cheryl whispered. We should get our own place. What? I called out. Through the door, Laney said, We lost another chicken last night. Tim thinks it might be a possum getting them. I sighed. Okay. Cheryl's warm hand moved down into my pants. I can't get the fire going, Laney said. Tim's outside trying to figure out where the possum is getting in. Stay, Cheryl whispered. Let her do it. Turn on a space heater to knock the chill out of the air, I said to Laney. I'll be out in a while. Gail says the space heaters use too much juice, and we still need to cook breakfast. Okay, I'll be right there, I said. I sat up on the side of the bed and scratched my beard. That girl needs to learn how to take care of herself, Cheryl said. She knows how. I said. She just doesn't want anyone to sleep in unless it's her. We weren't sleeping, Cheryl said. Yeah, I'm going to want a rain check on that. I got up, got dressed, and pulled on my boots. You should probably get up too, I said, peeking out the window. It looks like we got a hard frost last night. We'll need to go over to the Laster place and dig the sweet potatoes. Persimmons will be ready too. She got up, and put her coat on over her flannel pajamas, then walked over to the dresser and looked in the mirror. I put on my own coat, then stopped to kiss her on my way out the door. It's November 5th, she said. It was four months ago today that Danny and them left. I looked at the calendar by the mirror. I'm sorry, I said. She picked up her brush and pulled it through her hair. I'll bet it didn't freeze in Biloxi, she said. Probably not, I said. I bet he's there now enjoying the pretty weather. I always tried to put a positive spin on the conversation when we got on that topic. She didn't reply. She just brushed her hair while tears glistened in her eyes. I left our bedroom and went out into the lobby. Laney stood by the wood stove, looking at a months-old Cosmo magazine. She saw me, ripped a page from the magazine, and put it into the stove. I'm just working on the fire, she said. It's okay, I said. I'll get it. Does Tim need any help with the chickens? No, she said. Gail's mad because I ran a space heater in our room all night and drained the battery bank. 
We have other things around the terminal that need power, like the well and the blower for the stove, I said, as I knelt and stirred the ash with a poker. It's been cloudy for more than a week. Thankfully, it cleared up last night, and we'll get some sun today. As winter gets closer, we might have to move everyone in here around the stove so we use less electricity. Together in one room, she said. We need privacy. Don't I know it, I said. Couldn't we install more solar panels or batteries, or put wood stoves in the bedrooms? I guess so, I said. It was a lot of work installing the stove in here. Moving in here on cold nights would be easier. Talk to Tim about it and see what he says. I think he'll agree. Gail walked into the room with a box of instant pancake mix, a skillet, and a spatula. Is the fire going yet? she said. I want to start on breakfast. Not yet, I said. I would have made it on the range, she said. But Laney put her needs above everyone else's. Again? I'm sorry, Gail, I said. I should have got up early and checked the fire. We're almost out of coffee, too, she said. How almost? I asked, feeling alarmed. We're down to our last can. At the rate we drink it, we'll be completely out within a week. We'll go out and find some more, I said. In the meantime, we can stretch what we have with dandelion and chicory root. Blaine had some chicory growing at his house. If I can find it, I'll dig some up today when I go to collect the persimmons. We'll have to dry it first. I didn't know you were going anywhere today, Laney said. Neither did I until I saw that frost out there on the ground. The water ain't working, Cheryl said as she entered the room. Is it frozen or is the pump dead? Could be both, I said. Laney drained the batteries running her electric heater and hair dryer last night, Gail said. Hair dryer, I said, looking up at Laney. Really? I said I was sorry, Laney said. The sun is rising now, so they'll recharge. It's not like the world is coming to an end. I'm going out to check on Tim. Get the eggs, if there are any, Gail said. Lula needs milking, too. Laney left in a huff. I put some pieces of wood in the stove to feed the fire. It's going now, I said to Gail. Give it some time and put some more wood on it later. It'll be a while before it's hot enough to cook on. Gail, I'll get dressed, then I'll help you with breakfast, Cheryl said, and went back to the bedroom. I walked to the other side of the lobby area, in the corner where large windows looked out at the airport's runway. There, near the window, were six tomato plants and pots, as well as ten more pots with spinach, lettuce, and arugula. They were a little wilted. We'll need to keep these watered, I said. That wood stove will suck the moisture out of everything. Gail nodded, but I don't think she heard me. She was already too interested in Laney's magazine. I left the terminal and walked out to the nearest hangar. We had emptied it of all the cars and divided it up with welded wire as housing for the animals. The concrete floor wasn't very cozy, but it would do until we could arrange for something better. Laney was by the door with the goats. Tim saw me come in and waved me over to the far corner. It just bit her head off, he said, pointing to the bloodied body of a hen. It didn't even bother to eat her. Such a waste. Weasels will do that. I said. So will skunks. So you don't think it's a possum? I shrugged. Did you figure out where it's getting in? No, he said. We might need to build a small shelter for them in here that's tight, where they can roost. If something gets into the hangar right now, it doesn't have a problem getting to them with nothing more than the wire around them. We have that lumber left over from where we blocked in the window around the stovepipe. I wanted to save that in case we needed it, he said. I think this qualifies, I said. We're down to three hens and four of the babies. We only have the one rooster, and I don't want to risk losing him for sure. We should at least close him up at night. Okay, he said. We can work on that today. Get Lanier Gale to help you on that, I said. 
After breakfast, Cheryl and I are going to take a couple of horses over to the Laster farm to dig the sweet potatoes. Then we're going to stop by Blaine's place and check his persimmon tree. This freeze will have all that ready to harvest. We might check some houses while we're out, if we have time. Gail said we're almost out of coffee. We'll probably have to go farther out than that to find coffee. We've picked nearly every house clean between here and the Lassiter place. I know, I said. It won't hurt to have a second look for a place we might have missed. I heard a gunshot again this morning, he said. It was far away, but I'm sure that's what it was. That's the second one in three days. They sounded like they came from the north. I frowned. It's hard to tell direction with just one shot. I'm pretty sure the north. Maybe they're passing through. Maybe they won't notice us. We should avoid shooting for a few days just to be sure they can't locate us. They could be friendly, he said. They could need help. I know, I said. But if they aren't, we might not be able to recover from a raid, not with winter coming on. We can discuss it with the women tonight at dinner. Chapter 52 It took Cheryl and I almost an hour to travel from the airport to the Lassiter farm on horseback. We brought guns along, but we didn't expect to use them. We hadn't seen a goon since last September. I doubted they were all gone, but I was confident that we wouldn't be running into groups of them. You don't think they damaged them too bad when they trampled them down back in the summer? Cheryl asked. Sweet potato plants are tough, I said. They came back strong. We should be able to dig up a lot. We passed two human skeletons in the road near the entrance to the farm and rode through the open gate. Sweet potatoes make me think of Thanksgiving, Cheryl said. It's almost time for that, I said. It might sound funny saying this, but... I feel really grateful this year, she said. I've lost everything from before the outbreak, and it won't be the same without Danny, but this might be one of the best Thanksgivings I've had. We should do it upright, turkey and everything. I've been hearing turkeys in the woods late in the evening, I said. I think that could be arranged. We still have two or three weeks until it's officially here. We should plan something special. We dug up the garden plot and got a pretty good haul. We filled the wheelbarrow twice. Then we put them in the little greenhouse on the property to cure. We'd return in a week or so to retrieve them when they were ready. After that, we headed over to Blaine's place to get the ripe persimmons from his tree. I don't know why we're bothering with the persimmons, Cheryl said. I've had those big Asian ones, and I like those, but the little ones that grow here are awful. You must have to put a lot of sugar in them to make them tolerable. I've eaten them, and it was like my mouth shriveled up inside. You've never had a ripe one, I said. Yeah, I did. No, you didn't. If that's your experience, then it wasn't ripe. The unripe fruit isn't sour like other fruits. It's, well, I can't describe it. Anyway, they're not ready to eat until after the first freeze. Just wait and see. I promise you will change your mind about them. After a freeze, they turn sweet and juicy and delicious. I pulled back on the reins and stopped before we got to Blaine's driveway. There was smoke rising from the chimney of Blaine's workshop. Shh, I whispered to Cheryl. I'm going to go check this out. I dismounted and gave her my reins. Then I climbed the hill by the road and crouched in some brush where I could get a clear view of the building. There were three bicycles next to the door, but I didn't see any people. I was about to climb down the hill again when the door opened on the shop. A woman stepped out. I almost didn't recognize her. Betsy? Her head jerked up, startled. She turned to escape into the building, but then a dawning of recognition came over her face. She ran to me and hugged me. She was so skinny. She'd aged years during the past few months. Oh, God, she cried. I thought we were the only ones left. How long have you been here, I said. I don't know, she said. A month, maybe. 
I nodded over at the bicycles. Who's with you? Lydia and Aaron, she said. The kids? I said, a smile spreading. That's great news. We haven't seen any kids in a long time. What about Blaine? She shook her head and looked at the ground. Oh, I said. Betsy looked back toward the driveway as Cheryl led the two horses in. That's Cheryl, I said. There are five of us that live together over at the airport. Five. That sounds real nice. What are things like on the road? I asked. Better now, Betsy said. Still bad, but better. We don't see the undead out there much anymore. You're the first living person we've seen since we got here. Clayfield is in such bad shape, I didn't expect to find anyone. The door on the shop opened, and young Lydia stepped out with a gun. She was scrawny and dirty. It's okay, baby, Betsy said. They're friends. The little girl gave Cheryl a suspicious look, but lowered the gun. I'm hungry, Mama, she said. You both look hungry, I said. Are you getting enough to eat? We've been eating nothing but pecans and persimmons the past three days, she said. We ran out of everything else, and I haven't been able to find anything in any of the neighbors' houses. Yeah, I said. I cleaned them out months ago. I looked over at Lydia, cradling that big gun, and was amazed at her transformation. The last time I'd seen her, she was healthy, clean, and on her way to a birthday party. Cheryl opened her saddlebag and pulled out the leftover pancakes and a small jar of apple jelly she'd wrapped up for our lunch. She poured a little jelly on the pancake, then rolled it up and offered it to Lydia. The girl looked to her mother for permission. Say thank you, sweetie, Betsy said. You'll come back and live with us, I said. We have plenty of room and food. The kids will be safe. Aaron timidly stepped outside. Cheryl offered him a pancake. I wish Blaine was here, Betsy said. After we saw there was no safe zone and that my family was gone, Blaine did his best to get us home. He wanted to come back to Clayfield so bad. Then he got sick and turned. That was a horrible time for us. Her voice faltered. But, but we made it back. I got back here for him. We scattered his ashes under that big oak tree over there. He loved that tree. I rode one of the bicycles back to the airport. Betsy and Aaron were on my horse. Lydia doubled up with Cheryl. Are we going to ride in the airplanes? Aaron asked as we drew near to the airport. No, I said, but there are three of them parked there. You can play in them all you want. We also have goats and chickens. Don't forget TV, Cheryl said. We might need to look around for some kid-friendly movies. Why did you paint new on that sign? Lydia asked, pointing. Ahead was the large, wooden Grace County Airport sign, with another sign affixed above it. That green metal sign, the one that says, New Clayfield, Kentucky City Limits? Used to be at the edge of town, I told her. Tim, he's one of our friends, he took it down and brought it here. He painted the word new on it because we're starting the town over here. Because the old town was burned? She asked. Yeah, I said. Also, we can live better out here than we could have there. We have more places to feed our goats and grow food. It's like the phoenix, sweetie, Betsy said. Do you remember that story I read you? That bird, Lydia said. I remember. Do you have five people in the whole town? Aaron asked. We have eight now, I said. You're our newest citizens. We should have a party, don't you think? Are you the king of the new town? Aaron asked. Towns don't have kings, silly, Lydia said. They have mayors. Are you... The mayor? Aaron asked. Nah, I said. I'm nobody. The End 
This has been an Audible Frontiers production of Firebirds, written by Shane Gregory, narrated by Scott Aiello. Producer Mike Charzik. Copyright 2013 by Shane Gregory. Production copyright 2013 by Audible Inc. Written by Shane Gregory. Narrated by Scott Aiello. Chapter 1 It was June 9th, late afternoon, and it was hot. There were a dozen human heads at my feet. Flies swarmed them, entering nostrils and open mouths. It puzzled me why they would be there in the road. I didn't see their bodies nearby. They were baking on the asphalt of James Street on the north side of Clayfield, a residential street with only a few large, older homes with big yards. I pulled my pistol and looked around at the houses, wondering if this odd scene might be bait for an ambush. If it were a trap, then I had fallen for it when I had gotten out of my truck to investigate. These were not the only heads I had come across. I had been finding severed heads for about a week in different parts of town, but this was the most I had seen at one place at one time. For several weeks, I had accepted the idea that Clayfield belonged to me, and the zombies. I knew of no other healthy person in town. However, these heads were evidence that there was at least one more person around, I couldn't understand why they cut off the heads or why they would leave them in the street. Even though no one came out of hiding to greet or assault me, I felt like I was being watched. I returned to my truck, backed down the street, turned around in a driveway, and connected with North 7th. It wasn't just the heads. There were other things I had found. Four days before... I found a dump truck rammed through the front of the Christian bookstore. It had not been there before. 
Two days earlier, I'd noticed that someone had parked five yellow cars and trucks down the center line on East Broadway, a block down from the courthouse. Also, the front doors of random houses were open all over town. And I usually tried to close up houses after I'd been in them to keep the zombies and weather out. Someone was there, and they were careless, maybe a little bored, and maybe crazy. I was driving my new gray Ford F-150 4x4. I had my eye on a truck just like this before Canton B had destroyed the world. I couldn't afford it back then, but now I could have any vehicle I wanted. When I drove it off the lot a couple of weeks before, it only had 30 miles on the odometer. I was blasting the air conditioning and listening to an audiobook on the stereo, a collection of short stories by Flannery O'Connor. I had trouble concentrating on the book because I kept thinking about the heads. I drove south over Broadway and looked east as I crossed the intersection. Those yellow vehicles were still there and seemed to scream at me. When I got to South Street, I took a left, then a right onto South 6th, so I could connect with Braggisburg Road and go back to the Laster Farm, where I had been living. I opened the gate to the long driveway, then pulled inside. When I got out to shut it, I wrapped a logging chain around it and the post to hold it in place. I wasn't too concerned about zombies coming on the property anymore. They hadn't come inside since I had reinforced the fences. I wasn't really afraid of them the way I used to be. They were very dangerous, but I had grown accustomed to dealing with them. I knew what to expect from them. There were fast ones and slow ones, and I could differentiate between the two easily at a glance. Mostly, they were slow. The number of the fast, freshly turned victims was dwindling, and I hadn't seen one in weeks. I parked close to the house and unloaded the luxury items I had collected that day. A bag of really good coffee beans, two boxes of Valentine's Day chocolates, a Stephen King novel I hadn't read, and a cardboard box of Playboy magazine issues spanning from the mid-1970s to the early 1990s. I set everything on the porch, then picked up the novel and looked at the photograph of the author on the back cover. I wondered what the master of horror would think of this 24-7 horror story I lived. Then I looked down into the box of Playboys and saw Raquel Welch staring at me, disapprovingly, I thought, in her red bathing suit. "'Don't judge me, lady,' I said. I grinned and looked around me as if someone had actually heard me say it. I frowned and tossed Stephen in on top of her and carried it all inside. I really had not needed to go out for supplies that day, but I needed to go out. Ordinarily, I did my supply runs in the morning, but that particular day I had gone out for a drive to enjoy some air conditioning and the stereo, after having spent several hours in the garden. I stopped at a couple of houses for the hell of it. One of the houses had a secret room containing a huge pornography stash behind a home office. I found it only because the owner had left the secret door ajar. His, her, skeletal remains were on the office floor. The bulk of the collection was movies, DVDs, VHS cassettes, and even a few 16mm film reels. There were also several thumb drives and CDs in a small plastic tote. I had no way to see what was on them, but judging by how the movies, drives, and CDs were labeled, the playboys I found in the corner were quite tame. I wasn't sure what would possess a person to devote a special room just to porn, but I'm sure Raquel judged them for it every time they went in there. Once I got my luxury items inside the house, I locked up and then ate some beefaroni right out of the can. I had some chocolate a little bourbon, and I let Raquel judge the hell out of me. Chapter 2 A few days later, on the morning of June 13th, I got up right after sunrise. I put on my boots and strapped on my 9mm and my wristwatch. 
I washed my face in the basin of dirty water on the dresser and looked at myself in the mirror. My hair and beard had grown. My face was scarred and creased and tanned. I was slimmer than I had been before Canton B. I finally had those six-pack abs everyone was raving about, and I didn't even have to mail order any special exercise equipment or routines on DVD to get them. I frowned. I thought I looked old. I was dirty, too. I hadn't bathed in several days, because I didn't want to use up my limited clean water supply. I went downstairs, then outside, to take a leak off the front porch. I didn't use the indoor toilet anymore because I got tired of hauling in buckets of water from the pond to flush it. I had made a composting toilet that I kept on the back porch. It wasn't much more than a toilet seat and a five-gallon bucket, but it served its purpose. I cooked myself an egg, some coffee, and a bowl of oatmeal and looked over my to-do list while I ate. The list didn't change much from day to day, but I still reviewed it every morning. Most days, I would spend the first couple of hours weeding the garden. After that, I would pick the vegetables that needed picking. At that time, it was mostly greens, cucumbers, and squash. Then, I would go out and pick whatever wild stuff I could find. Berries, greens, etc. I had built myself a simple solar food dehydrator using construction plans from one of my magazines. I would set it up each day, drying some of the greens, berries, and squash. I found that I could dry the leaves and then crush them into a powder to be used in soup later on. It was the only way I could preserve them. The sliced squash would dry up sort of like pliable potato chips. They tasted bland, but I didn't mind. I still had plenty of real brand-name salty potato chips I could eat. The drying didn't always work. A couple of times, the squash hadn't dried properly, and it molded later on. The cucumbers dried too well. They just shriveled up to nothing, and they didn't taste very good. Of course, drying wasn't the preferred way to preserve cucumbers. I would need to make pickles. On this particular day, I had added a new task to my list. Locate all necessary items for home canning. I would need jars, lids, pots, all of it. I had never canned my own food before, but I'd watched my mom do it. I had a general understanding of the supplies I'd need to find, but I would need to find a book to teach me how and give me the recipes. I decided that day, after setting up the dehydrator, to go out and find the necessary supplies. Then, if I had time, I would drive into Clayfield for a while to look around. It had been an unseasonably warm and dry June at that point. My rain barrels were empty, and my cistern was getting low. I tried to collect as much bottled water as I could from scavenging, so I could use the cistern to water the garden. It had gotten over 90 degrees three times in the past week and it was still almost two weeks away from the first day of summer. I knew I could expect temperatures that high or higher as I went into July and August. The year before, I wouldn't have minded, but the year before, I had air conditioning and a refrigerator. The nights were still comfortably cool, but soon they would be warm too. It was going to be difficult to sleep inside, and I wasn't wild about the idea of sleeping outside not with the zombies walking around. The upper floor of the house didn't have good airflow, so opening the windows wouldn't help much, and I didn't dare leave the windows open on the ground floor. I thought about building a platform on the roof for summer sleeping, but it just seemed like too much work. There had to be a simpler solution, and I would work it out eventually. Things like that kept my mind occupied, but not enough. Sarah was always there in my head. I set out around 10 a.m., and it was already getting hot. I kind of liked driving around, because at least when I was in a vehicle, I could have air conditioning. The zombies seemed to love the heat. They were more active when it was warm. 
By active, I don't mean to say that they moved faster. It was just that there seemed to be more of them out. The heat wasn't kind to them, however. For those that were strong enough to find nourishment on living flesh, their bodies were bloated and soft, often swarming with flies. For those that had not been fortunate enough to feed regularly, their bodies were taut and mummy-like. Regardless of their condition, they just kept hanging on. I passed a group of them that were in a dry, fenced-in pasture trying to corner a gray horse. The horse was malnourished, but it was still strong and fast enough to elude them, and it had enough space to stay out of their reach. I knew if I didn't intervene, they would eventually run it to exhaustion. I would go back later to see what I could do when I was finished with my errands. I had seen canning supplies at different houses, but I was having trouble remembering which. I had been into so many homes looking for supplies the past few months. Sarah and I had collected some home canned goods from an old woman's house on Gala Road. It was the same house where I had found the field guide for edible wild plants. The woman was probably still locked up in her freezer in the basement. I decided to check her house first. I thought Founders Farm and Hardware might have some stuff, too. I knew they sold that sort of thing, but when the virus hit Clayfield, it had been in February, and they might not have had that merchandise stocked that time of the year. It wouldn't hurt to check. I had been over to Founders several times looking for other things. It was almost picked clean, but perhaps I just didn't see something I hadn't been looking for. When I got to the old woman's house, I noticed the front door was standing open. I tried to remember if Sarah and I had left it open, but I couldn't recall. That had been months before. I know we were in a hurry to get out of there, so we could have. I climbed out, grabbed my 12-gauge, and stood by my pickup for a moment to listen. All I heard were the sounds of late spring, the sounds of late spring without people. I eased the truck door shut, pulled up my mask, and went up to the house. Just inside, near the open basement door, was the nearly decomposed body of a woman. I couldn't remember what the old woman had been wearing, but this woman was wearing a dress, and her hands were bound with an extension cord. The cord made me fairly certain that the body belonged to her. I don't know who had let her out of the freezer, but whoever it was had removed her head. I didn't see her head anywhere. I assumed it had rolled down the stairs into the basement, but I wasn't going down there to look for it. I did a quick check of the house, except the basement, and didn't find anyone else there. I found some large stock pots, empty jars, rings, and lids in a walk-in storage closet. There was also a worn copy of Ball Blue Book of Canning and Preserving. I was pretty sure that was everything I would need to start, but if there was anything I lacked, I could just read the book to tell me what. That was easy enough, I said. I propped my shotgun up against the wall and started hauling the supplies out to the truck. On my second trip back into the house, I found the old woman's head. It was down at the base of a shrub next to the front steps. I hadn't noticed it coming in the first time, and I almost missed it that time because of the tall grass. It was on its left ear, looking out toward the truck. It was still very much alive, or rather, not dead. It blinked at me. I kept walking and tried not to look at it. On a whim, I went out to the old woman's garden plot. Just like everything else, it was overgrown, but I went in anyway and looked around. It was not uncommon for plants to come back from the seeds of the previous year's produce. I recognized five okra plants. They weren't very tall, and they had not yet bloomed, but I would come back later in the year to harvest them. There was also a clump of tomato plants growing in one spot. They'd already set some fruit, which at that time were like green marbles. I didn't see anything else. I suspected I could find something similar happening in other old gardens all over the county. 
Chapter 3 Early on, during the first few weeks while I was waiting for Sarah and the Somervilles to return, I would go on extermination runs and spend a couple of hours driving around killing zombies. But by that day in June, I hadn't killed one in more than a week. I was tired of killing, and I feared I soon might get tired of living. I had no intention of taking my own life. Not yet. One argument I always gave myself when the thought came into my head was that I had worked too hard and fought too long to stay alive only to just give up. Still, I was lonely and fatigued. I yearned for rest and for the touch or voice of another human being. I would leave Clayfield and search for survivors elsewhere before I ever took my own life, and even then I doubted if I would have had the courage to do it. I was fairly certain that there were survivors still in Riverton, but I hadn't made the time to drive there. From the old woman's house, I drove into downtown Clayfield to have a look. There had been a time when the Somervilles, Sarah, and others were around that securing Clayfield seemed like a possible goal. But driving through the town that day, I doubted it could ever have happened. We might have been able to retake a city block or two, but not the whole town. Not and hold it. Not with our limited numbers. Alone, I didn't stand a chance. It wasn't just the undead. Nature had to be contended with, too. Then there would have been the upkeep of the buildings. One summer, a few years before, I had been fortunate enough to host a reception for an archaeologist at the museum. He was a bit younger than I and not much more than a grad student, but it was kind of a big deal to have a real archaeologist visit my small town museum. His focus had been on pre-Columbian Mexico. He had brought along some artifacts, and he gave a little talk about a dig from which he had just returned. He told us how the Mayan civilization there had once been quite large, but that something had happened. He presented a few theories, and whatever it was that had happened had greatly diminished the population. He said that over time, the forest retook the cities. The people were forced ever inward tending smaller and smaller areas, and taking parts from older buildings to maintain their shrinking communities. There just weren't enough of them around for the upkeep. That's what I envisioned happening to Clayfield. Eventually, seeds would find their way into the cracks of the asphalt. Acorns would sprout into oaks. Eventually, roots and vines would force concrete and bricks apart. It wouldn't happen this year, but it would happen, and there would be nothing I could do about it by myself. I would have to decide where my place would be, dig in there, and hold it. Everything else would disappear into forest. I wanted downtown Clayfield to be that place for sentimental reasons. Unfortunately, I didn't have the luxury of being sentimental. I had to be practical, and at that time, the Lassiter's farm would have to be my place. The undead were everywhere. They walked and crawled and bumped into things. They reminded me of fish in an aquarium, wide-eyed, mouths open, going one way, then the next, only getting lively and zoning in when there was food. I didn't have any particular place I wanted to go that day. I was just having a look around. I toured a few residential streets, careful to stay away from congested areas. I wound up on the south side of town near Founder's Farm and Hardware. I didn't need to go there since I'd found most everything I needed at the old woman's house, but I didn't think it would hurt to see if they had any canning supplies I might have missed. Just before I got there, I passed by a few houses, then came upon a small park that had been built for the town by the local Kiwanis Club. I stopped in the street and got out. The large sign by the entrance said, Sponsored by Kiwanis of Clayfield. The grounds were overgrown, but the playground equipment, pavilion, and basketball goals were still easily visible. The reason why I stopped was that there was a row of six metal fence posts, known as T-posts, in the ground in front of the sign. 
Each post had two to four human heads driven down on them, like grotesque shish kebabs. It was new, something done within the past two or three weeks. There was another fence post there that was empty. I got a chill and looked around to see if anyone might be watching me. I didn't know if the heads had been the heads of zombies or healthy people. I presumed they had been zombies because of their state of decay, but I hadn't been out that way in a while, so they could have decomposed in that time. Then I thought I saw one of the heads move. It was the top head on the second post. I took a step closer to investigate. It felt like the thing was looking at me with its bluish, milky eyes. Then it opened, then closed its mouth. I stepped back to my vehicle and looked around me again. I could understand exterminating them, but I couldn't understand beheading them and staking the heads. Beheading them didn't kill them, it just disconnected them from their bodies. While that incapacitated them and took away their mobility, they could still be dangerous. It was reckless, pointless, and barbaric. I was troubled by what I saw, but I was trying to be optimistic. The beheadings meant there was, at worst, a very sadistic, healthy person left in Clayfield, and at best, a bored or fed-up healthy person. I tried to focus on the healthy part. Healthy meant conversation and possible companionship. Healthy meant I might have help. I returned to my truck and drove on over to the hardware store.